He guessed whoever had been leaking badly had headed out that way, because why would you come to a place like this if you needed medical help? Jose got his phone and put in a call to dispatch as he walked down the corridor, making sure he didn't step in anything. Dispatch answered as he opened the back door and leaned out. This is Dela Cruz. He gave his badge number. I need backup. Nothing unusual in the shallow parking lot other than a couch that had seen way better days, a broken TV and some typical city litter. No body. No severely wounded person down on their face on the pavement. As he gave the address, he walked out a little. The blood trail continued off to the left, so he followed it to an abrupt end point off to the side of the alley. Like whoever had been leaking plasma had gotten into a car and driven away. Ending the call with dispatch, he went back to the rear entry and retraced his path to the base of the stairs. Taking out his pocket light, he shined it on the steps and followed the trail up to the second floor, the third floor. When he came to the fourth, over to the left, the door that he'd knocked on the night before was open, and the blood went inside the apartment, or came out of it, was more likely. Palming up his service weapon, he closed in, and sure enough, his business card had fallen to the floor. Someone had stepped on it and left a partial bloody shoe print. As the beam flashed inside, he saw the pool of blood immediately. It was off to one corner. Detective Jose de la Cruz, Caldwell Police. In his gut, he knew announcing his presence was a waste of time, and when there was no response, he swept his weapon around in a coordinated movement, which was when he saw the stakes that had been driven into the floorboards. There was nylon rope tangled around each, like someone had been tied to them, and there was a major disturbance in the dust, evidence of thrashing. He thought of the missing officer. Jesus, H. Christ, he muttered. Out to the back of the flat, he caught sight of a rotted kitchen. To the front, there were some rooms, at least one of which was a bedroom, going by the stained bare mattress on the floor. Moving carefully and choosing his foot placement so he didn't compromise the scene, he went past the bleed-out and peered into the other spaces. Blackout drapes covered the shitty windows, as they did throughout the place. Nothing was on the bed, on the floor, other than some errant trash that, like everything else, had a layer of dust on it. Jose went back out to the main room, to the stakes. Lowering down onto his haunches, he inspected the frayed nylon around one of the wooden stabs. It was bloody. As his cell phone went off, he checked the screen and answered quickly. Trayvon, I was about to call you. The other detective cut him off. They found undercover officer Leon Roberts in the river, about an hour ago. Jose frowned. Leon? Guess my source was wrong. It was a male officer missing. No, Jose thought. It meant there were two of them. I know Leon. He was a good kid. Who was Trey's age, actually. I mean, young man. Man, he came up through 3rd District Patrol like I did. I met him a couple of times. You remember everyone. There was a sad note to Trey's voice. He was in my class at the academy. He was floating face down. Got caught in a residential dock. Owner called it in and the ID was made by one of the first responders who played against him in softball on Saturdays. Closing his eyes, Jose swept his face with his palm. Damn it. How'd he die? Gunshot to the back of his head. Very professional. Unlikely there'll be water in his lungs. There was a pause. Look, he's not married, but I know his parents are still alive. I was thinking maybe you, as a senior representative of the department, could... Yep, I'm on it. Jose glanced at the blood on the stake. But I can't leave my location until other officers get here. Where are you? It's your day off. There was a rustling, as if the guy were pulling on clothes. Address, please. Shaking his head, Jose looked to the ceiling, and then said with resignation, Right where you left me last night, just one floor down. Watch the blood as you come up the stairs. Things on the other end of the connection got quiet. There was no blood on them. There is now. We have another scene. I just called it in and I think you should stay home with your wife and kids, but you won't. So do me a favor. Anything. 
Jose took a deep breath and rubbed his nose. The weird, sweet smell was enough to make him rethink his pending request. But then his stomach growled anyway, a sign he was in the right profession, he supposed, at least for the next month. Bring me coffee and donuts. I forgot to eat when I left. Thanks, he said before he ended the call. Chapter 27 There was hot water, yes, but no heat. When Rio's showering was done and she'd turned off the spray, she was surprised at how quickly the temperature dropped. Yes, there was warmth and humidity in the bathroom's tiled confines, but not enough. The only solution she had was getting dry and clothed. Too bad she didn't have a... Here, use this as a towel, Luke said. Crossing her arms over her bare breasts, she looked at him and caught her breath. He was turned away, facing the wall, the sweatshirt held out blindly toward her. He was also bare-chested, the muscles of his torso fanning out along his shoulders, across his back, around his ribs. Thank you, she said roughly. Taking what he offered, she put his sweatshirt to work, aware that as she passed it over her skin, that cologne of his was getting all over her. And she liked it, liked the smell of it, but liked even more the fact that it was his. Let's get you back in bed, he said, quickly. Okay, thanks. She folded the sweatshirt, turning the soft cotton over in her hands, and then she dried off her wet hair with it. For some reason, as her breasts swayed, they felt heavier. And hey, she wasn't thinking about the cold anymore, was she? Suddenly, she was as hot as the tropics. Before she got way ahead of herself, too late, she set her makeshift towel on the side of the sink and put her clothes back on. As she drew her pants up her legs, she remembered when she had put them on, a lifetime ago. Meanwhile, Luke was still facing away from her, but had changed his position. His elbow was now plugged into his knee, his chin on his fist, that muscular back of his curved thanks to his height. His pose made her remember a picture she had seen in an art history book of that old sculpture, The Thinker. And then she didn't really think of anything. She had known he was big and strong. She had felt that when she had been carried by him. But she hadn't expected him to be so. Here's your sweatshirt back, she said as she picked it up again. Put it on, she thought. Please. And not because he was ugly, because he was so much the opposite of ugly. Don't worry, I'm decent, she muttered. As he turned to her, his eyes stayed on her face, like she was still naked. Thanks. He took the damp fold. You ready to go back? She should have glanced away as he dressed. What was good for the goose and the gander, or how did that saying go? But she didn't. She watched as he straightened on the toilet seat and pulled on what she had just had all over her naked body. And when he couldn't see her for that brief moment, she really watched him. His pecs and abs were worth the look, flexing as he went through the bog-standard movements of putting on clothes, turning the simple work into something spectacular. Smoke show, she thought stupidly. That was the vernacular, wasn't it? Luke got up on his feet. Feel better? Well, she was not cold in the slightest anymore, and she wasn't thinking about all her aches and pains either. Yes, I am. Feeling better, that is. I can't get you food quite yet. I thought I could, but it's too dangerous. Everything's shut down here until just after dark, so there are restricted areas I can't get near without causing a problem. He shrugged. But as soon as the light is gone in the sky, I'll take you back to Caldwell and we can stop somewhere on the way. So they were out of town. We don't have to rush. Remember the situation you found me in? I need a little time to figure out where I can go that is safe, who I can talk to, what I'm going to do. How long can I stay here? Luke crossed his arms over his chest. You can't stay here, but there's another place we can go, for a limited period of time. Rio frowned, where I was when the nurse first came to me, in that basement with the fabric. Yeah, you'll be safe there, for one night, maybe two. 
but it's not a permanent solution. It doesn't have to be, and thanks, I owe you. There was a moment of silence, and in her head, for some insane reason, she saw herself hugging him, pictured the embrace so clearly she could almost feel the warmth of his body against her own. Come on, back to bed, he said, in a low, resonant voice, like maybe he had gone there in his head, too. In response, all she could do was nod and follow him out into the corridor. As she was behind him, she felt free to look around, but she didn't learn anything new. Still, just a long, rough hallway with bulbs hanging from wires. No one around, no sounds that she could hear other than their footfalls. When they were back inside the clinic area, she whispered, Who is that patient? Her question was ignored as they passed by the hanging sheets, and then they were over to the bed she'd been in, and he was offering her an arm to steady her balance as she lowered herself down. The incense had burned out, and he got some more from a drawer and lit it. Pulling the blankets around her, she remembered back in the days when she was little and she'd had a cold. Her mother had been so good at taking care of her. Unlimited TV, bowls of ice cream to soothe a burning throat, anything she wanted to eat at any moment cold compresses for a hot forehead. Under normal circumstances, things had been totally regimented in the household, all kinds of schedules of chores and homework, all expectations to be exceeded, or at worst, merely met. Failure, never an option. Her mom had been a whip-and-a-chair kind of parent, taming her two kids into virtuous human beings who went to church, did the rosary on the regular, and never talked back. It had not been easy growing up in such an unforgiving way. But one set of the sniffles and a slightly elevated temperature, the whole house of demanding cards went into a freefall. Total pampering. Sometimes, usually after grades came out and Rio got a shellacking and a half for the two B's she always got, math and Spanish, she would deliberately go out and get a chill or head over to a friend's house if they had missed some school in the previous week because of a flu. She had needed the reassurance, the comfort, even if it had been unconnected to the offense of her not being perfect. Are you okay? Luke asked. So quiet, just her breathing and the soft crackle of the incense getting started. I didn't see my life, she whispered. When I knew he was going to kill me, I thought I was supposed to see my life, you know? Luke stood over her looming and silent. Then he said, that's because you're a survivor. Survivors like us, we stay in the present. Everyone says you see your life right before you die. And how many dead people you talk to lately? Rio blinked and then smiled. Good point. And I guess I wasn't dying. Maybe that's when it happens. Luke winced, then looked away, looked back. Move over a little. She stared up at him in confusion. What? You need someone right now. I'm not much, but I don't see that you have any other options. Actually, he was wrong. He was more than enough, and that made her nervous. Okay, she said. Rio groaned as she pushed her body over, and then the mattress, such as it was, tilted to one side, and Luke had stretched out next to her. Before she could form a coherent thought, she cleaved to his big, warm body, curling against him. With a quick shift, he settled her head on his arm. I can hear your heartbeat, she murmured. So I have one. Good to know. Where do you get your cologne? Cologne? I don't wear any. Guess it was fabric softener, she thought, as she wondered where he did his laundry. Her eyes drifted around the room, casing the empty beds, the boxes and supplies, the draping around the other patient. From time to time, there were clunks deep in the inside of the building, the low, percussive noises like the settling of cold in metal supports or air going through old pipes. I really am thankful you came when you did, she whispered. I wasn't going to make it without you. There was a period of silence, and then the rumble of Luke's voice reverberated up out of his ribcage and into her ear, into her mind, 
into her soul. He deserved what he got, he growled. Rio propped her head up on Luke's peck. His chin was so near and his lips were so full. Above his cheeks, his eyes were closed and his lashes were long and thick. He looked remarkably at peace, considering how aggressive his voice was. Do you shave twelve times a day? She murmured. Those lips twitched in one corner. Mind if I ask where that came from? Bringing her arm up, she touched his jaw with her forefinger, brushing it softly. So smooth. I've never met a man with dark hair who didn't have a five o'clock. How many men have you met and gotten close enough to, to see their beard? Five o'clock shadows are not state secrets. Sorry, did that come out bad? Depends on your definition of bad. You sounded jealous. There was another pause. And then those lashes lifted, revealing glowing golden eyes that were so brilliant and hot, they were like the sun itself. He focused on her. Maybe I am. Lucan had spent a lot of years not giving a shit about anything or anybody, including himself. Being in prison for your mere existence kind of turned you into a dissociative son of a bitch, assuming it didn't make you a confirmed misanthrope. Miss Lycanthrope, in his case. So it was kind of surprising, in a fuck-me sort of way, that he found himself wanting to reassure this human woman and do other things to her. Is that a problem? he asked, even though he knew he wasn't telling her the full truth about himself. Any truth, really. But he was sure she had secrets of her own, and that was the nature of the drug trade. You took people at face value and protected yourself. It was a rule so fundamental it didn't have to be spoken. Survivors, both of them. And as he'd said, that meant you stayed in the present, on every level. No she whispered. It's not a problem. Lucan closed his eyes because he didn't want her to see into him and find out how aroused he was, where his thoughts had gone, where his hands wanted to go. She moved up higher on his torso. You want me to prove it? Prove what? He lifted his lids again. She was so close now, he could see the flecks in her brown eyes. That it's okay if you're jealous? She murmured. Does it involve my mouth? What makes you ask that? The way you're staring at my lips right now. He reached up and brushed her damp hair back. So do you want to do something about this? Or ignore it? It's your choice. If I understand what you're talking about, it's a two-sided thing. You also get to choose. His eyes locked on her mouth. Oh, I've already made my decision. There was a pause. Then Rio moved up a little higher on his chest. As she lowered her head to kiss him, she closed her eyes, and he liked that. It was as if she wanted to concentrate everything she had on the contact. Lucan did the same, his lids shutting. He expected her to be bold. She wasn't, but she wasn't timid either. Her mouth brushed over his and he relished the sensation, the velvet, the warmth, except he was a greedy asshole. They might be only kissing, but in his mind, they were naked, and he was mounting her, finding his way in between her thighs until... The sound was far off, a banging noise, a door slamming. Then there were footfalls, coming fast. Rio's head lifted, and they both looked across the cluttered storage room. There's a gun under the bed he told her. Stay here by the incense. Do not leave this mattress. Lucan moved quickly, rolling her free of him, and then covering her up. He took two steps forward and doubled back. Kissing her quick, he vowed, we're going to pick up where we left off, sometime before I take you back. She started to say something, but he took off before she could speak, pausing only by a stack of folded clothes to pull on a fresh sweatshirt. At the door, into the corridor, he listened before opening things up, braced to attack. Then he swung the heavy panel open. Out in the hall, there was a rhythmic pounding, 
and the shit was getting louder. Stepping out, he closed the storage room's door behind him. Mayhem rounded the corner at a run. You've got problems, the prisoner said as he came to a halt. You have no idea, Lucan thought. The executioner's been looking for you since dawn. It took me this long to break away without being trailed. Why? I checked in. I returned my weapon. I don't know what the problem is, but you better show your face before the guards make a serious effort to find you. All right, let's go. The two of them jogged away, heading for the corner Mayhem had bolted around. When they'd taken the left, Lucan grabbed the other male's arm. You better go your separate way now. Fuck that. There might be a reward. Besides, if I turn you in, I don't look like I'm with you. It's self-preservation, and a good decoy for you in case things get complicated with your little secret. Excellent point. They continued on, making fast work of the ins and outs of the basement. It had taken Lucan about three weeks on site before he knew the way around the multi-layered underground. So many wide lanes and smaller offshoots, with all kinds of rooms and larger spaces. The architect who had designed the building had clearly known that there were things that had to be hidden, truths that compassionate healers did not want their vulnerable patients to know. Like the fact that three morgues had been required to handle the number of dead who had apparently needed processing. Down at the very far end of the basement, he and Mayhem got to a fire door that was brand new, and punching through, they went up two flights of stairs. Without saying a word, they both passed in front of another fire barrier. There were three subterranean levels, and this middle one was where the prisoners bunked. Above that, party time. On Lucan's nod, they ascended another two flights and stopped again. You ready? Lucan said. Born ready, Wolven. On the far side of another fresh-as-a-daisy fire door, Lucan smelled the cocaine in the air, dry and tingling, like it was radioactive fallout in the nose and down the back of the throat. This was the business level, where the processing happened behind doors that were locked with copper and guarded with guns. At the moment, however, there was nothing getting cut, weighed, and parceled out into packets in the workrooms, the prisoners still in their sleep cubicles, all checked in. After nightfall, they'd be woken up, fed, and forced to come up here to work the job they were being kept alive to do. Sadly, this building really was perfect for what they needed. The command, now dead, had had it all planned out, but had been killed just as the move from the old location was happening, which was how the executioner had declared himself ruler of the prison camp. On that note, Lucan started walking past the product rooms, toward a wall of fresh sheetrock, about twenty feet across and ten feet tall. The expanse was both new and stained, all along its flat plain. There were pegs set at intervals, with greasy straps that hung loose and ready for further service. Behind the beating posts, that sheetrock had soaked in the blood that had flowed, and you could smell it, too. The whole area was air-stained with both the plasma bouquet of torture and the new-built house perfume of chalk and sweet pine. As they closed in on the executioner's private quarters, the pair of guards on either side of the inset door palmed up their guns. Unlike during the commands era, they were members of a private guard, hired to maintain order, as opposed to culled from the prison population. I'll let him know you found him the one on the left said. The steel door set into the sheetrock opened and closed. You can go, Lucan muttered to Mayhem. I'll make sure you'll get your reward. He caught the scent first, and it was the kind of thing that made the nape of his neck prickle. Letting his head fall back, he breathed in deep, and then a howl started to curl in his gut and rise up out of his throat. The sound of his people was cut off, as the recessed steel door opened once again. The black-clothed figure that emerged had a bald head and narrow, calculating eyes, and the male was carrying something in his arms, something that was large and furred and limp as a rug rolled up in itself. The head and forepaws dangled off to one side, the back paws and tail to the other. The executioner threw the dead wolf at Lucan's feet. 
I believe this is one of yours, he announced. Chapter 28 When the door to the makeshift clinic area opened, Rio sat up. Luke, the man who stepped inside was not him, and the way that harsh face snapped in her direction made her wish that she had pretended to be asleep. She didn't need to know him for it to be clear that being alone with someone like this should come with a Surgeon General's warning. As his eyes narrowed, he took a step toward her and his upper lip peeled off his front teeth, which exposed tremendous teeth, teeth that surely had been cosmetically. Rio scrambled to remember where Luke had told her that gun was. Under the bed. It was under the bed. She lunged forward, diving under the mattress. In some kind of matrix-like time bend, the man somehow managed to cross the entire room in the blink of an eye. Just as she felt the cool barrel under her hand, a rough grip locked on the back of her head, right where she'd been hurt, the pain blinding her and rendering her limp and paralyzed. As her vision went checkerboard, she had a split second's clear sight of the nine millimeter. Rio cursed as he pulled her up by the hair, grabbed her around the throat and hauled her bodily off the bed until her feet dangled. Slamming her against the wall, he put his face directly into hers and smiled like a demon. Fangs. He had fangs. Or rather, they looked like fangs. Fucking Lucan. He snapped while she began to choke and claw at his hold. He's complicating shit. He needs to leave well enough alone. So I'm going to take care of you for him. Stop. The word was spoken so softly, Rio could barely hear it above the ringing in her ears. But the man who was aggressing on her with those canine-like teeth whipped his head in the direction of the draped patient bed. Let her go. The voice was so weak, yet its effect was like that of a shotgun to the man's temple. As those hostile eyes seemed to pierce the fragile barrier strung from the ceiling, his whole body went as immobile as hers felt. Now, her manhandler cursed, and then he, gently, there was a pause. No matter her origins, she is a patient, as I am. Rio's feet touched down, toes first. Then the balls and arches made contact with the floor, and finally, her soles. After that, the man with all the teeth took her arm and settled her back down on the bed. And he didn't let go until she could hold herself up while she gasped for air. When she was steady, he turned away and went over to the curtains, pulling a flap aside and disappearing into the interior. Even though she was still getting her breath back, Rio snapped into action, falling to the floor and grabbing the gun under the bed. Her hands were shaking until she saw how much the weapon was moving back and forth. A quick shot of self-preservation stilled things, calmed her down, cleared the panic from her head. With a tingling adrenaline rush, she rose to her feet, braced and ready to bolt. Nothing but murmuring now from that hidden bed. Two voices, deep and low, were having an argument, like the one who had gone Popeye on her was getting reprimanded. What the hell? she muttered. The boots she'd had on were right next to her on the floor, and she put them on one-handed, keeping the butt of the gun in her palm. As she futzed with the laces, she kept checking the curtain over and over again, bobbing her now throbbing head up and down. If one more fricking person hit her in the back of the skull, she was going to lose it, probably literally, when her brains leaked out of her goddamn ears. Back on her feet, she focused on the makeshift clinic's door. It didn't matter that she had no clue where she was, a nine-millimeter was a hell of a map, wasn't it? And she didn't want to wait for Luke to come back. He was a complicating factor when he just couldn't be. As always, she had to do her best to balance getting information with getting herself hurt or killed, and the instability in this environment was obvious. Even though she wanted to fully explore, she was going to have to gather what she could on the way out, ending up in a grave was not the way to bring Mozart and these suppliers to justice. Glancing down at the bed, she remembered the kiss she had had with Luke. No goodbye. And the next time she saw him, it might well be after she got him arrested. Why the hell, after all these years of not being particularly interested in sex, 
did she have to be so attracted to someone like him? She had been doing just fine living like a monk. At least she could go right back to the celibacy. Not a problem, especially after what had happened on the floor of that apartment. Rio started to move toward the door, tiptoeing in her boots, trying not to put her full weight into her feet. What, like she could command gravity or something? No squeaking, she thought, at the floor beneath her feet. No creaking. Oh, it was concrete. Right. As she went by the empty beds, she counted them down. And as she came up to the drapery, there was a choked sound of pain from inside the sheets. Rio stopped. The two men were still talking softly. There was another groan, now as if someone who hurt all over was attempting to find a better position and failing. Go, she told herself. Get the fuck out, right now. When she realized that her feet had stopped, she looked to the door, as if she could refocus their effort, or will the exit to come to her. After a moment, they did start moving again. Not toward the way out, though. In front of the executioner and his wall of Rorschach tests, Lucan dropped down onto his haunches. Around the throat of the dead wolf was a steel collar, but not the kind that came with the tracking or the explosion upon removal stuff. Releasing the buckle on the generic restraint, he took the thing off and eased back. Was there enough life left in the still warm body's cells for the change? If Lucan had still been staying in the territories of the clans, he might have recognized the patterns of gray and white and brown in the fur. But it was a long time since he'd been near his bloodline. Okay, half of his bloodline— and God knew his brain had jettisoned those memories for more useful ones tied to surviving in the prison camp. There was a hissing sound, like air was escaping from the lungs due to rib compression, and then the transformation began, the fur that had been totally static moving in waves as each individual follicle retracted into its pore, sucking back into the wolven's shifting corporeal form. While this was happening, the fore and hind legs began to elongate and reform, the front paws differentiating into hands with separated fingers, the back ones pushing out into bare feet. The torso also expanded, shoulders protruding on both sides of the narrow canine chest and causing the body to roll over so that it was face up, so that the gunshot wound in the center of the chest was visible. Meanwhile, down below at the waistline, the pelvic girdle broke outward and flattened to accommodate the thickening thighs as well as organs consistent with the male sex. The face was what he was waiting for. Up at the head, the muzzle retracted and the short nap fur disappeared, the nose, chin, and cheeks emerging as the bone structure changed, above them the flat forehead and arching brows manifesting. The eyes flipped open and focused on Lucan, as if his scent had registered. Then the mouth started to move, the words more breath than syllable, blood speckling the lips. The attempt at communication didn't last. A gasp cut it off, and then there was coughing, weak coughing, followed by the utter stillness of death. Jesus, Lucan muttered as he stared into that face. So you do know him. Lucan looked at the executioner, the other male, a powerful figure in all that black, all those weapons. I can't believe you went all the way up that mountain to kill this son of a bitch. If you expect me to be pissed off or more motivated, you're shit out of luck. I hate the fucker. The executioner smiled, his glittering eyes that of a murderer who enjoyed killing as much as a normal person might be happy with a nice dinner or a good night's sleep like death was something so natural, so required to his well-being. Oh, you're motivated enough, aren't you? The male murmured. So why'd you go to the clans and risk a problem? My kin are assholes who will eat their own, literally. You don't want to get their attention, trust me. I didn't go to the mountain. He came here. Who is he? Lucan narrowed his eyes. My cousin. This is a family reunion, then. How sweet. Not even close, Lucan thought, 
as he started to pace around in a circle, memories clawing into the center of his chest. Before he could stop himself or go through any of the many reasons he should keep his emotions in check, he took a running soccer kick and nailed the corpse in the gut. On impact, the dead arms and legs flopped, and the head kicked hard on the concrete floor. He did it again, and again, and again, and something warm splashed up on him. He looked down. Blood was on his fresh sweatshirt, and he brushed at it, even though he wasn't bothered by the stain. He just needed something to get himself off the soccer train. Refocusing on the executioner, Lucan demanded, Did you think it was me when you snuck up on him? Is that why you shot him? It's daylight. I can assure you, I was not the one who pulled the trigger. The guard, Lucan thought. Some of them were humans, or so he'd heard. But who knew whether the rumor was true? Lucan shook his head. No, they thought it was me. That's why you went looking for me. They thought I'd gone AWOL. And when they brought this to you, you had to check on me to see if it was. What's Mayhem's reward going to be for delivering me to you? He gets to live another night. Lucky him. This place is an amusement park, just full of fun and games. Lucan crossed his arms over his chest. Your guards thought they'd done you a favor because they didn't know our arrangement, which is what happens when you hire mercenaries. They only get part of the job right. And you thought you'd lost your connection with Mozart. You were pissed, and because this wolf didn't have a collar, you weren't sure whether it was me or not. Oops. You make a lot of assumptions. Whatever, he thought. All I know for sure is that you don't want this kind of trouble. He nodded down at the body. When he doesn't come back, others will search for him. And exactly what kind of trouble do you think I'll be in? If they get into this facility, it'll turn into the biggest takeout restaurant you've ever seen, and you're on the menu. The executioner smiled again, flashing his fangs. No one can get in or out of here without my knowledge. Oh, really? Lucan thought. Aren't you a clever little bitch? The executioner stepped forward until they were nose to nose. Watch yourself, Wolf. You can easily be in your family member's position. He's not my family, at least not in his opinion. That's how I ended up here. And if you want to put a bullet in me, do it where it counts. Lucan put his arms wide, right in the heart. As the executioner's face hardened, it was clear that the male didn't like the shift, and not in the wolven's assumption of its human-like form. The power dynamic was not what it had started out as, with Lucan the only one who had a weakness to exploit. Now, the executioner wanted something only Lucan could provide. Trixie, Trixie. I'm waiting. Lucan snapped. Chapter 29 Even as Rio was telling herself that she needed to get going, explore what she could, find a way out, get back to Caldwell, she parted the curtains that fell from the ceiling. Over on the bed, lying on his back, a burn patient was in a terrible state. His face was a raw wound, the features swollen and glistening, the eyes forced shut by the injuries. The rest of his torso and arms were just as bad, nothing but raw meat that was left unbandaged, likely because any kind of gauze would just stick and become entangled. The man who had attacked her burst up from a chair that had been pulled in close to the bedside. Before he could come at her, she put the gun up to his face. Sit the fuck down. This isn't about you. The chuckle from the patient cut through a subtle whirring sound. Yes, Apex, do sit down. There was a tension-filled moment, and then Apex lowered himself back into the chair. Rio again turned her head toward the poor man in the bed. His only treatment that she could see was a small fan set on top of a cardboard box, the cooling air traveling across his ravaged skin. Are you okay? She said roughly. Stupid question. My dear, came the response. How kind of you to ask. Rio glanced at the Apex guy. 
He was watching her like in his mind he was ripping her arms off with his bare hands and beating her to death with the stumps. But he didn't make another move toward her. It was as if he were a predator and his leash was in the patient's hold. Rio approached the other side of the bed. She kept the gun up, just in case. Can't the nurse help you? Or can we get you to a doctor? The patient didn't turn to her. His face stayed angled straight at the ceiling above him, not that he could see anything. She was willing to guess it was just too painful for him to move anything, even in the slightest way. No doubt mere breath was a struggle. I am as well as I can be. The patient's rasp was softer now, as if he were running out of strength, and yet his tone and accent struck her as highbrow. I am simply waiting out a process that began some weeks and weeks prior. And you, how fare you? Have you been aided? Looking around again, but like she'd missed anything, Rio saw no monitoring of vitals, no IV, no medications. You need to go to a hospital. The other man answered, You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Excuse me? Rio lowered the gun. Oh, so the condition he's in is totally compatible with life. Right. Glad you pointed this out to me, because I was assuming he needed some medical help. Just what we need. A human with a savior complex. As opposed to you, who are just sitting here as he... This is not your business. Enough, the patient said with exhaustion. Rio closed her eyes and realized she was way out of line, speaking about how dire his circumstances were. She cleared her throat. Were you in a car accident? Again, the injuries appeared consistent with severe burns, and while she gathered her thoughts, she was trying to figure out what could have caused... Okay, she was stupid. A meth lab, of course, unless she thought they were making cookies here. We need to get you help, she heard herself say. The patient inhaled slowly. Then he spoke through an agonizingly slow exhale. You are kind, but you are in enough trouble yourself. Does Lucan have a plan for getting you back where you belong? I'll get myself back. The chuckle from the douchebag on the chair was no doubt a chauvinistic commentary on her abilities, except like she hadn't heard that before. Also, she might have a head injury, but... At least she could stand on her own two feet, and, bonus, she had this cute little nine-millimeter accessory that didn't make her ass look fat and brought out the fuck-off that was never far below the surface of her baby browns. I should not underestimate her, Apex. That's right, she thought at the patient. Then she calmed herself and stared down at the bed. We have to do something for you, she murmured, as she noticed his hands for the first time. One was missing all its fingers. When there wasn't a response, she glanced up at that face. The lips had parted so he could breathe, and the shallow inhales came at a panting speed. And then there was a groan, after which a slightly calmer rhythm. He'd passed out, she was willing to bet. You're in pain, she whispered to him anyway. Dear God, are they not treating your pain? No, we're deliberately letting him stew in it. The other man, what was his name, Apex, muttered. Because we get off on a male of worth suffering. Rio closed her eyes. I can't imagine how much it hurts. He is stronger than all of us combined. She looked over at the chair. Apex was sitting forward, his hand on the bed right next to the patient's ruined one, but not touching it, because that would have been unbearable, no doubt. Is there nothing here that can help him? We're lucky we have a bed for him, the man gritted out. Most of the medication here expired two decades ago and is degraded. There's nothing we can do. How much longer do you think he has? Eyes that were dark as the corners of hell lashed over to her. Will you get the fuck out of here? I'd kill you right now, but he won't let me. I promise, though, if you're still here the second his heart stops, I'm coming at you. Aren't you scary? she said in a bored tone. Ignoring the guy, Rio paced up and down inside the drapery, which is to say, she took three steps up and three steps back. Wasn't that a line in a Bruce Springsteen song, she thought? As an image of her brother came to mind, 
She stopped at the foot of the bed and tried not to get confused between the past and the present, but the stillness of the patient reminded her of what she had seen when she had broken down the door to Louise's bedroom. She would never forget the way her brother had been lying there on his back, against a pillow stained with his own vomit, his blue-tinged face angled directly up at the ceiling, as if he had been watching the hand of death as it had come for him. Rubbing her eyes, she stared at the patient again, even when, unconscious, he had a frown on his face and a tension in his body. There was no relief for him, anywhere. She thought of her brother and felt sick. We have drugs here, she said roughly. What? Apex snapped. This is a fucking drug factory, right? There are drugs here. Apex opened his mouth as if he had a tick that involved telling her to go fuck herself and was giving in to it again. She shook her head at him and spoke quickly, even as between each blink she saw her brother's dead face. There's heroin, here on sight. I've seen it on the streets marked with your iron cross symbol. You don't just sell cocaine, and opiates are opiates. They make pain go away. If we can get him a small dose of heroin, he'll at least be comfortable. Blink, her brother. Blink, her brother. That shit kills people. No kidding, she thought. Only if you give him too much, she said. And I know how to titrate it. I won't let him have too much. Rio went around the foot of the bed and stood in front of the man. Take me to where it's cut. I can test it. Then we come back here and help your friend, partner, husband, whoever he is to you. Apex slowly rose to his feet. God, he was huge. A living, breathing billboard for a beatdown. He jabbed her in the shoulder. I don't need shit from you. Why am I doing this? Rio asked herself. Well, because she could see more of the building. He would know how to get around, where the drugs were processed. Helping the patient would help her. You don't need me? She demanded. Really? Well, for one, you're sitting how many rooms away from the solution to his suffering, and you clearly haven't considered it. Two, do you know the dose? Enough to give him relief but not kill him? His respiration is already compromised, and I'm guessing his blood pressure is low. You don't know where that line is, do you? Are you a nurse? She thought back to all the conversations with ER docs immediately after and since her brother's death. She'd had to know exactly what had happened, down to the molecular level, from his body weight to the cut of the drug, to what else had been in his system. She'd had to... No, but I know a lot about overdoses. The man stared down at the patient. He is never not in pain, she said hoarsely, picturing her brother's face whenever he'd thought no one was looking at him. Apex passed a palm over his eyes. Never. He suffers constantly. Show me where the drugs are. I'll take it from there. There was a long silence. Then Apex shook his head. You don't need to come with me. I'll bring it back. What do you need? As he stared at her, there was a blank look in his eyes. Rio frowned. Do you know the difference between the heroin, any cocaine or meth, and the cutting product? And what about fentanyl? Of course. So what do you need? He was lying, she thought. You know this with enough certainty you're willing to risk killing him? And how are you such an expert? I'm betting my life on my knowledge, aren't I? She said. If he dies, you're offing me, right? As she just leveled a stare at him, he shrugged. So tell me what you need. A drug dealer who didn't know his wares. Unbelievable. What do you do around here other than look after your partner? She murmured. He's not my partner. Brother? No. Friend, then. The patient coughed a little, and as they both turned toward the man, a slight smile marked the distorted mouth. You must excuse him, the patient said. He doesn't know what a friend is. Rio leaned over the bed. We're going to get you something to help with the pain. There was a shuddering breath. I do my best to bear up. I am weary, though, and growing wearier. She reached out to pat his arm, but caught herself. We're going to take care of it. Looking up, she pegged Apex with dead serious eyes. Aren't we? 
As she waited for his answer, she saw her brother standing just inside the curtain, dressed in the jeans and the Nirvana T-shirt he'd been wearing when she'd found him dead. Luis was so real, she felt like she could reach out and touch him. And that was when she was forced to recognize the real reason she was doing this, the true driver. She was revisiting her brother's overdose and using what she'd had to learn. Like if she could ease the suffering of the patient— it would somehow recalibrate the too much her brother had shoved in his vein all those years ago. It was some existential algebra that didn't make a lot of sense. Nothing was going to bring her dead back, or set right all the bad things that had happened afterward. These were two totally unconnected events, and no matter the outcome here, it would have no bearing on what had come before. Aren't we? Rio repeated. As Lucan faced off at the executioner and dared the motherfucker to shoot him in the heart, he was picturing all kinds of happy things, like biting the vampire on the front of the throat, then ripping the flesh free and spitting it out. After that amuse-bouche, there was a peg fantasy, where he took the male by the armpits and pushed him against that wall so hard he was punctured by the dull wooden points. And behind door number three, something involving a chainsaw. The latter was a pipe dream, really, considering he was completely surrounded by absolutely no Black and Decker, but the other two hypotheticals, they were goers. No, he drawled when he wasn't popped in the chest. Is that a no? Considering the amount of metal on the guy, as well as dripping off both of those guards, the no trigger on all those fingers wasn't from a lack of available bullets. Where is my deal, wolf? The executioner said softly. Where is my money? Lucan smiled in a snarl. I'm working on it. Are you? I don't see any forward motion from that contact of yours downtown. I have kilos to move. Kilos I made a large investment in, and nothing from you. I'm beginning to think you're not the male for this job, and I believe you know how I fire people. The male lifted a hand toward the wall. Lucan didn't bother looking at all the obvious. His mind was down in the basement with Rio. If he died now, or at any time before he got her off the property? You need me. No, you're expendable, the executioner murmured. Don't forget it. I should never have brought her here, Lucan thought. But what had his options been? He had no idea how to help her, how badly she was hurt. You will bring me the deal at the end of this coming night. The executioner stepped off. Or I will replace you. There are others who will be helpful. Apex, of course. He was the other one attached to Cain. Do we understand one another? The executioner demanded. Motherfucker, Lucan thought. Then again, there was only one thing that mattered right now, and it had nothing to do with drugs. Yeah he muttered. So am I allowed to go now that you've enjoyed this little verbal masturbation session? It's meant so much to me. The executioner moved fast, outing a flashing knife and putting it to Lucan's jugular. Watch your tone. Lucan smiled and leaned into the blade. There was a bite of pain and then the scent of fresh blood. Taking a finger, he ran it through the wet spot and then licked the red stain off. Hmm he said. It never tastes as good when it's your own, does it? The executioner rolled his eyes. You're a sick fuck. And you need me to stay alive. For a little longer. And it's all up to you. Lucan turned away. As he met Mayhem's eyes, he winked, and then said to the guy, Collect your prize, asshole. You fucking burned me. Mayhem's mouth twitched, and no doubt he would have winked back if he hadn't been facing the proverbial firing squad. Even if it's nothing, the male shot back. There's still the satisfaction of turning you over to the proper authorities. An ass pat is good enough for me. Survival, Lucan said as he started walking. That's all he's giving you. The executioner spoke loudly. You better make sure you do right by me, wolf or your friend Kane's going to be put out of his misery, slowly. Glancing over his shoulder, 
Lucan stopped and narrowed his eyes. I'll get you what you need, and you'll better be prepared for war when that scout lying there dead at your feet doesn't return to his pack. Accidents happen in nature. You know that. With bullets, they're never going to find the body to discover the truth. So the executioner hadn't lied about the wolf coming here rather than being hunted where the clans were. You better hope so. Your kind is overpowered here, wolf. As Lucan started walking again, he wasn't going to keep arguing over an indisputable fact. If there was one thing he'd learned after all these years, it was that reality wasn't interested in anybody's opinion. Striding down the corridor and passing by the workrooms, he thought back to the night when Cain had sacrificed himself to free the jackal and his mate. The couple had been up on the dais at the hive, tied to the posts that had run floor to ceiling. There had been no way of saving them from the command. Lucan had been there, others too. Cain had taken his collar off, and the thing had done what it was designed to do upon removal. It had exploded and brought down the house, so to speak, or a lot of it. The collapse of the ceiling had toppled those huge posts, and in the chaos, the jackal and his mate had gotten away. Lucan had found Cain in the rubble. The collar blast had somehow been turned away from him, maybe from a malfunction. Who the fuck knew? Instead of blowing him up, the transfer of energy had sent him flying backward, not that there hadn't been plenty of damage. He'd been burned severely in his face, down his chest, and on his hands, and then there had been the impact against one of the hive's stone walls. Right after the blast, there had been no intention on Lucan's part to do anything other than save himself. But as soon as he'd tripped over the body, he hadn't been able to leave the mail. He'd picked up that former aristocrat and started running as hard as he could toward the evacuation route. Luck, or maybe it was divine intervention, had put a jeep in his path. He'd thrown Cain in, jumped behind the wheel, and hit the gas. He'd followed the caravan of semis and other trucks because he hadn't been thinking right. And it wasn't like he had any other resources, any viable plan. Freedom in that moment had not been the best move. Inside the prison camp, he knew how to function, and he knew there was help for Cain. So he had driven to the sanatorium and gone underground and found the nurse, Nadia. They had been doing what they could for Cain ever since, not that they were helping much. And when the executioner heard about Lucan's savior routine, he had smiled and removed Lucan's collar and told him that either he went into Caldwell and became the face of the prison's drug operation, or Cain would be killed. Slowly. Lucan had given in to the leverage, not because of any friendship or particular loyalty to the former aristocrat. It had been more about the sacrifice the male had been willing to make in that moment when it had counted most. Long before, Cain's beloved female had been killed, and he had been framed for her murder, which was how he'd ended up in prison. That he had seen fit to destroy himself so that two others could find for their lives what he had not only been cheated of, but cursed with imprisonment for, had put the noble in nobility as far as Lucan had been concerned. In the horrible confines of the prison camp and the cold, heartless fight for survival they were all locked in, it had seemed like the kind of gesture that had to be honored. And now they were here, with Cain just hanging on in the subterranean storage room, some internal life force inside of him too stubborn to let him die. Due to their biology, vampires healed without scars unless there was salt involved, and did so faster than humans ever could, but that didn't mean they were immortal. Lucan had no regrets except for Cain's suffering. After all, it felt good to have a principle that you didn't have to be ashamed of when you were falling asleep. But God, it was hard to feel like a hero, considering the state the male was in. Down at the end of the corridor, he took the stairs one floor lower and entered the sleeping area. He was surprised there wasn't a guard front and center, but then he caught movement as someone stepped out of the shadows. There was a pause. Then the male figure disappeared again, always watching, always waiting. Cursing to himself, 
He stared down the hundred or so rows of berths, thinking about all the prisoners wedged in like they were objects rather than living beings. As his anger stirred, he started walking again, crossing through the pools of lights thrown by the ceiling fixtures. The vertical four-by-eight-foot cubicles were stacked three up from the floor, all of them open at the one end, endless pairs of feet, shod and unshod, facing out into the space. Ladders were mounted to the right of each opening, and the snoring was muffled but pervasive. As he breathed in, the density of scents was nearly overwhelming, but there was also that fresh pine smell from the fact that it had all been newly built up, just like the workrooms, the executioner's wall and private quarters, and the other security provisions. The construction had been done before the relocation by God only knew who, and he had to admit it had all been thought through. Too bad it was positively inhumane. His assigned space wasn't far from the stairwell, and he'd always been glad he'd managed to get a top rather than a bottom or middle berth. Ascending the ladder, he slid into his slot, crossed his feet at the ankles, and folded his arms over his chest. He wanted to go to Rio, but he couldn't risk being followed, and putting her right in the hands of the executioner. As the dim snoring got on his nerves and everything felt itchy, he decided it was too bad he didn't have that old cassette player anymore. His sole possession had been destroyed during the collapse, and he missed the thing, even though he'd had only one tape. Duran Duran had had other hit singles in addition to Hungry Like the Wolf. They'd had one called Rio, hadn't they? Chapter 30 Just as Rio turned away from the bed, the patient spoke up. Lucan will take care of you. She glanced over her shoulder. Actually, I... I am on my own. He saved me not only when he didn't have to, but at great peril to himself. You can trust him. The patient's tone got more strident. And that is why you, Apex, shall ensure no harm comes unto her. She is a Lucan's. Rio braced herself for an inner private rager in her head about how women, especially women like her, were not anyone's pseudo-possessions. But when she just felt a little warm spot in the center of her chest, she wondered when in the hell she'd regressed into 1950s traditional sex roles. Then again, maybe she just had a low-level staph infection from having an open wound on the back of her head. That's right, she thought. The flush was probably just bacteria in her bloodstream, making her run a slight fever. Apex, the patient demanded. After a moment, the other man let out a grudging, mmm, sound, which, all things considered, could have meant anything from, yes, I'll chill on the whole murder thing, to, what are you going to do to stop me from that bed you're in? Although when the patient nodded a little, it appeared that, at least between the pair of men, the translation was acceptable as an agreement. Do not endanger yourselves. Coughing cut the patient off, to the point where Rio worried there would be nothing to treat by the time they got back. But then those lungs seemed to settle. Come on, Apex said grimly. When Rio went to pull back the curtain, he clapped a hand on her forearm. I go first, always. His voice was soft. His eyes were like a pair of assault rifles. You can lead on, she drawled but I'm not going to yes-sir you, so I wouldn't hold your breath for that one. Apex's brows rose, and then he, I go first always, out into the open area. As Rio stepped through, too, she... Something came down over her head, something soft, like a massive cobweb, and she immediately fought against the flapping, now heavy weight. Stop it, Apex snapped. We have to mask your scent. What? There was a tug, and then everything settled off her shoulders. Looking down at herself, she said, The nurse's uniform? That one was used for the last bed change and is on the way to the laundry. Explains the stains, she thought. Apex went over and opened the drawer of a desk that was right out of a secretary's office from 1980, 
When he came back, he started rubbing her down. Wait, what are you doing? The man's hands were quick and impersonal, passing over the folds of the buff-colored robe fast and hard. With every swipe, more of that incense smell wafted up into her nose. It's the best we can do, he muttered as he tossed the brown sticks back onto the desk. Now listen to me. When we're out there, don't fuck around. Follow behind me. Keep your head down and... When he just stopped talking, she glanced down at herself again. What? You don't know, do you? He said remotely. Know what? Where you really are. You want to draw me a map? That'd be great. Thanks. I'm not talking about location. Apex shook his head and yanked the hood piece up, the mesh swinging into place over her face. This is fucked up, just so you know. Really? Rio arranged the screen with impatience. I hadn't noticed. I thought I was at the Ritz. Let's get this over with. I couldn't agree more. At the door, she hung back. Because of all the grr he man bullcrap the guy was throwing around, while he leaned out and checked the corridor. Then, on his signal, she joined him, except as she fell in beside him, he elbowed her back so he was the tip of their spear. And do you have your gun? he hissed. No, she muttered. I left it behind because it didn't match my outfit. The man cursed. How does Lucan stand you? I'm wondering the same thing about your patient. Apex stopped dead. He is not mine. Right, which is why you were crying next to his bed. Don't push it, female. Under the hood and the screen, Rio made googly eyes at him and knew it was for the best that he couldn't see her face. When he resumed the forward motion, she resolved to stop poking at him. As fun as it was, she needed to start memorizing where they were. She was going to have to write it all down as soon as she could. And hey, the good news about pairing up with the guy? Apex so completely annoyed her that she wasn't thinking about her dead brother as much anymore. Yay. As Lucan lay in his berth with his eyes closed, he went back in time, his short-term memories like a spool of celluloid film run in reverse, people sucking out of doorways instead of walking through them, corridors flowing in the opposite direction. Words he'd spoken called home to his throat, his lungs. And then he was where he didn't want to be, but couldn't get free of. The way you're staring at my lips right now. So do you want to do something about this? Now he went forward, but in slow-mo, savoring the way that woman had looked at him, the way she'd scented, how he could feel the softness of her breasts against his hard chest, and then there was the contact of her mouth against his. The groan that came out of him was something he swallowed, and to make sure the sound stayed inside, he repositioned himself a couple of times, which didn't mean shit considering he was tight as a key in a lock. Not a lot of room. As his hips rolled, the erection that had Johnny on the spotted because of everything he was thinking about rubbed against the backside of his fly. Bearing his fangs as they lengthened, he moved his arm so that his hand was in range, and then he thought about what he was going to do. Did he really want to jack off in here while she was down in that clinic on her sickbed? Well, technically she wasn't ill. She was hurt. Oh, that's so much better, he muttered, closing his eyes, because, hey, you never knew. Maybe he could sleep instead of be a dirtbag. He went right back to the moment when she dropped her mouth to his. His hand didn't require any order from his brain to move a little and cover his. Lucan hissed. The weight of his palm along the top of his thick shaft juiced him up to the point of not saying no. Kicking one leg out as far as it could go, which was not far at all, he thrust his pelvis like he was penetrating that woman's hot, wet sex. More with the hissing. And then he didn't give a shit who in the other cubicles heard him. He was back on that bed with Rio, and he was kissing the ever-loving shit out of her— and because this was a fantasy, he curated Cain out of the clinic's picture and locked the door that had no lock. 
Then Rio's clothes disappeared without her or him removing them, her breasts exposed to his eyes, his hands, his mouth. And then they were changing positions. She was... Fuck, he groaned as he yanked down his fly and sprang his cock. In his daydream, Rio pushed him back and then got up on all fours. Looking around her shoulder, her eyes shone with sexual heat. I ache, Luke. Can you help me? Or something like that. Her lips were moving, but he wasn't really hearing her. Not that he needed her to tell him what to do. The glistening stripe between her legs was all the conversation he needed. Lucan mounted her in a surge, and his erection pierced into her sex. The orgasm that exploded into his hand was translated into the fantasy. As his palm went up and down, yanking, pushing, pulling, and cum jetted out onto the front of his pants and the hem of his sweatshirt, in his mind he was pumping her full of his scent, marking her, to the point where he bit her on the shoulder to hold her in place and reached around to the top of her sex. She was not wolven. That one god-awful realization cold-watered the whole goddamn thing in an instant. As his hand stopped and his fantasy derailed from its track and went free-falling off the bridge of his delusions, he banged his head back into the hard pallet a couple of times. She wasn't even a vampire who could just look down on him for being a half-breed wolven because females of worth did not fuck creatures like him. Rio didn't even know his kind existed, either of his kinds. And if she found out, it was not going to be the sort of news that made things better for them, easier for them, possible for them. Fuck, he groaned as he looked down at himself. In the glow from the lights out on the ceiling, he saw more than he needed to about his reality, and by extension, the two of them. The fact that he'd ejaculated all over himself and now had a sticky, cooling mess to clean up seemed like a perfect commentary on everything, especially their future. Chapter 31 Rio had vastly underestimated the scale of the place and the operation. The staircase she and Apex used wound its way around a landing, and when they got to the next floor up, he stopped and seemed to gather his thoughts as he sniffed the air like he was searching for evidence of a live fire. While he did, whatever the hell he was doing, she looked through the chicken wire glass in a heavy fire door. The corridor on the far side was easily sixty feet long and ten feet wide. A series of light bulbs dangling from raw wires illuminated its progression to a far-off end, and she wasn't sure what she was seeing. The walls had cutouts in them, little curved-topped holes stacked three to a group and spaced far enough apart to accommodate ladders that led up to the middle and top levels. It was almost as though they were sleeping compartments of some kind. Come on, Apex hissed. We don't want to be caught here. Then why did you stop? She glanced back at him. What are all those spaces? None of your business. As he pulled her away, she did some math in her head. Assuming they were a kind of bunk system, there had to be, Jesus, several hundred workers in the facility. How many people are here? She said, even though she'd already done the estimate, and even if she hadn't, he would certainly not help her. It was more like she couldn't believe the total. We're going all the way up to the main floor. It's more dangerous in some ways, and less so in others. Well, I'll put that in my Yelp review of this place. Thanks. When they got to the next floor, he didn't give her a chance to stop at the fire door. She caught only a glance through its windows down another long corridor. Unlike the one under it, the level seemed to be far more brightly lit, and there were no sleeping pods. The walls were also finished, although only with raw sheetrock from what she glimpsed. At the next landing, Apex stopped at a steel door that had no window in it. Pressing his ear against the steel panel, he seemed to not even breathe as he listened. Then he turned to her. The lowest two floors are totally underground. The next one up is mostly so. This one is not at all, however, so I'm going to have to move fast. As soon as I open the way, 
We're heading to the first door on the left that's unlocked. It's a break room. It will be empty, and the windows are boarded up, so it's safer. On three. One, two, three. Apex ripped open the metal panel and then recoiled as if he had been hit with toxic gas. Lifting his arm to his face, he ducked down low and jumped forward in a defensive crouch. Even though she didn't smell anything dangerous, Rio echoed his protective stance, drafting behind his bulk, holding her breath as a vague impression of moldy carpeting, peeling walls, and a crumbling ceiling registered. Out in front of them, Weak sunlight streamed across the corridor in sections, and he dodged around the stripes of faded gold. Right ahead of her, Apex was breathing heavily, like he was struggling to stay conscious, and his speed was slowing. As they passed doors, she tried the knob of every one of them. All were locked. Oh, God, she muttered as the man faltered and fell down. When he tried and failed to get back on his feet, she stood over him and looked around. Had he been shot? She hadn't heard anything. Rio grabbed his flailing arm and dragged him off the carpet. What's wrong? Help me. There was nothing in the air that was bad. No one else was around, and he didn't appear to be bleeding or wounded by a bullet. But now was not the time to ask questions. Hauling him onto her, she threw his arm around her shoulders, braced his weight, and tightened a hold on his waist. Together, they limped forward weaving a sloppy path down the corridor, her robe disguise tripping her up. She looked into every open door, noting the toppled office furniture, the graffiti, the occasional view out into a scruffy landscape of leafless trees. At each space, he told her to keep going. How much farther? she grunted. There. Okay, that narrowed their end zone down to absolutely nothing in particular. Just as she was about to drop him, his hand shot out and grabbed onto a knob. With a powerful crank, he released the mechanism and threw the door wide. And then he shoved himself off of her, falling forward like a drunk, landing face down with a bump of useless limbs. Shut the door! Shut the fucking door! He groaned. Rio shot inside, but didn't slam things, because there were people under them. Maybe above them, too, and they'd made enough noise with their footfalls. As she carefully closed them in, Instantly, everything went pitch dark, and her only orientation as she floated in space was the sound of the man's tortured breathing. Her eyes did adjust, however, shadowy outlines of a stretch of countertop, a sink, a table on its side, and one spindle chair in the corner pulling free of the void, thanks to a soft glow around the panels that had been nailed over what she assumed were window frames. Dumbwaiter! Apex said on a wheeze. Excuse me? Rio lowered herself to her knees. And what the hell is going on? Are you hurt? There. It's a dumb waiter. Your weight will lower it down. When you're ready, I'll pull you back up. No offense, but breathing seems like a challenge for you right now. How about we focus on that first? Go. I'll be all right. I just need a minute. Rio looked to where he was pointing. Across the way, there was a panel in the wall that was demarcated by molding. The inset square was maybe three by three feet, and it had a handle down at the bottom. The man coughed and made her think of the patient. Once you get down, you'll know what you see. Do what you have to and call up the shaft when you're ready for me to pull you up. I have my gun, she murmured, more to herself than to him. Even though he was a disrespectful pain in the ass, she didn't want to leave him. Still, they had a job to do. So she got up and moved across the room, chunks of plaster gritting under the soles of her feet. When she got to the dumbwaiter, she lifted the panel. It was so dark, she had to feel around to get a sense of the size. I need to take the robes off. I won't fit otherwise. Do what you have to. It was a relief to cast off the suffocating hood and take a deep, free breath. Then she put a foot into the space and grimaced as the inside of that thigh burned in protest. I should have gone to more yoga classes, she muttered. What's that? Rio glanced back. Apex was still lying there like a dead fly on a windowsill, his arms and legs curled up like they hurt. Are you sure you're going to be- Go! 
Rio reached in and found a lip on something that she could get a pretty good hold on. Pulling herself into the three-by-three-foot cubicle, it was alarming the way the pulley-rigged box rocked in its intrafloor track. And goddamn, as she squeezed her head to the side so her shoulders fit, the tender spot on the back of her skull hollered like a banshee. Please don't kill me, she announced, as her eyes bounced around the tight interior and could tell her nothing about the chances of her plummeting to her death. As long as you don't fuck around, I won't. She glared out of the dumbwaiter. I'm not talking to you, and you were wrong. My weight's not doing anything to move this thing. I suppose I should take it as a compliment, but it's a problem. There were a couple of quick-draw inhales, and then Apex grunted and got to his feet. Dragging himself over, he braced himself against the wall. I'll close the door and lower you manually. How? He opened a flush panel in the wall. Hang on. Rio closed her eyes and pushed against the walls that crowded her, like they were people she could get to move away. It's not me who has to do the hanging. Is this thing rated for my kind of weight? We'll see, won't we? He pulled the dumbwaiter's door shut on her. There was a bump, and another. Her breath was loud. So was her heart. Squeak, squeak, squeak. The descent was slow and agonizing, because the human body was not meant to pretzel into a space barely big enough to fit a picnic cooler. With every bump in the track and halt as Apex switched his grip, she had to fight the terror that something was going to snap, and she was going to straight shot down. God only knew how many floors to egg shatter all over. This time, the bump was different. Stop, she said, projecting her voice up the shaft. Shh, was the response. But hello, he stopped. Muttering about bossy men, she felt around the panel in front of her and found a handle at the bottom, which kind of begged the question whether the makers had anticipated the thing being used as an emergency elevator during the infiltration of a drug den to save a patient a little pain on his way to his eternal reward. Rio gripped. No, it wasn't a handle. It was a bracket. And pulled. Pulled hard. Put her shoulder into... Squeak. Wincing, she froze. When nothing came at her, she forced the panel farther up. She was fighting against its function, some kind of resistance locked in to prevent exactly what she was doing. Guess it was a no on the prognostication powers of its fabricators, at least when it came to someone like her being cargo. Either that, or they'd been worried about bagels and cream cheese, or maybe a fruit plate busting out and making a bid for freedom. When she had the panel all the way up, she stuck her head into... Holy shit! The well-lit area was the size of a large classroom, and as if it was used as one, there were a couple dozen tables set up in three rows. Each table had a pair of chairs set on one side, and a lineup of scales, bowls, and tools on its surface, including little hammers and straight-line pastry knives. Down on the floor... Boxes were set at regular intervals, and there were rolling bins dotting around. At the far end of the workspace, there were two proper desks, a couple of stepladders, and... She recognized the cellophane-wrapped bales in the far corner instantly, and was not surprised to find that the kilos of drugs were locked into a metal cage bin that was five to six feet high. Extricating herself from the dumbwaiter, she moved silently between the tables, her brain snapshotting everything at the same time it did some math. Twenty-four tables, two people a table, that was forty-eight workers. And yet, there appeared to be several hundred of those sleeping compartments. So there had to be more workrooms. The implications made her head spin. An organization of this size did not just appear out of nowhere. It was part of an evolved strategy for disseminating a huge amount of product. Clearly, they had been selling a lot of drugs for a long time. And yet why had no drug market intel from the streets mentioned a big whale like this? Then again, there were always cycles of preeminence, the eras coming and going as arrests were made or deaths occurred. Maybe this operation had come here from another part of the country, ready to make the most out of Caldwell's close location to Manhattan and further accessibility to Vermont, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. As she passed by a table, 
She paused and opened one of the cardboard boxes on the floor. It was full of little baggies, and each had the stamp of the iron cross on it. How far up did Luke go in the hierarchy? She wondered. Probably pretty far. She needed to get him to talk on their way back to the city. Continuing on, she went to the locked-up kilos and couldn't even estimate the street value. Well, she could, and it was in the millions and millions. How much product was on hand in the whole operation? And how did they get it in here? There had to be things like loading docks and other storage facilities to handle the pre- and post-processed drugs. With what she was seeing here, they could take in and put out kilos and kilos and kilos of cocaine and heroin in this place, and they clearly had the contacts with the importers to keep a steady stream of it coming. It boggled the mind. The sound of a door handle catching snapped her head around, and just as the way in opened, she dropped down to the floor. All the way across the room, a man in a black uniform entered and hit a light switch that made everything even brighter. Heart pounding, Rio looked through the legs of the tables and around the cardboard boxes as his boots started walking to where the hatch of the dumbwaiter was still shoved up. Proof that someone had gotten into the room and was still inside. Chapter 32 In the end, Lucan couldn't stay put. After he came all over himself and then buzz-killed that vibe with the hello, my name is Wolfie and not because I'm related to Beethoven, he had to go see Rio. He told himself it was to make sure she was safe. Also told himself that if anyone was following him after the showdown with the executioner, they'd have gotten bored by now of waiting for him to do something. And he might have further mentioned to his inner critic that the Rio-related wanderlust was not tied in any way to the kiss that had started the handshake deal with his dumb handle. Not at all. In the slightest. Whatsoever. But yeah, there was a lot of internal monologuing going on as he shifted out of his cubicle and walked off for the stairs. He knew the guard down at the other end wouldn't question the departure, just like there had been no problems with his late arrival after check-in. They were used to him coming and going on his own, courtesy of his work with the executioner. Pulling open the fire door, he was quick-footed as he descended to the lowest level. Lucan stopped, sniffed the air. Incense? And Cain? Nadia, the nurse, must have come up here, he thought, as he started again with the jogging. Bottoming out at the base of the stairs, he glanced back at where he'd come from, peering through the latticework of the balustrade supports. When he didn't see or hear anything, he strode off toward the clinic. The hall seemed like it went on forever, and as soon as he came up to the storage room's door, he opened it wide and looked down the row to Rio's bed. It was empty, with the sheets, such as they were, messy, as if she'd gotten up in a hurry. As his heart slammed into his ribs, he leaned back and looked out into the hallway. Of course, the bathroom. Telling himself to get a grip, he went across to the closed door. The scent of the soap she'd used lingered in the air, but it was faded, and he was relieved he couldn't catch any sniff of her. They'd managed to camouflage her successfully. With an excitement that was totally inappropriate, he put his ear right to the panel. It was cold against his face and got colder when he could hear nothing on the far side. He knocked. Rio, he said softly. There was no response. Glancing up and down the corridor, the prison camp seemed really fucking dangerous all of a sudden. Like the last however many decades had been a party. Rio? More with knocking. Rio, answer me or I'm coming in. He shoved at the door with his shoulder and got a big old fat nothing as it opened wide. She wasn't in there. Lucan raced back to the clinic and walked directly down to the bed she'd been in. Bending low, he looked under the mattress. The gun was gone. Son of a bitch. Lucan. His head whipped to the drapery hanging around Kane's bed. You okay? Not that there was anything he could do to help the guy, if he wasn't, for so many reasons, but mostly because he had to find Rio. Lucan. If it had been anyone else, he would have fucked them off, except just as the executioner had discovered, and Lucan knew all too well, 
the aristocrat was someone he couldn't help but take into account, even if it was just going to be briefly, like it had to be at the moment. Going over to the draping, he yanked it back and turned his face away for a second. Every time he saw the mail, it was a fresh horror. Hey, he said, I'm dealing with something, but later I can— She is with Apex, came the frail interruption. You're female. What? Lying on the floor of the workroom, Rio tracked the guard or whatever the hell he was as he progressed down to the dumbwaiter. Clearly, he knew something was out of place, but then again, she couldn't have left a bigger clue if she'd gone neon with a Las Vegas arrow flashing at the damn thing. Glancing behind herself, she measured the drug bundles in their cage and discovered that the load was on a platform with wheels that just so happened to have the same amount of clearance as a car. With as little movement as possible, she flattened herself onto her stomach and pulled herself forward, using her bare palms and her knees. As she closed in on the undercarriage, she tilted her head to the side and prayed, prayed, that she didn't jostle the cage or... It's some kind of... I don't know what the fuck it is. It's like a box in the wall. No, it wasn't like that before. No shit. I'm not going up there. The word stopped short, but she couldn't tell whether it was because the man had noticed her or just been interrupted by whoever he'd called. When Boots started stomping in her direction, she feared it was the former. Staring out from underneath the cage's platform, she tried not to breathe at all as a set of military-grade footwear came down to the bin and stopped right in front of where she was hiding. Do you think I can't smell you, human? There were a series of grunts, and her cover was moved off to the side, rolled clear away. As it revealed her, Rio wondered what kind of lead shower would fall on her head if she pulled a pivot and trigger. But considering that was her only chance, out of the corner of her eye, she caught a little red dot skating across the floor. And as it went out of her field of vision, she'd have bet both her eye teeth that the laser sight was pegging her in the back of the skull. Get up. There was no reason not to comply, and one very trigger-fingerish reason to do so. Rising onto her hands and knees, she looked around her arm. The man was standing right next to her, about three feet away. The toes of his boots pointed at her just like his gun was. Above his thick neck, his face was bored. You're never making it out of here alive, he said. His eyes were some shade of blue, and they were moving over her body, but not in a sexual way, more like he was measuring her for a coffin. I fit in small spaces. What? I'm retractable. He shook his head. Shut the fuck. Just like that, Rio sprang to her feet, palmed his weapon between her two hands, and diverted the muscle. As the guard caught up with what was happening, she ripped the gun out of his lackadaisical grip and jabbed it right up into his crotch. You're going to want to move really carefully, she gritted. Anything fast, I'm going to get nervous. And geez, I get twitchy when I'm anxious. Click, click, oopsie. She jumped back so that he couldn't grab at her. You don't know what you're doing, he said grimly. He was still looking disinterested rather than alarmed, clearly in the camp that women were never much of a threat. And maybe she should feel complimented that he'd called her a human as opposed to all the other derogatory nouns in his playbook. Backing up, she went as far as the nearest table. From out of nowhere, a strange confusion hit her like it was a tangible blow to the head, her thoughts scattering to the point that, as the gun she'd taken from him lowered of its own volition, she couldn't stop it. Even though she ordered her arm to stay up, it refused to obey the command, and as she started to fight to keep the weapon pointed at the guard, a piercing headache flashed across her frontal lobe. The man walked up to her and said, Give me the gun. No. And yet, sure as if she had a remote and it was in his hands, Rio turned the weapon around and placed the nine-millimeter grip first into his palm. The guard smiled now, revealing sharp canine teeth. As I was saying, you don't know what you're doing. Rio opened her mouth to... God, she didn't know what. She couldn't think at all. The impulse to communicate was there, but... Her entire vocabulary was unavailable. And then things got worse. 
Her feet started walking, taking her forward, toward the door across the room, the one he'd come through. As her body routed around the tables, she told herself there had to be a way out of this. She just needed to think. Open the door for me, would you? Like he wanted to prove who was in control, she watched her hand reach out and turn the knob. Then she pulled things wide and stood aside as he passed by. Come on. She followed him like a dog brought to heel, her body not hers to control, her will off somewhere else. Without being ordered to, verbally at least, she walked down the hall in a trance, heading for some kind of wall with thick sticks protruding out of it and a door inset in the center. All at once, her mind was flooded with images of horror, men and women strung up on those pegs, beaten with crowbars, with hammers, with lengths of chains, and then left there, the blood dripping off their battered bodies and pooling on the floor. A figure in black, not the guard, but someone else, was smiling as he watched them die. She had no idea where the gruesome slideshow came from, but it was as vivid as if she had witnessed it all personally, as if it were her own memories. He's going to have fun with you, the guard drawled. You're just his type. Chapter 33 Lucan rushed back to the stairwell. God damn it, he'd smelled the incense coming down the steps, but also the nurse? That was why he'd been thrown off. Rio must have been put in one of Nadia's robes to mask her scent. What the hell was Apex thinking, taking that human woman into the mouth of the monster? Helping Kane was fine, but fuck. As he arrived at the landing of the workroom's floor, he looked through the glass window in the fire door and tried to see if there was any disturbance. Everything seemed locked tight and business as usual for the daytime hours, and down at the far end, the pair of guards were in place in front of the wall, and there was nothing on any of the pegs. Maybe she and Apex had gotten in and out already. Either that, or the executioner had taken her into his quarters for a private party, where that fucking madman would bite her jugular and drink her dry just for shits and giggles. Directly overhead, a door opened and closed. Lucan dematerialized into thin air and reformed on the underbelly of the landing above him, hanging aloft like a bat, ready to pounce on... Apex stumbled down the steps, weaving from side to side. Not now, Wolven. We got a problem. Releasing his grip, Lucan dropped down in front of the vampire and went for the bastard, grabbing his throat and forcing him back. She wasn't supposed to leave the clinic. He punched the other male into the wall. What the fuck were you thinking? It was her idea. Her idea. The words came out as he banged, banged, banged the dumbass piece of shit into the concrete over and over again. Executioner, as her. Lucan stopped with the bread dough routine. After a split second of total shock, he shoved his face forward, baring his fangs. You better hope she lives, or I'm going to kill you with my bare hands. I tried to stop her, asshole. With a shove, Apex broke free but then tripped over his own feet, fell onto the steps, and slumped like he was out of gas. Oh, fuck. I don't believe you, Lucan hissed. You want to argue with me or save her life? We need to get her out of the executioner's private quarters. I heard them talking from where I was. Fuck you. No one can trust you. Apex shot up and got right back into Lucan's grill. She was trying to help Cain. For that alone... She deserves better than dying at the executioner's hands or underneath him. So you can bet her fucking life you can trust me on this. Between one blink and the next, Lucan remembered Rio strung between two stakes on the floor of that apartment, that human cutting open her shirt with that knife. I owe her, Apex announced. There was a pause, and then Lucan lowered his head, rubbed his aching temples. Since when did you grow a conscience? He muttered as he went over to the doorway and checked through the glass again. Apex cracked his knuckles. Since I've been sitting at the bedside of that male of worth in the storage room, and then listening to that female of yours get manhandled by a goddamn guard. Lucan couldn't even think about that last one, or his head was going to fucking explode. Like morals are something you catch like a cold. Shut up, Wolven. 
You can't bust her out of there alone, and you know it. You need me. As Lucan assessed the guards on duty at the wall, he shook his head, but couldn't argue. We have to go for a frontal assault. Take out the pair by the door. Get into the private quarters. The guards will call for reinforcements if we rush them, and the backups are only one floor down. We need a reason to get close. Lucan frowned. Then it came to him. I know what to do. With a quick yank, he pulled open the door. Make like you're in on it all. As if I've never done that before, Apex muttered. The two walked forward at a leisurely pace, Apex a couple of feet behind, as was his way. He never, ever made a pair with another. The I am an island bullshit, a cliché, except for the tally of his kill count, which was about to go up by at least one, maybe two guards. They'd gone about halfway down the hallway of workrooms when gunshots rang out, the pops muffled and distant. As the guards glanced toward the door to the executioner's private quarters, because, hey, those kinds of noises were not that unusual, Lucan ditched his plan to talk some bullshit about the deal and lunged into a run. Apex yanked him back and spoke under his breath. You have to pretend you don't care. You make like it matters, and the executioner is going to have your balls really in a grip. You want in there to help her? You have to chill. It took every bit of self-control for Lucan not to explode into a sprint, but in the back of his mind, he knew it was unlikely she was merely wounded. The executioner only shot to kill. He liked his torture wet and messy, and it wasn't until he was done or bored that he'd cap someone. Unless someone was a physical threat, of course, and Rio, as a human woman, would never be one of those. I'm going to kill that bastard with my bare hands, Lucan growled and my job is to make sure you have plenty of time to do that. One of the guards pointed off toward the stairwell's entry. Go back to your quarters, right now. Yeah, no. Lucan came to a halt, putting his hands in his pockets and rocking back and forth on the toes of his boots. I'm well aware of what the executioner has in there, right now, as you say. The guard leveled his gun right at Lucan's face. I know you have special privileges, but fuck you. Lucan leaned forward, puckered up, and kissed the muzzle of the weapon. You're so cute. But the executioner needs to know that that human female with him, she's his only way to Mozart. She's the source down in Caldwell that he's asked me to negotiate with. I brought her here to prove that we had the capacity to meet the supply she wants. We lose her, we lose all his business he planned for, paid for, is expecting. You know the drill. As light dawned on the guard's marble head, that gun started to lower, and Lucan shrugged. If he's just plugged her full of lead, he's shit out of luck, and he's going to blame you for not telling him who she is. Better hope the holes are somewhere that doesn't leak a lot. Fuck, the guard said as he went for the door and entered a code. Sir, we have a problem. As the way was opened, both of the guards, and then Lucan and Apex funneled into the executioner's private quarters. And what they saw was... Rio? Lucan breathed. In the center of the large, open space next to the army field desk that had been set up by the foot of a mattress, the human woman was standing over the dead body of the executioner, the gun Lucan had given her in her hand. She looked up and did a double-take like seeing Lucan was the last thing she'd expected. Although, as levels of shock and awe went, Lucan was feeling like he was totally winning in that department. Had she really just... He was going to kill me, she announced. It was justifiable homicide. Chapter 34 Rio couldn't tell who was more surprised the four men who rushed into whatever the hell space she was in, or the man she'd just killed with two bullets to the heart. The shooting had happened in the blink of an eye. She'd been marched into the room, and the guy in black with the shaved head had stood up from the table over there and looked at her as if she were fresh meat. The cold happiness on his face had been something to remember, especially as he'd taken out a knife with a blade as long as his arm. 
After he'd been informed where she'd been found, he'd excused the two guards, and the sound of the lock getting turned had been like a coffin lid secured over her body. So self-assured he'd been, so completely in control, and in spite of her mental confusion, she'd known she had only one chance, given that tremendous sword-like weapon in his hand. Out with the gun. Two shots, just like she was drilling targets at the range, right into the center of his chest. Real blink-of-an-eye stuff. In the aftermath, he'd stumbled backward, looking at his sternum like he was baffled at the fact that the lead slugs hadn't bounced right off him or something. She hadn't been interested in his death throes other than monitoring him to be sure that he didn't get his hands on another weapon in his last three and a half seconds of life. After a couple of final twitches, he'd stayed still, and just as she'd wondered what the hell to do next, the welcome party had burst in. Luke jumped forward. Are you all right? Rio was in his arms next. She didn't know who went for who first. She didn't care. As she squeezed her eyes shut, she just held on to that strong, warm body and breathed in his cologne and felt gratitude for being alive. Not that he wore cologne. God, he smelled like home. Dimly, she was aware of a strange cracking sound. Then another followed by two duffel bags being dropped on the floor. Had he and Apex brought luggage? Who cared? In this moment, Luke was what mattered. We've got to get you out of here, he said. She pulled back and touched his face, then came to her senses. Not yet. I need to help. Rio didn't finish the thought, as something in the background caught her attention. Looking around Luke's muscled arm, she blinked a couple of times. The two sounds she'd thought were bags hitting the floor had not been about any kind of Samsonite. Apex had done something dramatic to the two guards. The two men were both lying face down. No, wait, their bodies were on their stomachs. Their heads were facing upward. Meanwhile, the guy was walking over to the open door and calmly shutting it, locking it. We've got problems now. More, she corrected numbly. We have more problems. As she stated the obvious, a series of Caldwell Police Department rules and regulations weaved their way around the fact pattern of everything that had just happened with the man and the big knife and the handgun she still had in her palm. She was in over her head, big time, and her allies in the situation were a pair of drug-dealing killers. All right, Luke said as he started to pace around like he was thinking. When he came up to a display of rifles mounted on the wall— he nodded like he'd sought their advice and decided to do what they told him to. We need to play this like we've taken over. Apex, you and Mayhem will stand guard out in front of here until nightfall. No one will question it. Then, as soon as it's dark, I'll take her out. Brace yourself for the head of the guards. Apex went over to check out the bald guy. They've been looking for their opening all along and they're going to see this corpse as a challenge, not a done deal. And do you really want to run this place? We'll deal with that as it comes. Luke glanced to the closed door. In the meantime, we make this death really fucking obvious. We hang the body up outside on the wall. It's a coup. We're in control now. Apex shook his head. It won't last. The guards are going to attack. It doesn't have to last. All I need is nightfall. While they talked, Rio did some walking around herself, the contents of the large space finally registering properly. Things were set up as a military seat of command, the bed and an old forties wardrobe, the only civilian furniture, the rest of it collections of rifles and guns, what she knew were explosives, and then other supplies including food, water, and camping equipment, like the man had been prepared to get gone at a moment's notice. Coming up to a rudimentary conference table, she tried to look casual as she checked out all kinds of documents with columns on them. Everything was handwritten, which made sense, as there was no computer or electronics around that she could see, and the data was organized by dates, weights, and dollars. Wait, there was also a list of names and times. She needed to copy this all somehow, even though that was crazy. And where's the money? she wondered. With this sort of scale, there was going to be a crap ton of cash somewhere on the premises, and that presented both a security and a storage challenge. 
Just before she turned away, she saw the cell phone. It was a newish one, without a protective case, nothing but a flat plane of glass you could access the world with. Glancing across at Luke and Apex, she put her hand out and scooped the slippery unit into her palm. It didn't fit in her side pocket, too big. So she turned her back to the pair of them and put it down the front of her pants, inside her underwear. When she pivoted around again, Apex had the dead guy up off the floor, the knife that had been in that hand falling loose and bouncing in a clatter. I'll take care of this, he said, and find mayhem. With an utter lack of bother, like he was doing nothing more than moving a sack of potatoes around, he went over to a keypad, entered a series of numbers in a pattern, and opened the way out. And then she and Luke were alone. Well, as long as you didn't count the two dead guys on the floor. But really, they weren't going to interrupt much, were they? I need to put both of them out there, too, Luke said in an apologetic tone, as if they were a pair of house guests who had overstayed their welcome. I can help. She glanced over at him. We'll do it together. Are you okay? As Lucan asked the question, his eyes were making like they were tied to a brain that had any kind of medical training going up and down Rio's body, searching for injury. More injury, that was. But she seemed all right. Her color was good, and he could scent no blood other than the executioner's. Goddamn, the woman was like a cat with nine lives. Yeah, I'm all right. She continued her walk around, stopping over by the back door that led out into the parking area. There's a keypad here. I'm taking that means it's got a lock on it. Yeah, everything's secured. When she went to pull at the handle anyway, he put his hands forward. Wait, stop. She froze. What? Don't open that. Oh, you think it's alarmed? No, he didn't want to take any risk that it would let in a stream of daylight, because unless there was a nuclear winter-worthy cloud cover in the sky, he'd end up a flaming ball of vampire. That's right, he lied. We have to be careful. We don't want more company. Rio dropped her hand and nodded. You're right. She glanced back at him. I don't know that I'm thinking right. Jesus, I wonder why. He went over to her and held his arms out. The fact that she came up right against him was a relief. How did you do that? He said as he looked at the bloodstains on the floor. Shoot the guy? She shuddered, her strong body quaking. I was just lucky. He underestimated me, and so did his guard. I wasn't searched. I had the gun. I used it. If they'd stripped me, I would have been in big trouble. Stripped, as in weapons, as in clothes. In a surge of aggression, Lucan became furious enough to want to go out to the wall and kill the executioner all over again. I'm going to get you back to Caldwell, he told her as he closed his eyes. There are vehicles here, and I'll get a key and... As she pushed herself away from him, he cleared his throat and prayed she wasn't going to argue with him. What? I can't leave yet. She crossed her arms over her chest and stared at the guards Apex had taken care of. I need to help that patient down in the clinic. That's not your problem. If not mine, whose? They don't know how to give him pain relief safely. They need me to help. I can get him. Do you not remember what just happened here? He pointed to that bloodstain by the bed. How many near misses do you need before you stop rolling the dice with your life? She just shook her head. I'm not leaving here until I help him. So you need to get me back in that room with the drugs. Oh, come on. There was a series of beeps on the far side of the door, and Lucan put himself between Rio and whatever was coming in. Apex entered with mayhem, tight on his heels. The latter clapped his hands and rubbed them together. Nice work, Lucan. How the hell did you get a clean shot at the executioner? As Rio's eyes flared, Lucan muttered, I didn't. Executioner, she said. Mayhem looked at her, looked at Lucan. Exhibitioner was what I meant. That motherfucker, excuse my French, used to go around flashing people all the time. I mean, if I never see his polywog and two lily pads again, it will be too soon. Phew. Thank God you shot him. This was followed by a fist pump offered directed at Rio. 
after which everybody just blinked at the guy. What? Mayhem asked as he lowered his arm, like he was totally surprised that no one at the BBQ wanted to try his four-day-old fermented homemade slaw. So glad you're here, Lucan said dryly. Then he turned back to Rio. Listen, you're going to forget about Kane. You're leaving these quarters. Don't you dare too dangerous me, Rio glared at him. I've earned the right to be taken seriously instead of coddled like a civilian, and the proof was right there at your feet until that body was taken out of here like a bag of sand. As she jabbed a finger at where the remains had been, Lucan wanted to yell at the top of his lungs. Instead, he tried to rein himself in. I know you want to take care of Cain, but he's fine. Is that his name? Well, Cain is dying by inches, and he's in constant pain. Do you want to go through that? Or would you rather be spared some of the suffering by those around you who are able? What would you want, if it were you? From over by the door, there was a soft curse, and Apex walked off sharply. Rio continued to speak stridently. That poor man's dying is not something you can stop, but his agony is. So someone is going to help me get some heroin to test, and then we're going to take care of him. She glanced around at all of them, her eyes narrowed. I'm not asking for permission, gentlemen. I'm looking for partners. Mayhem spoke up at that. Of course he did. As in crime? Partners in crime? Because we are so good at that. I mean, we got you on the felony thing. Totally. As Lucan pictured himself slapping the guy into silence, Mayhem shrugged. What I say wrong now? Sweet Jesus, was all Lucan could think. Chapter 35 No, Vicious said. The jackal's not going to be involved in this search for the prison camp. Period. End of. As he laid down the law, everyone in the king's study looked over at him, including George, who you'd think would have been stone-cold sleeping as he lay under his master's great carved desk by the clawed feet of the great carved throne. But nope. The golden retriever was alert and judging him too, evidently, which just meant the dog was as nuts as the rest of them. The guy's not a trained fighter, V pointed out from his frilly silk chair, and he's emotionally involved. That's a recipe for disaster if you're talking about being out in the field. Why are we bringing a liability into a situation that's already unstable? As Rage and Butch stared at him like they were debating who had to answer the rhetorical, V looked around at all the French blue and pictured the room redecorated with blood-red drapes and black walls. Maybe a rack in the corner. A display of whips and chains, just to set the mood right. You know, instead of Marie Antoinette, more like Metallica meets Dungeons, no dragons. No offense, Rage, V thought as he took out a hand rolled. Across the way, the great blind king leaned into his desktop, Rath's heavy upper body flexing, the black muscle shirt he always wore stretching to accommodate the shift in bulk as he plugged his elbows into the blotter. The tattoos of his lineage, which ran up the insides of his forearms, flashed their design, particularly as he church-steepled his fingers. He knows how the prison camp runs, though, the king's wraparound sunglasses made the rounds among the troika, connecting the dots between Rage and Butch on the sofas and V on his satellite Berger, even though the mail couldn't see. That's helpful intel. He knows the people in there, the power structure, the way it functions. But that was before. V recrossed his legs and sank further into the down-stuffed cushion under his ass. At the new site, who knows what it's like. And if we find it, when, Rath cut in. I don't want to go into a raid worried about someone getting popped because they're having a moment with their long-lost buddies. We've got the full brotherhood, the band of bastards, and the other fighters to coordinate. That's a lot of moving, stabbing, shooting parts. And we're all trained for this shit. I mean, Christ. Over by the crackling fire, Rage cocked an eyebrow then reached into the pocket of his Sunni Caldwell sweatshirt and pulled out a bag of M&Ms. 
Fuck off, V mouthed as the brother jogged the shit. It's the first rule of combat, V continued. Don't bring civilians into a fight. You'll just end up saving them instead of actually getting the job done. Butch, who was dressed in one of his slick Tom Ford suits, put his dagger hand up. I think the jackal's got a hell of a lot of heart, and I'm not sure why locking him out is a thing. We're just looking for the place. When we find it, he can dematerialize to safety. You think he's going to do that? V couldn't believe he had to argue the obvious. You really think that guy with a hell of a lot of heart is not going to try to save his little friends the second he gets the coordinates? On that note, V started patting around for his lighter so his nicotine delivery system could get its groove on. When he couldn't find the damn thing, he cursed himself. How was it possible that he'd left his bick behind? Oh, right. Up until about five minutes ago, he'd been so relaxed and loose, he hadn't assumed he'd been smoking anything. Then this bright idea had been floated out at what was supposed to have been a brief, nothing new on the prison camp, but we're going back out on the streets meeting. No wonder yoga had to be done three or four times a week to work for most people. Calm had a shelf life only as long as your next crisis. I think the jackals earned the right to choose. Butch shrugged, those hazel eyes focusing on the middle ground in front of his face as if he were gathering his thoughts. Like Rage reported, the poor son of a bitch didn't want to leave the other prisoners behind and hasn't gotten over it. If that's the crucible he wants to fall on, who are we to stop him? It matters how you leave things and who you leave behind. So V's roommate was thinking about his partner again. Great. V started patting pockets on his chest that he didn't have. On the far side of the coffee table, Hollywood jostled the M&M's bag again, a soft rustling rising up from the candy. Fuck off, V mouthed. Why? Rage lip-synced back. You know you'll feel better. I don't feel bad now. What? Wrath demanded. V burst to his feet and went over to try to be casual by the marble fireplace. Nothing. I'm fine. I'm perfect. He glared at Rage. Look, the jackal has a mate now, a son, too, from what I've heard. He's got a shot at living his life. He needs to count his fucking blessings and sit on the sidelines, true? This isn't his business. Over at the desk, Wrath shook his head. I think maybe you're a little off today, V. Are you hungry or something? Maybe too sober, Rage added helpfully. I'm fucking fantastic. You want me to drop and give you ten to prove it? One of Wrath's black brows lifted over his wraparounds. You don't usually worry about other people's family lives, especially ones you don't know. Fine, a hundred. We'll do a hundred, just to prove I'm great. V dropped down to the antique carpet, punched his palms into the delicate swirly rug, and assumed a plank position. Then he pumped it out. One, two, three. It's the jackal's choice, Butch said over the counting. That's my point. If it were me, I'd be eaten alive by the fact that I didn't get others out. Eleven. Twelve. Is he really doing push-ups? Wrath muttered. Jesus, V. Give it a rest. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. No one is paying attention to your pneumatic display. The king cursed. Can one of you get him back on track? and I'm going to let the jackal V up the ante on his volume. Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty. Make his own decision. Wrath spoke up loudly. If the motherfucker wants to be involved in finding the place and then go in with you when you do, it's up to him. But you bunch of maladjusted meatheads have to let him know the score. He gets left behind if things go tits up, and his life will not be prioritized above any of yours. If he's fine with that playing field, I'm not going to get in his way. That's fair, Butch hollered. Good, Rage barked over the counting. Glad we got that settled. Thirty-one, thirty-two. Will you stop him? Wrath ordered, before I throw a dagger at him. From out of the corner of his eye, V noticed rage bursting up, which kind of made sense. 
Rath was capable of a lot of things, and could handle himself in a fight even without his eyesight, but you didn't necessarily want to be in range of him pitching a blade across a room. Thirty-three! Thirty-four! Ow! A tremendous weight landed on V's back, like someone had dropped a car on his spine from three stories up, and as his elbows gave out under Rage's copper squat, the rug rose up to slap him in the pie hole. Get off me! V growled. The bag of M&Ms appeared next to his eyeballs. With a roar, he snatched the candy and pitched Rage off, the brother flying backwards across the room, antiques no doubt cringing everywhere. Except Hollywood somehow managed to flop into a lie-down on the sofa he'd started out in. Nailed it, he said with a wink, as he put his hands behind his head and relaxed like the stretch-out totally worked for him. And I'm just taking a page from your armchair example, my brother. V headed for the door with the M&Ms, ripping open the bag and pouring some in his mouth to chew, because it was either that or he was going to be up close and personal with Rage's shit-eating grin in a way that would cause a lot of swelling in the guy's pretty features. I think you're all making the wrong call, V said around the melted candy in his mouth. And if you'll excuse me, I have to go find a lighter. Are you eating chocolate? Rath asked as V yanked open the way out. No, I'm not. As he poured more M&Ms down his gullet, he caught sight of Rage glancing over at Butch and making little circles next to his head. Oh, and P.S., we haven't found the new location yet. V said over his shoulder as he stepped free of the study. So the jackal and his codependency issues with people in his past are a moot point. God, where had his post-session float gone? It was like that shit with Jane hadn't even happened, he thought, as he finished the bag out in the hall. Chapter 36 if she wants to go to the workroom, we go with her. As Apex laid things out like that, Rio appreciated the unexpected ally. Walking up to him, she nodded at the door. All you have to do is take me back down the hall. I've got the layout of the room. I'll be in and out in a second with a sample. Looking over her shoulder, she cut Luke's protest off. I know the drugs. I sell them. When was the last time you were picking between bales of white powder and knowing the difference between coke and heroin? You're a negotiator, not a processor, right? It's not that hard, he said remotely. One lick and I know the difference. Do you know how to test it? Do you know what to do with the pure stuff? He opened his mouth, shut it, opened it again. Let's get this done and over with, she said. You told me that it was quiet during the day. We just killed the two guards outside, and the head of it all. No one knows we're up here right now. Things will never be safer. Luke's eyes burned, but not from anger. It was from something else, something she wasn't sure she could handle right now, or maybe at all. Rio, it's an unnecessary risk. Apex spoke up. To who? Not to me. Not to fucking Kane. It's not unnecessary at all, and she's right. We don't handle drugs. We're not part of the workers, and never have been. What the hell do we know? Do you want to die here, Rio? Luke demanded as he ignored the other man. You want this to be how it ends for you? Oh, absolutely, she snapped. That's why I let that man murder me about fifteen minutes ago, instead of shooting him in the heart, twice. There was a tense standoff, and then Luke broke away and walked around like there was so much anger flowing through his veins, he had to either move or explode. When he stopped short, she had no idea what was going to come out of his mouth. Fine, but I'm taking her down. He jabbed a finger at Apex. You're too involved. And you've bonded with her, the other man snapped. So who's the problem here? Luke marched right over to the guy. You don't know what you're talking about. Bonded, Rio thought. Before a brawl got started, because, yeah, that was going to be so helpful, she double-checked the clip in her gun and walked over to the door out to the hall. What's the combination to this keypad? Mayhem, who'd been totally quiet, joined her. I got it. He put in a pattern and the lock shifted. 
Will you let me get armed first? Luke bitched. We're leaving now, Rio announced as she opened things and stepped out. Oh, God. The man she'd shot had been spear-mounted on the wall. Sharp pegs stabbed through the back of his throat, as well as in various places down his torso, his body weight suspended off the floor. You wanted to do this, Luke said to her in a low voice. She looked at him. No, I have to do this. You don't even know, Kane. This is about my brother, she blurted. I was forced to learn a hell of a lot of things I didn't want to while trying to deal with his overdose. At least now, I can put some of the knowledge to good use. Let's go. Rio walked off in a daze, her past tangling with the present. But she had to snap out of all that. Which, as Luke had pointed out, was the survivor thing, wasn't it? Stay focused, stay sharp, stay in the here and now. It helped you not get shot. Besides, when she'd been escorted down here by that guard, she'd had that crushing headache and all those weird thoughts. She couldn't afford to waste this opportunity to mentally record the details of the building. Forcing herself to plug into her environment, she saw four rooms. There were four processing rooms, going by the layouts down the long hall, and she stopped at the door the guard had walked her out of. Here. Luke stepped up next to her. We gotta move fast. Thanks for the tip. Rio rolled her eyes. I was going to stroll around and maybe do a little feng shui inside. You know, redecorate some. Maybe design a mural. Luke shook his head and glanced over his shoulder. Mayhem, do you have the code? The guy said. Yep. Aren't you glad when I set this all up, I kept a default? How did they not kill you? Luke said like he was pondering a law of the universe and wondering why it existed. They don't think I'm very smart. The guy stepped up to another keypad and entered a different pattern. There are advantages to appearing to be an imbecile. Well, you're an expert in that, Luke muttered. When the lock clicked free, Rio opened the way in and immediately started for the cage of kilos in the corner. You stay out here, Luke ordered Mayhem before joining her. As the door eased shut behind them, she took a deep breath and smelled the unpleasant chemical sting in the air. She hadn't noticed it before, probably because she'd been frantic. What happened to your brother? Rio nearly lost her stride as she went around one of the work tables. What? You heard me. The testing chemicals are on the desks over there. Clearing her throat, she rerouted her trajectory and went to one of the supervisor's monitoring positions. This is exactly what I need. Putting her hand into a wicker basket full of ampules, she nodded. Yep, this'll do for testing. The thing was even trademarked Narcocheck. She couldn't have done better if she'd ordered the stuff herself. Now can you get me in that? She said as she nodded at the cage. Luke crowded into her personal space. Stay behind me. Why, what are you going to... The shot rang out in the room, sharp and loud, and Rio covered her head and hit the floor. Fortunately, the bullet ricocheted elsewhere, and what do you know? From around the edge of the desk, she saw the chain link uncoil and fall free of the bin. Rio didn't wait for the all clear. She rushed over to the cage, opened the front access panel, and reached in to the blocks, which were marked H or C. Go figure what that meant, she thought, as she thanked the Lord for the Benny she hadn't expected. And geez, it meant Apex or Luke could have done this part of things after all. Grabbing one of the H-blocks, she went over to the desk. She thought about just taking some of the test solution units with her, but then what if the label on the block meant something else? There was a pair of scissors by the desk, and she pierced the wrap on the kilo and got some of the powder on the blades. A quick drop from the dropper, and the substance turned yellow. She had been hoping against hope it would be red for morphine, but what could you do? Do you need a cutting agent? Luke asked. No, she said, as she paused to inspect the consistency of the heroin. This is extremely pure, so we're going to use a small amount and dilute it with boiled water. How will you be sure of the dose? I'm going to give him it intravenously bit by bit, the effect is fairly instantaneous, so we'll know by how he eases. Just don't kill him. 
Rio focused on his face for the first time since he'd walked through the door into those private quarters. He looked exhausted, nearly to the point of sickness, with black circles under his eyes and lids at half-mast. Although she couldn't tell whether the latter was because he still thoroughly disapproved of what she'd insisted she do. I won't, she said, as she tucked the kilo against her. Can you take me directly to the clinic? Can't you just tell me what to do? You can stay with Apex and Mayhem in the private quarters. I'll answer that the same way I did to Apex. At least I know what I'm doing. Luke cursed, then rubbed his head like it hurt. Look, we can't stay down there long. This place is going to start waking up soon. Once that happens, we need to get you out fast, and it's easiest from where we were. All we do is go right out the other door. She left that potential argument alone and headed for the exit. Except then she doubled back and went around behind the desk. Going through the drawers, she pulled them open one by one. Thank God, she muttered as she reached into the big one down by the floor. What is it? Narcan pens, in case I get it wrong. The entire drawer was full of them, loose and out of their boxes, like their use was a fairly normal occurrence. She speared into the collection and took as many as she could fit in her fist. Then she shoved them at Luke, making him hold the load. Okay, we're ready. Luke filled his pockets with the pens and then stared across the space at her. What? she demanded. We go down there. You do whatever you have to, and then we're going back to those private quarters. All right. Fine. Lucan emerged from the workroom first. Apex and Mayhem were right out in the hall, guns that they'd lifted from the executioner's stash by their sides. They hadn't changed into the uniforms of the guards, but the weapons spoke for themselves. If any prisoners happened to break curfew and run into them, no questions would be asked. And up here? Well, the executioner pegged on that wall like a side of beef was a hell of a banner. We're going to the clinic, he said, but as if those males didn't know what the plan was. Lucan stayed by Rio as the four of them proceeded down the corridor. Rio kept looking around like she couldn't believe the scale of the operation. Checking out to see if we can take care of your boss's needs, he heard himself say bitterly. After all, executioner or not, he shouldn't kid himself. There were still drugs that had to be sold, weren't there? She glanced over her shoulder. I'll tell him all about it when I see him. As she refocused ahead of herself, he pictured her back in Caldwell, living her life without him. The stab of pain in his chest made him wonder why he couldn't pull out of this, whatever it was, with her. Deal or no deal, she was going back down south. He was staying here. But hey, they'd be able to see each other as they made new deals. How fucking romantic. When they came to the stairwell, he opened the door and put his palm up so she didn't immediately follow him. Then he sniffed at the air and listened. The nurse is already down there, Apex said. I told her we needed her. Lucan nodded and motioned Rio through. As they jogged a descent, the other two brought up the rear. When they got to the bottom floor underground, he didn't need to tell Rio where to go, which turns to take, how to be as quiet as she could. She went right down to the clinic and immediately inside. The second they all entered the storage room, the curtain around Kane's bed was pulled back, the nurse's flowing robes like an extension of that which fell from the ceiling. You shall not hurt him, the female said from behind the mesh covering her face. Rio shook her head gravely. No, never. I just want to help. I never dared to try to secure any of that the nurse pointed out from under a voluminous sleeve, her gloved hand shaking as if she were emotional. It's secured and difficult to obtain, and if you are found with it, the consequences are dire. I understand. Do you have any distilled water or boiled water? Yes, here. Come. As the females disappeared behind the draping, Lucan crossed his arms so that the gun in his hand pointed out behind his armpit. I'm not going in there. I am. When Apex started forward, Lucan snagged the male's heavy arm. You don't hurt her. If this goes bad and something happens to Kane, it's not her fault. 
The other prisoner lowered his chin and glared out of his deep eye sockets. That depends on what she does and how he responds. Lucan bared his fangs. You can't blame her. I can do whatever the fuck I want. Not with her, you can't. There was a brief, surging tension, and then Apex pulled away, parting the drapes and disappearing through them. As the lengths of fabric resettled themselves, there were murmurs from the other side. Pacing seemed like a good idea, so Lucan walked down the lineup of beds, came back, went down again, came back. Meanwhile, Mayhem just stood where he was, staring at the fall of sheets. Maybe the prisoner was projecting good vibes into whatever the hell was happening at that bedside. Maybe he was having a stroke and hadn't fallen over yet. Maybe he was thinking about absolutely nothing at all. Total toss-up. Lucan went to the door that opened out into the corridor. Cracking the panel, he double-checked that there was no one coming. When that didn't seem like enough, he stepped outside and went all the way down to peer into the stairwell. No sounds, no scents, but that could change at any moment. All he could think about was how much he didn't want this exposure for real or this wasted time. No offense to Cain. When he re-entered the clinic, Mayhem looked over at him. You know, the male said, this place is going to be in chaos when the executioner's body is discovered, and we need to get rid of the guards in the quarters. For one, it'll keep things tidy. For another, they're going to start to smell. But the real reason is the head of the guards. If they know we killed that kind of personnel, it's going to make everything harder. The guy did have a point. We'll figure it out. Of course, if you deliberately want to stir up shit, we could just put them on the wall, hang them like paintings. Oh, we could make a decoration with them. How about high-fiving, shooting a basket? No, you're boring. You think this is a Mr. Popular competition? Then Lucan shook his head. You're right, though. We should dispose of them. If the head of the guards doesn't know where they are, and we're not obvious about what we did— they won't know who did the coup right away and what went down. They'll have to check all the troops, and because some live off-site, it'll take some time, which we'll use to get Rio out of here. If only there was a way to get them outside. We've got another hour of sunshine left. Rio could do it. Looking over at the guy, Lucan said, No, she can't. What can't I do? Rio asked as she emerged from the draping. Nothing. Help us take those two guards outside. Mayhem cut in. That back entrance from the private quarters is, she is not, going to make it simple, and you wouldn't have to take them far. Taking them anywhere. Sure, Rio said. I'm strong. I'll move them. No, Lucan snapped. It's too fucking dangerous. And you can relax with that. She looked between him and Mayhem. I heard what you said. I think it makes a lot of sense. The more confusion, the better especially if you're worried about the head of the guards, whoever he is. Mayhem shot Luke in a smarty-pants look. Great, we'll go back to the quarters, and... The draping around the bed was whipped aside. Apex locked eyes with Rio, with an intensity that was so great, the male was trembling from it, his huge, lethal body poised to leap on the woman. No! Lucan barked as he threw himself between them. I told you, it's not her fault! What happened? Rio shoved him out of the way, then dug into the pockets of his pants. I have the Narcan. With a surge, Apex jumped forward and wrapped his arms around Rio. Letting out a choked sigh, he dropped his head into her neck and held on like she was the only thing keeping him on the planet. Over the male's heavy shoulder, Rio's eyes squeezed shut and she embraced him back. Oh, Apex, I'm so sorry. I really tried to help. The nurse ducked her hooded head out from behind the drapery. He's resting comfortably for the first time since he came to me. Now Rio's eyes flared back open. There were tears in them. Thank God he's not in pain. Lucan exhaled a breath he hadn't been aware of holding and wondered what the hell the story with her brother was. Chapter 37 Captain! As Jose came up to the open office door, he knocked on the jam. 
You receiving there, Captain? Willie isn't at her desk. From out of the private bathroom in the far corner, a muffled voice answered with what could have been anything. Hello? Not now? Come in? Fortunately, a second later, Stan emerged from his favorite crapper, as he called it. His frown was deep as a cavern, and at his throat, a tie was in the process of being redone, or undone, hard to tell which. You taking that off or making sure it stays on? Jose asked. Wish I didn't have to wear it at all, but the one I put on this morning got mustard on it at lunch. Well, I got French's on my sport coat, too. Stan nodded over to the sofa where a wad of navy blue had been tossed onto the cushions. Good thing I have second sets of everything in my favorite crapper. Nailed it, Jose thought. The sacred private head, a joy to behold. He entered and parked it on the hard chair just inside the door, where no one but the chief ever goes. It's the only throne I have. What can I say? Jose nodded. I'd protect it jealously, too, if I were you, especially considering how many officers hit the food trucks for lunch. That's where I got mustarded, as a matter of fact, and I can't show up at Stephen Fontaine's with part of a ham and cheese on my chest, right by my name tag. Wow, Fontaine's. Fancy. Just another rubber chicken dinner. As they went back and forth, Jose let his eyes go on a roam. He'd spent so much time updating Stan on cases and problems in the department that he was familiar with every framed picture on the walls, as well as the window that looked out over the back parking lot, and the perpetual clutter on the desk, and the American flag folded military style in its triangled box on the shelves. Closing his eyes, it was like a video game he'd overplayed when he was a kid, the details projected on the backs of his lids. Was he going to miss this? he wondered. No, he didn't think so, he decided. I'd be surprised if they serve chicken, he murmured, much less the rubber kind of poultry at Fontaine's. Yeah, probably right. Stan finished knotting the tie and flipped his collar down. But at the end of the day, this event is just like any other one. You know the deal. Some rich jackholes giving money to every non-profit in town, and we've got that police benevolent fund. Wouldn't mind if some of his benevolence headed in our direction. You've always been about the rank and file, Stan. Speaking of which, what's going on with our missing officer? The captain sat down in his leather chair. Any leads on Hernandez Guerrero's location? No, I'm sorry to report. Stan cursed and smoothed that new tie, which looked exactly the same as all of his ties. Jesus, Jose, what are we going to tell her family? She doesn't have any. Wait, did I know that? I think I knew that. And no boyfriends, husbands, that kind of thing, right? No, she lived alone. There are a couple of cousins out of town, and we're waiting to hear back from them. Shaking his head, Stan's eyes got a faraway look. You're lucky you're retiring. I don't know how much more I can take of this shit. What about Officer Roberts? How's his family? Awful. Just awful. God damn. At least he didn't have a wife and kids. And if that's all you can say about a situation, it's pretty fucking crappy. As Stan stared off into space, they stayed in silence for a minute. No longer captain and subordinate. Just two men who had known each other for over twenty years, in a context that could get really tough sometimes. You know, Stan said, my ruby used to be great in situations like this. That woman would bend over backwards for any family of a slain officer. She'd cook them meals that froze well. Big deal. The whole freezing well thing. She'd visit and do chores. Pick up kids if she had to. She was great. An extension of the department. Yeah. How's she doing? Good. Her second marriage is going way better than her first. Big surprise, huh? Stan rubbed his face and looked over his messy desk with an expression of hopelessness that had nothing to do with all the paperwork. She was right to leave me. Too many frozen meal orders, and that wasn't the half of it. You're lucky you're still married. I am. Jose glanced at the window and wanted to change the subject, like he had some kind of nuptial survivor's guilt. Light's getting low early now. Winter is coming. Anyway, 
enough about ex-wives and the weather. Tell me what you know so far about Officer Roberts. Yeah, so the coroner bumped the autopsy up and performed it this afternoon. I just got the results. We got a bullet. Good. Ballistics working on it? Yep. Meanwhile, Trayvon and I went through Roberts' apartment. Did you find anything? Nothing we didn't expect. Old takeout in the fridge, beer cans in the recycling bin. No signs of a struggle or a robbery. We didn't come across any car keys, but they could have fallen out of a pocket when he was in the river. Same with his wallet. What about the car? Haven't located that yet. It'll turn up. This city is getting too violent. Stan cursed again. Maybe I just need to go on a vacation, get recharged. Or retire, like you. You got a good pension? No, I got good debt. I had to second mortgage everything to pay Ruby off, so she could afford that other wedding dress of hers. And anyway, normal life is expensive. He shrugged. Then again, I could always get another job after this one. Maybe I can open a food truck. Or drive one, as it were. Do you cook? Okay. Something else, then. The captain motioned around his desk. Come on. I'm too old school for this job now. Look at this shit. Everything's about computers, and has been for a decade, maybe longer. I'm next to useless. The officers love you. You got a lot of loyalty among the rank and file. That new mayor, though, she's going to run me out. Stan shrugged. Maybe I only need a sailboat. For, like, recreation? As an escape. Have you been on the water before? Do you even swim? Are you just here to poke holes in all my future plans, and I'm just talking about sailing off into the sunset? Hey, so what are you going to do with all your free time? Jose laughed softly. I'm a start by going an entire week without getting woken up in the middle of the night. You have low standards, my friend. Fair enough. Jose got to his feet. Have fun at Mr. Fontaine's. Hey, do you need any other resources to help you with both those cases? Jose shook his head. Trayvon and I got this, and everyone in the department is helping. That's great. That's how it should be. Stan shifted his weight up onto his worn loafers and held his forefinger on high. Listen, before I forget, can you give me a copy of the most updated report on Roberts? I'm hounded by cameras everywhere I go, and I need to be prepared for the questions with all relevant details. Controlling your expression when you're confronted by shit is harder than you think, and the press seems to know everything. Man, I'm glad I don't have your job. I just want to be prepared. Of course, and I'll get you everything before I leave tonight. Hate to ask you to stay late. It's my job, at least for another four weeks. Goodbyes were said, and then Jose closed the door behind himself and gave a wave to Willie, the captain's executive assistant, who was back at her desk in the waiting room. Homicide was just down the hall from the chief's suite, and on the approach he could hear the murmuring voices of the bullpen out in the corridor. Walking into the open area with its cubicles and fast-talking detectives, he felt an old, familiar charge go through him. It wasn't pleasurable, per se, but... He didn't dislike it either. The idea of never experiencing the adrenaline surge again made him feel like he was in a kind of mourning. Trying to keep himself from overthinking everything, he headed for Trey's desk and thought about Stan's chief shit and was so glad the force didn't have some disconnected bureaucrat sitting in that chair. If that man was serious about leaving too, Jose had another reason to be glad he was retiring. Things were going to change in the CPD if Stan was no longer in charge, and not in a good way. Chapter 38 Back at the prison camp, Rio's mind was churning as she returned to those private quarters upstairs. As Mayhem entered the code again and sprang the lock, she walked in and stood over the bodies of the two guards. As an undercover officer, there were rules and regulations about things she could and couldn't do, and she wasn't exactly sure how many she had tripped up in the last twenty-four hours. Then again, everyone back in Caldwell no doubt thought she was dead. Not that that gave her a pass. Just outside, then? She said. Where exactly? This gruesome task was necessary, 
She needed to get a sense of the exterior of the facility, and she was running out of time. They were liable to blindfold her on the way out when they left after dark, so if she could see the exterior of the building now, it would make it easier to identify and locate the operation, wherever it was. Just right outside. Mayhem went over to the other door on the back wall. All you have to do is take them down the shallow stairs and leave them right there. This is ridiculous. As Luke spoke up, they both looked at him. Well, didn't he seem happy? He had crossed his arms, planted his boots, and was the very picture of over my dead body. Ha ha, Rio thought grimly as she glanced down at the guards. Look, I can handle it, okay? You think these are the first corpses I've seen or handled? It doesn't matter. Yes, it does. She had to check out the outside of the building. And it won't take me any time at all. When she went to hook her hands under one of the guard's armpits, Luke stepped in. No, I'll do it. I'll take them. Are you out of your fucking mind? Mayhem blurted. There's a little cover over the door. It'll be okay. There was a tense pause between the two men, as if they were communicating telepathically. And then Mayhem shrugged, as if Luke had won the argument with some really bad logic. I guess I'll just make sure she gets out of here alive, the guy muttered. That's all I got. Don't be so fucking dramatic. Luke picked the guard up off the floor and slung the dead body over his shoulder. Get the door, will you? You better hope it's cloudy, Mayhem announced. Like she said, I won't be long. In the back of Rio's mind, she tried to find a protest that wouldn't make them suspicious. When she failed, she could only impotently watch Luke and she couldn't help but note how easy it was for him to lift a heavily muscled man up off the floor, and dead weight was tough because there was little resistance to get a grip on. She couldn't imagine being that physically strong. As Mayhem entered a different code on the pad than the one at the other door, she memorized the pattern and was surprised at the smell of fresh pine as things were opened. Light from an overhead fixture showed off all kinds of new construction— but as with everything she'd seen that had been recently added, nothing was painted or finished beyond the rough-in first stage of the work. Luke descended four or five steps. Then he paused at a second reinforced door and looked back at her. For a moment, that felt like an eternity. He stared at Rio like he was memorizing her face. You can trust Apex, too, he said roughly. The bastard's a sociopath, but he feels like he owes you, so you're safe with him. Dear Lord, he was saying goodbye. What the hell is out there? she asked. Mayhem drew her away and closed them in the quarters together. Putting his back to the panel, he squeezed his eyes shut. Then they waited, and waited, and waited. As time stretched out, Mayhem started to roam around, hands in pockets, hands out of pockets, he looked at a watch on his wrist that was not actually there, and for the first time, Rio noticed what he was wearing. It was the same kind of loose sweatshirt Luke wore, and his boots were the same. Pants, too, like it was a uniform. How long's he been gone? she blurted, because she was wondering herself, worried herself. Abruptly, he turned to her, took out a gun that was so big it surely qualified as a hand cannon, and held the weapon out to her. You've got to go and check on him. I can't. Rio didn't even hesitate. She took the 40. Open that door right now. The man went over to the keypad. Listen, once you're out there, I can't help you. You're on your own. Just please bring him back. He can be an asshole, but I'm kind of fond of him. Don't worry. I got him. The sun was low in the horizon, its angle sharp its rays dulled by the seasonal tilt of the earth on its axis. There was even some cloud cover in the sky, and on top of all that, there were trees around, granted with not much on their limbs, but the trunks and branches were not invisible. Yet Lucan didn't make it more than two feet out of the door. Yes, there was an overhang, but that didn't do shit when that great ball of fire was so close to going down on the horizon— the low position of the sun meant the blinding, strength-sucking golden light hit him like a ton of bricks, the force of it taking his breath away. As he slumped, 
he lost his hold on the guard's body, but that did not matter. Instantly, he couldn't see anything. The world turned into a shapeless, formless bank of white, and he spun around, thinking he was facing the door, except he wasn't. He put his hands out, but he couldn't find the handle, couldn't find the building. He tripped over something, fell down, pushed himself up. Burning now. Was it his skin? Yes, and the pain was so paralyzing, he landed face first in dirt. Holy shit, he thought. This was how he died. He couldn't believe it. There had been a number of other situational volunteers for the Lights Out trophy, from accidents to fights to an infection when he'd been a young. And then there had been the dreaded transition, because he was a half-breed and that was how vampires matured. But after surviving all of those assaults on his mortality, he had lived to discover that this— this oven-hot baking sheet stretch of asphalt was how it happened. This sun bath was the answer to the question that every person who was alive, be they vampire, wolven, even human, wondered about in some dark corner of their mind. And the weirdest thing was, he couldn't stop thinking about Rio. Fear for her life made him try desperately to find the door. Casting his hands out, he dragged himself forward, even though he knew damn well that he could just be pulling himself farther and farther away from safety. Luke! The voice confused him. What was Rio doing out here? Oh, right. The white landscape around him had to be the Fade, the place where vampires went to spend eternity. And hey, it turned out that the female you wanted to be with was your greeter. Shit. Rio! He mumbled. Are you dead? Come on, stand up. In the great abyss of his pain, he still wanted to please her, do what she asked of him, so he attempted to get to his feet. Fuck, he groaned, as a hold locked around his waist and yanked him forward. He stumbled into something hard, his face taking the brunt of the impact, and then his balance listed. There was a series of beeps, and then another series. God damn it, what's the code? Rio barked. Lucan weaved on his feet, and the collapse that was coming his way speeded up like it was a boomerang, looking for the hand that threw it. One minute he was holding his own against gravity, the next he was horizontal, his face back in the dirt, his body not responding to all kinds of get up, get up, get ups. After that, there was a split second of relative silence, which was followed by a hell of a lot of noise. Bang! 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 Mayhem! I need the code! He's dying! What's the code? Lucan threw his hand out toward Rio's voice, and he got something on her, an ankle, he supposed. Rio! I need the code! Mayhem! Shh! Rio! Listen to me! When it was clear he wasn't getting anywhere, he used what felt like the last of his strength to yell, Rio! There was a pause, and then her voice was very close to his ear. I'm getting help. I just need to get help. Listen. When she fell silent, he talked fast because he knew he was out of time. I'm so glad I met you. What are you talking about? I need to... Lucan grabbed at thin air and then happened to snag her hand. Pulling her back down, he said hoarsely, I wish we'd had more nights and days, you and me... I think we really could have been something. Stop talking. Save your strength. As he went quiet, he wasn't sure whether he was following her directive or was just about to stop breathing altogether. He wished he could have told her more because they had had more together, more time, more peaceful surroundings, more kissing, more love. But that, his dying heart knew, was not a gift given to the likes of drug dealers and half-breeds. And more was the pity. Chapter 39 Through the swirling smoke and terrible grilled meat smell of burning flesh, Rio restarted with the pounding on the metal panel. She couldn't hear the sound the impacts were making or what she was yelling. All she was aware of was that Luke was face down on the ground beside an out-and-out -out bonfire, and she needed to get him back inside. 
Mayhem. She glanced back at Luke. His big body was in a sprawl, and one of his hands seemed to be smoking. And it was obvious what had happened. Even though there were no gas fumes in the air, he'd clearly used an accelerant on the dead body and tossed a match, and the explosion had blown up in his face and lit him on fire. In a fit of self-preservation, he'd done a stop, drop, and roll, and she worried about what the front of him looked like. God, she prayed his lungs were okay. Help, she yelled. Right next to them, the fire was doubling and redoubling, the heat curling off the remains of the guard in ever greater intensity. If the blaze kept growing, she was going to have to drag Luke away. The door flew open, something breaking through it, a black bag. No, the other guard's body had been used like a battering ram and as she caught sight of the shallow stairwell, she had a split-second image of mayhem with his arm raised to cover his face, his balance falling away, his body landing back on the pine steps like he'd passed out. Just before the door clapped shut, she buttressed it with her hip, and then she extended her leg and held it in place with her foot. After that, her superpowers kicked in. Even though Luke had a hundred pounds on her, she somehow found the strength to hook a hold under his arms and pull him toward the stairs. Naturally, his body caught the damn door jam, but then it was on the panel and keeping things wide as she yanked, yanked, yanked. As his boots finally cleared the threshold, things started to shut and she had a final glimpse of the fire, a final inhale of that horrible stench of burning flesh. Then there was a hard impact slam, followed only by breathing. Ragged breathing. Hers. Mayhem's. Not Luke's, though. He was horribly still. The door at the head of the stairs opened, and Apex's voice barely surmounted the panting. Jesus. Things started happening at that point, but she was having trouble tracking it all. Apex picked Luke up and carried him inside, and then Mayhem was next, like they were cordwood being stacked. Marshalling her own coordination, or what was left of it, she stumbled up the steps and tried the door, which had reclosed on itself. It was locked. What was the code? Apex opened the thing before she could even try it once. I got you. He grabbed her as she fell forward. In you go. With a practiced move, as if they were dancing, he spun her around and she felt a seat come up to her butt as her legs went loose. It took her a minute to focus, and then she looked across the private quarters. Mayhem was stirring on the floor by the door. Luke was on the bed, sprawled face up, but at least he was breathing. Such high standards. Pushing herself to her feet, she went over on unsteady legs and sat down by him. The burns on his face weren't so bad, just a flushing redness, and his sweatshirt was perfectly intact. That one hand she was worried about as it was red and swollen. And then there were those lungs. He clearly breathed in fire. To have that much of a reaction, and yet show so little external damage on his body. We should get him treatment, she whispered. Yet even as she said it, she knew there was no way any of them would agree to take him to a real doctor. After a little while, Mayhem, who had clearly come around, and Apex started talking. She didn't listen. She just sat next to Luke and willed him to be okay. I wish we'd had more nights and days, you and me. Her mind was a chaotic storm, too many thoughts swirling around, nothing landing for proper attention. No, wait, that wasn't true. She wished they'd had more time too, and different circumstances. Wake up, Luke, she said softly. Please. There was no hope at all that he'd hear her, much less respond but his eyes fluttered and then opened. Glowing yellow eyes locked on her face with surprising focus. Hi, she cleared her throat as her voice cracked. You're safe now. Luke's stare moved around until he seemed to give up on the whole sight thing, and then he said something she was never going to forget. I'm safe because I'm with you. Rio stayed at Luke's bedside for... Well, she wasn't exactly sure how long. It turned out that the quarters had a bathroom behind a partition in one corner, and from time to time, 
she would get up and refill a glass of water for him, making sure that when he roused, she was there to help him lift his head to take a sip. He had refused to eat the bread and cheese that Mayhem had brought and put on the table with all the handwritten spreadsheets, and Luke didn't seem to be resting when he wasn't conscious. It was more that he passed out and came to in a cycle that could hardly be considered peaceful. It reminded her of Cain. Speaking of the other burn patient, Apex, along with Mayhem, was just outside, standing against the locked door by the executioner's cold body. Luke made a noise in the back of his throat as if he were coughing, and she bent down closer to him. She had spent a lot of the time staring at his face, tracing the planes and angles of his cheekbones, his jaw, his brow, with her eyes. It seemed incredibly intimate to look at him like that, without him being aware she was doing so, as if they were separated by a crowd and she was off in a darkened corner, admiring him. Speculating about his life was unavoidable, and she wondered how he had ended up here, in the drug trade, in a place that had its own pseudo-police force. Who were his parents? Where had he grown up? What would he do after this era in his life was done? Assuming that his end in this business was not a grave, then again, the only way out for him was death. People as deep into the trade as he was didn't make it out of this alive, and they were killed in brutal ways. She thought of the charger in that alley, the driver shot, and then she remembered the dead guy by the fire escape, and finally, the hired hitman in that apartment. Although, who could have seen that big dog coming? Oh, and then there was the executioner, who she'd shot. No. Luke was not going to live long enough to retire. He was just one more cog in the machine that had killed not only Rio's brother, but her whole family. I should hate you, she whispered to Luke. She should hate him for selling the very drugs that had ruined not merely Luis, but her mother and her father, because that was the thing about illegal narcotics. You didn't have to do them to get lost in them. Sometimes it just took a son doing the using and dying because of it to take down an entire family. Unable to stay still, she stood up off the mattress and walked around. Her aimless wander took her over to the folding table, and as she looked at the columns of numbers and dollar signs, it was a relief to focus on something else. This was invaluable evidence, she thought. The question was how to get it out. The phone. She had that phone. Glancing back at Luke, she made sure he was still asleep. Then she took the unit out of her pocket. Of course, it was locked, but it was an iPhone, so she swiped up from the bottom and accessed the camera. Turning off the ringer switch to make sure there were no sounds, she pulled some of the ledgers toward her and faced them right side up. The first picture she took was blurry because her hand was shaking. She tried again. Better. Sitting herself down, she snapped photographs of each page in each stack, trying to get as much in the shot as possible. After she was finished, she moved on to some of the loose papers, which covered things like staffing the production rooms and schedules for the guards. And then there were order forms for bulk food. You have to feed everyone, she murmured. Of course you do. Flour, sugar, canned goods. An abrupt image of the kitchen from The Shining came to mind. Wendy and Danny Torrance being led by Dick Halloran through the dry storage room. Huge cans of vegetables, boxes of cereal, and jugs of sauces lining shelves. There had to be a mess hall somewhere, she thought, and support staff, workers whose sole job was to feed the others. The logistics were overwhelming. The knock on the door by the wall was loud, and as she startled, she dropped the phone. Fortunately, the thing landed in her lap. But as the way in opened, she couldn't put the cell in her pocket without being obvious. She slipped it under her thigh and then made a show of stretching her arms over her head. He's still sleeping, she said to Mayhem. Is all that for us? We didn't finish the first load. The guy had another big tray in his hands, with more of that bread and the same cheese on it, along with some Coke and Sprite and cans. Figured you'd appreciate some backup grub before you leave. He put the meal right on the table, on top of the documents. It's not much, but it'll fill your belly, okay? 
Underneath is a bag you can put it all in. Thank you. As Mayhem turned to check on his friend, she uncovered the bread with one hand and forced the phone into her pocket with the other. I'm not fussy, she said as she tore off a piece and put it in her mouth. Oh, wow. Still warm. Fresh from the ovens. God, you guys have everything here, don't you? Enough to keep going at any rate. Mayhem smiled at her. You're an excellent nurse. He's looking better already. Is he? Yeah. Aren't you Lucan? Is that his full name? She asked when there was no response. As the guy just shrugged, she glanced at the back door. You realize I'm not going to leave until he's better? Mayhem nodded. I figured, and he's going to want to say goodbye to you. How are things out there? Is everything okay? We'll find out very soon. The sun's down now, and things are getting busy. Don't worry, we'll keep everyone out of here. Besides, you know the code on that back door. I saw you watch me put it in. If shit gets bad, let yourself out and run like your life depends on it, because it will. She cleared her throat and cracked open one of the cokes. And this is cold. Funny what you think of as gourmet, huh? Standards change, depending on where you are. Well, I'm going to go back out there. The man retraced his steps across the space and then looked over his shoulder at her. You holler if you need us. Actually, I was thinking I'd go check outside to make sure the fire is extinguished. What's the code to get back in again? Mayhem's eyes shifted up a little so that he was still staring in her direction, just wasn't meeting her eyes anymore. And then she felt a headache coming on. Or maybe it was more like the one she'd had before was returning. Either way, she cursed and rubbed her temples. Yeah, you let me worry about that, Mayhem said in a low, serious voice. The fire could attract attention, though, she muttered through the discomfort. I mean, the whole point of not working during the day is to make sure there's no activity, right? You're good. It's not a problem. I just thought I'd help. Listen, I really appreciate what you're doing for Lucan. And Kane, too. I mean, seriously. It's amazing. Plus, it's clear you've got guts and you've done us a favor with the exhibitionist. But I'm not giving you the code to entering the building at large. I'm sorry. I can't do that. It's totally okay. She put her hands up. I honestly am just restless and looking for something to pass the time before he wakes up properly. Totally fine. Mayhem nodded once. And remember, no matter what happens, the people out in the rest of the building can't get in here. Then they can't burn you out either. The wall is flame retardant. Same is true in the back. This space was designed to be a kind of fortress. Thanks. There was a moment of quiet. Rio, that's your name, right? Yes. Nice name. As he disappeared through the door, a shiver went through her. Something was not right about this, she thought. Something was... Shaking herself, she looked over at Luke on the bed. Paranoia is not going to help here. On that note, she ate some of the cheese. The taste was sharp, but not unpleasantly so. And with the bread? Well, it was pretty much the best thing she had ever put in her mouth. Although that was more a commentary on that thing mothers always said, rather than the food itself. Hunger was the best spice, or whatever the phrase was. Getting up from the table, she took the makeshift sandwich with her, and the next thing she knew, she was systematically going through the quarters like it was a crime scene. Well, because it was. Three men had died here, and one of them, the one who was mounted on that wall out there, had been the result of her own actions. She inspected everything from the bathroom, the changing area, the gun rack. Rio found the car keys hanging on a nail by the rifles. Chrysler, a fob with a single black-headed key. Sneaking it into her other pocket, she turned to Luke, Lucan, whatever his name was. He was breathing easier now, although that was a relative thing. He still looked like he was in pain, his brows pulled in tight across the bridge of his nose. Maybe he needed some of what they'd given Cain, even though he certainly wasn't wounded as badly. Back at the bedside, she lowered herself down onto her knees and looked at the back of his hand, 
the one that had been burned so badly. Then she frowned. The skin seemed a lot less red and inflamed, as if it was progressing through the healing process, but at a much faster rate than made any sense. She thought of what the burn had looked like when they'd been locked out in the back parking lot, next to the fire. Not that she had any medical training outside of rudimentary CPR and first aid, but the injury had looked like a third-degree one. What with the uneven blisters that had extended out of his sleeve at the wrist and down his fingers? Now, it was like a bad sunburn, nothing more. Miraculous. In the back of her mind, the warning bell that had saved her too many times to count started. <laughs> started to ring properly. It had been on the verge of getting serious about its job ever since she and Apex had hurried down that corridor upstairs together, and he had crouched and had to fight through that nothing-wrong hallway like it was an obstacle course of radioactive chemicals. Rio cursed softly and thought about the strange trance that guard had put her in in the workroom, how her hand with the gun in it had lowered of its own volition. But surely... That hadn't happened, right? After all, she'd had how many blows to the head over the last how many days? It was more likely that her mind was malfunctioning than there was some sort of mystical anything going on. And yet, she couldn't shake the sense that nothing was as it seemed. Rio stayed beside the bed on the floor for a little longer, and then she told herself she needed to use this time wisely. Going over to the table once again, she took a piece of paper and a pencil from out of the clutter and sat down with her back to the door in case she had to cover up what she was doing. Closing her eyes, she pictured the clinic area, the stairwell, the workroom with its tables and those two desks, 
and the bin of kilos in the corner. When she reopened her lids, she started to sketch out the plans of everything she could recall about the facility. The effort was not only intel she intended to give her superiors. It felt like a test of her cognitive abilities. If she lost those in this situation, she was a dead woman. Chapter 40 A mere thirty miles away from where Rio was playing amateur architect, V reformed on a country road out in the middle of nowhere. As he waited for Rage to hop along his Cassidy, he took out a hand rolled, lit up with his bick, which he'd gotten from the pit, thank you very much, and looked at the mountains in the distance. The valley between the two ranges was a straight shot of flat and narrow, and he imagined, if he were a nature-loving type, that he'd find a lot of peace and comfort in the landscape. As it was, he was a tetchy, techy son of a bitch, with stunted emotional growth, a god complex, and questionable taste in cartoons. Hey, he liked Tom and Jerry. Not that he brought that up around Lassiter. So no, he wasn't all that impressed by the Mother Earth stuff. Rage materialized beside him. Okay, let's go. And I'll do the talking since you've pulled on your grumpy pants about all this. Not my fault the bunch of you have your heads wedged. Isn't that your favorite thing? They started walking toward a farmhouse that was so picture-perfect, V choked on the quaint. From its porch to the obligatory tree in the side yard, its chimney and the happy-face arrangement of its windows, he would be afraid if he lived in such a place that he'd start crapping sunbeams and care bears. He was also aware of wanting Butch to be with them, too. But as a half-breed, the former cop couldn't ghost out and travel in a scatter of molecules. That was the thing with mixed blood. You got some of the characteristics of both sides. But it was a buffet you didn't get to choose from. What your personal rules were got randomly assigned by the fruit salad of your genetic makeup. So it was ground travel only for Butch, and it would take well over an hour for the brother. A vibration went through V's body, his marrow going tuning fork on him, and as Rage stopped short and looked down at himself, it was clear the brother picked up on it too. Is that... Rage let the words drift as he glanced back up toward the house. I mean, at that moment, the front door of the farmhouse burst open, and a female in a long dress and a bulky sweater rushed out. She had both palms forward, and she was halfway into an epic, no, 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 stream, kneading. You can't be here. Kneading, V thought. Oh, shit. The jackal's shellin, Nix, had gone into her. Do you want my mate to help? He called out. Jane can come here with the drugs to ease her. Posey, Nix's sister, flushed and shook her head. That's not, that's not how it's going to be handled. This was a little bit of a surprise, but female cycles, they can be unpredictable, especially during stressful times. She doubled back and shut the door. Then she came down off the porch to them. I'm leaving as well, for, you know, their privacy. Are they safe? Rage asked. For the day? They're in the cellar bedroom. I made sure there was food, and Pete already left when the first signs of the fertile time started showing. I only stayed to get the house in order and make sure they'd have what they need. What a mess, V thought. Vampire females were only fertile about once a decade, and good fucking thing. The hormones released were incredibly powerful and painful, and his mammon, creator of the species, had set it up such that only constant mating with a male could make the agony bearable. Still, the sex act soothed the cravings only for a short time, so the orgasms had to be constant for hours and hours. It was either that or drugs. All things considering, the cycle was a brutal system, but considering how high the mortality rate was for females on the birthing bed, it would take something that overwhelming to make them want to run the risks of getting pregnant. He was really glad his Jane was infertile in her hybrid state, not because he wouldn't have helped during her time, but because the pregnancy stats terrified him. Where are you going? Rage asked Posey. To our grandfather's new place. That's where Pete is. 
I'll come back right before dawn and double-check there, okay? But Jack has a phone and things to protect them with. Things equal weapons, given the female's squeamishness. Let us know if you or they need anything. Rage nodded to the house. The jackal's a good male, and I wish my half-brother all the best. V kept his mouth shut because he thought the pair of them were nuts. If the pregnancy took, the jackal got to enjoy eighteen months of worrying whether the love of his life, the female he'd bonded with, was going to bleed out trying to bring his fragile progeny into the cold, hard world. You know how to reach us, Vicious muttered, because he didn't want the depths of his douchebagness to be apparent. Fine, that apparent. Thank you, the female said. Relieved to get the hell out of there, V dematerialized off the lawn and traveled north and a little east, knowing rage would be right behind him. The kneading was not a place for any males to hang around, because they couldn't help but be affected and nobody had time for that drama. The good news? The whole issue of the jackal tangling up with finding the prison camp was now a moot point, at least for the foreseeable future. If the couple was doing this the old-fashioned way, the male was going to need a water park's worth of hydration after it was over, and then he'd have to wait to see if things took. He wasn't going to want to leave his female. Just as well. One less cook in the kitchen. The audience house was located in Caldwell proper, in a zip code where people had gates across their driveways, access codes to every nook and cranny, and the inflated sense of self-importance that came when you could get whatever you wanted whenever you wanted it. As he reformed around back by the garage, the federal sprawl was a butte, even from the rear. Darius, the brother who had built the Brotherhood Mansion on the mountain, had constructed this abode as well, and it had been his primary residence, up until he'd been taken out by a car bomb. After sitting vacant for a little while, the place was now used as a neutral ground for wrath to meet his civilians to adjudicate disputes, bless matings and young, and generally keep his finger on the pulse of the species. Opening the back door, V walked into a full swing kitchen. Uniformed Doggin were working to prepare a steady stream of fresh baked goods for the waiting room and the initial wave of appointments. In a couple of hours, the menu would switch to tea sandwiches and cookies. Lifting his hand to the staff, he turned them down for coffee, tea, soda, water, muffins, Danish, and homemade cake donuts, all in the space of twelve feet. Rage, on the other hand, was going to get trapped in the calorie net and come out the far side with a silver tray full of nosh. At least the chefs would know their wares were appreciated. Out in the hallway, V kept going and got a clear shot down to the front entrance. The double doors into the dining room were closed, which meant Wrath was in session, and he was not going to interrupt because the news flash he was here to deliver, hopefully without too much noticeable self-satisfaction, was not an emergency. Hey, Rumi. V backtracked and leaned into the newly redecorated little sitting room. Butch was parked on the sofa, facing the TV, the soft murmur of the newscaster oddly soothing, even though it was just a human talking about human shit. Then again, maybe that was why it was soothing. Didn't affect him. Check this out. Butch palmed the remote and turned up the volume. Isn't that your target from downtown? Coming over and sitting next to the cop, V looked for an ashtray to put his sig out. Oh, Fritz, you are a gentle male and a sailor he thought, as he found one right by his elbow. And then he wasn't thinking about butlers who anticipated every need before you even knew you'd had them. To the left of the newscaster's head, there was a black-and-white photograph of a woman who, yep, looked exactly like the one V had been trailing in the alleys in search of more of that Iron Cross-stamped poison. From the short, dark hair to the intense eyes that seemed haunted, she was... Turn it up a little louder, he said, even though he could hear shit just fine. To the CPD undercover officer who had been shot, execution style, and thrown into the Hudson River, there are rumors that another undercover officer has gone missing. Sources tell us that... Butch glanced over. I mean, that's her, right? Yeah, 
for real. Well, this was, surprise, actually a news flash that he cared about. God damn it, we're going to have to start all over again if someone killed her for being a cop. The leaks in the department to the press were always for shit. Don't these reporters have any common decency? Butcher's Boston accent thickened with all his pissed off. If that woman's in the hands of any of the dealers she was going after, they're going to see this and kill her. Assuming she's not frickin' dead anyway. The newscaster continued to drone on. One of our reporters caught up with CPD Chief Stanley Carmichael while he attended a gala event at the home of... Pause it, would you? V asked. I want her picture. As Butch hit the remote, V took out his Samsung and snapped a close-up of the screen. The image of the missing officer was shitty, all pixelated, but he could sharpen it up later. Besides, he never forgot a face. He never forgot anything. Okay, got it. Thanks. Butch hit the button again, and V zoned out as things cut to a female reporter in a red suit, shoving a microphone into an older guy's face. As a stream of tuxedos and gowns parted around the confrontation, the police chief lifted his palms and shook his head, all no comment. And then there was a close-up of the reporter as she summed it up for viewers who had just seen exactly what had happened. Back to the studio, and now there was another cut to a news brief where homicide detective Jose de la Cruz, according to the scrawl at the bottom, was standing in a microphoned lectern making a statement about the male officer who had been found in the Hudson River. A reporter cut through the scrum of questions as he concluded his remarks. What about the female officer who was missing? Jose looked at the woman. I'm not prepared to comment on... So you're not denying there is another missing officer? No, the guy said firmly. I'm not commenting on rumors. Any other questions? As the news desk reappeared on screen... The anchor stoked the flames of conspiracy theories, and Butch muted it all with a look of disgust. While V lit up another hand rolled, his roommate eased back and got pensive. Then he looked over and... No, V muttered. The answer is no. How do you know what I'm gonna ask? Vicious exhaled a stream of smoke. Because I'm your fucking roommate. That's how. Chapter 41 Lucan woke up in the executioner's bed. As his eyes struggled to focus, he nonetheless located Rio immediately. She was sitting about ten feet away, her back to him as she bent over the table and scribbled on something. Before he could say her name, she seemed to sense his stare. Straightening, she looked over her shoulder. Hi, Getting up from a meal that had been brought in by someone, her brows were drawn and her hands fidgety as she came across to him. For a moment, he took her in as if it had been weeks since he'd seen her, noting her pale face, her determined jawline, her strong body in the wrinkled clothes she'd had on for how long now? She was beautiful to him, in a way that had nothing to do with her physical appearance. Clearing her throat, she said, How are you? hungry. Oh, I got this. She seemed excited, like helping his recovery was a test she wanted to pass. Here. She moved so fast as she reached for the tray that she spilled some coke he assumed she'd been nursing, swiping the can with the back of her hand. With a curse, she mopped things up with a shirt that was draped on the back of a chair. And then she got the tray and brought it over, setting it on the floor by the bed. Kneeling down, she took a can of Sprite and popped the top. How did you know? Damn, his voice was rough. That I'm not a Coke fan. I had a 50-50 chance of getting it right. It's all we got. He struggled to sit up. And when he did, she gave him the soda and started plumping the flat pillows he'd been resting on, although she didn't get very far with the poofing, and not because the bedding was for shit. Are you... Lucan finished the sentence for her. I'm okay now. Her eyes ducked like she didn't want him to know she'd been worried about him. I guess the gas or whatever it was backfired on you. Gas? What are you talking? Oh, right. Jesus, he forgot that she didn't know his true nature. Yeah, flames. 
Fuck. What a mess this all was. That was so scary, she murmured. I thought, well, it doesn't matter. It worked out. Time to change the subject. Where are Apex and Mayhem? Just outside the door. Thank God, he thought, as he took the sprite to his lips, with surprisingly sturdy, steady hands, as it turned out. Guess he hadn't lied to her about being better. And when the test sip went down just fine, he gulped the whole thing on a oneer. Is there another? He asked with an ah. Absolutely. She went back to the table. Here, I'll open it for you. There was a shh, and then he was on to number two. More than food, the sugar and the liquid were exactly what he needed, and his eyes finally came back online fully when he was halfway done with the second. You look tired, he said, then caught himself. Good, I mean, you look good. Her smile was wry as she sat down next to the tray on the bald floor. Pushing at her hair, which was standing up at odd angles, she looked, well, he could only describe it as adorable, even though that was not a word he associated with her strength, her directness, her sexiness. Shaking her head, she murmured, I can only guess what I'm like right now. You're perfect. As she glanced at him sharply, he took another drink. We're more than even after what you did, Rio. You saved me out there. Nah, Mayhem was the one with the code. He opened the door. You picked me up off the ground and carried me inside. I don't know how you did it. It was more like a drag, and I was motivated. What can I say? Thank you. As emotion came over him, he looked away from her. Hey, there's a shower, and I don't mind if I do. Putting down what was left of the sprite, he got to his feet and gave his body a chance to collapse. When his balance held, he zeroed in on the tiled corner of the room. There was a partition to stand behind, and after he started the water, he stripped his sweatshirt off, carefully. His skin was still red across his chest, and especially on that one hand. Good thing it wasn't his dagger. Rio stepped into view, down at the other end of the room. She was by the gun rack her head lowered, her hand hesitating by the rifles that were lined up, soldiers ready for their shooting orders. You can look at me, he said in a deep voice. I don't mind it. Not in the slightest. Her head came up and around, then she ducked her eyes again. I'm just worried that you'll slip and fall. There's an easy solution. Join me. What the fuck was he saying here? As the silence stretched out, he felt like his body had reinflated with strength, and it was not coming from the calories in that soda. Amazing how the mating instinct could kick the crap out of all kinds of minor aches and pains. And with mayhem and apex right outside, and things still momentarily quiet, when she didn't reply, he smiled sadly. I'll be okay in here. You can just take a load off and relax a little. I won't be long. I wish we were different she said with a defeat he did not associate with her. We are, he thought, more than you'll ever know, so you're making the right decision here. And yet that didn't stop him from wanting her. Just so you know, he said, I wouldn't change a thing about you. Even in this god-awful light, with everything we've been through, you're still the most beautiful female I've ever seen. Her brows went up high, as if she thought he was insane, and then her fingertips traced her own face. I feel so old, she whispered. That's life, not how many calendar years you've lived. When she put her palms to her cheeks and tears glossed her eyes, he stepped away from the falling water and went to her. I'm not very good when things are okay, she croaked out. I'm better when they're bad. Well, they were still in the prison camp, and not on vacation. But why fly the reminder? Lucan reached out and brushed her hair. Unfortunately, I can promise you that this quiet is not going to last. This moment is not going to last long at all. As he stared at her, he wanted to hold her. He wanted to kiss her. He wanted to touch her body, so he knew he really was back from the dead, and so was she. 
we're like cockroaches, she said as she dropped her hands. You and me, we just keep going. Following her lead, he lowered his arm as well. I'm not sure that's a compliment, but considering you included yourself in it and you have a healthy ego, I'm thinking there has to be a positive spin on the cockroach thing. We can't be killed. He remembered the sunlight on his skin and did not agree with that. But again, he wasn't going to inject reality into her insect optimism. When she refocused on him, her eyes were full of shadows. Lucan waited for, oh, maybe a split second. Then he went back into the shower stall and canned the water routine. As he returned to her, she laughed awkwardly. How is it that you always smell so good? I've bonded with you, he thought. Give me your hand, he commanded. The fact that she didn't fight him made him realize how exhausted she was. And as the contact was locked in by their grips, he drew her over to the bed. I'm not tired, she said as she sat down. I feel like I'm never going to sleep again. Lucan parked it next to her. Tell me the story. Her eyes flared. What story? He had to touch her hair again. He couldn't help it. The story of your pain. As Rio sat next to Luke on the bed, it seemed absolute bonkers, freaking insane that she was having trouble holding it together. Considering everything that had gone down in the last, how long it had been? Five years? Twenty-five? A century? And now, after getting hit by a car, kidnapped, assaulted, and taken in by the drug dealers she was trying to bust, now she was losing it? But something had happened when Luke had woken up and really looked at her properly, and then held his own can of soda, and then asked for another. The humanity of his suffering and recovery had made her forget all about the cop-criminal thing. They were just two people in a shitstorm, trying to survive, and she was so glad he had not. I thought you were going to die, she blurted. When she slapped her palm over her mouth, it was a relief when he laughed. So did I. Nodding, she relowered her arm and looked at his rather extraordinary naked chest and his shoulders and his... Okay, those abs were sculptured. Let me in, Rio, he whispered. Then he shrugged. And listen, if you're worried about your privacy, where is it going to go, right? I'm just a fucking drug dealer, trapped in this life, going nowhere fast. I have no one, no family, no friends, so I don't talk to anybody about anything. I don't count. I'm a black hole that doesn't matter. Don't say that. She wiped eyes that were going blurry again. How could you say that? It's the truth, and there's nothing wrong with admitting the truth. It'll set you free even when you're in hell. He held up a forefinger. Trust me on this. What is your truth? She asked. I just told you it. Rio shook her head. You're not a black hole, and I can prove it. He chuckled a little. If it's a long math equation, you're going to lose me. Numbers are not my bag. Me too. I suck at math. In the silence that followed, she studied him closely and knew she was trying to memorize what he looked like. She wanted to keep all the details of him with her for however long she was alive, from the way his blonde and brown hair curled over his forehead to how his lips were parted right now, and the fact that with his eyes at half-mast, their color seemed more intense. There were so many reasons to remember that she was a cop and he was part of a criminal enterprise and never the twain shall meet, much less make love, or worse, catch feelings. Still, she extended her hand across the space that separated them, and her fingers trembled ever so slightly as they made contact with the place right over his heart. His skin was warm, but not like it had been when she'd touched him to rouse him as she'd been checking to make sure he was still alive. He'd been running a fever, but now that was gone. I can feel you, she whispered. Therefore, you exist. 
and you are not nothing. Luke looked down at her palm on his sternum, as if he couldn't understand why it was there, or maybe couldn't believe it. And in the pause that followed, she supposed that there were a lot of things he could do right now. He could kiss her. He could pull away. He could make a joke to try to lower the sudden intensity that was gripping her and seemed to be gripping him. Instead, he closed his eyes and put his hand over hers. What are you thinking about? She said, with your eyes so closed. That it's been a long, long time since I didn't hurt in the center of my chest. Chapter 42 When Lucan eventually reopened his eyes, he found that Rio's whole body was curved in toward him and her face was lifted to his. With their hands linked over his heart and the soft silence between them, he took a deep breath and wondered how he could explain how significant this moment was. Then again, he wasn't sure he wanted her to know the importance of it all. But as a wolven who had been abandoned by his clan, he had been an orphan in the world for a very long time. With her now, he felt claimed as family. I wish, she whispered. What? What do you want? Rio eased back a little and unfortunately took her palm with her. As her eyes shifted away from him, he knew she was somewhere else in her mind, and he missed the contact of her flesh against his. I hate the idea of you hurting. She shook her head. I hate anyone in pain, actually. I'm a wuss. You've got a good heart. Like that's a bad thing? It's a little more complicated than that. I don't think so. Who left you? She blurted. Who was the person who made you feel like you were so unworthy? What did he say? What could he say? It was a whole group of people. My family, actually. Her head tilted to one side. What did they do to you? They put me in here. When she looked confused, he wanted to kick his own ass for forgetting all she didn't know, couldn't know. I mean, I'm in this line of work because of them. It's a long fucking story. Just know, I wouldn't choose to be doing what I am if there were any other way for me. I would not be in this life except for everything that went down years ago. As she opened her mouth, he put his palm up. And there's no disrespect intended toward you. I don't judge you or anybody else for the way they make their living. I am in no position to be critical. Her smile was tight. Funny, you wouldn't choose this life, and I wouldn't either in so many ways. Tell me. It wouldn't make any sense. Rio fell back on the bed and locked her eyes on the ceiling. Then her words came out in a rush. My brother, Luis, died of an overdose at the age of 16. I was the one who found him. I was two years older. Lucan shook his head. I am so sorry, Rio. That's terrible. But the destruction didn't stop there. My mother started drinking after he passed. Hard. She collapsed from liver failure two years ago, got on dialysis, and died six months later. Not that we were close or anything. On my father's end, he left town pretty soon after my brother's funeral. Just took off. I have no idea where he is. And after all these years, it's going to stay that way, even if I find him. You know what I mean? Wait, he just deserted his mate. Wife, I mean. And you? There was debt he couldn't cover, he said. Money that was owed to people who were dangerous. Either he left, or they were going to come and hurt me and Mom. She glanced over with a hard expression. But no one ever came looking for him, so maybe it was just a lie. Something he told my mother to make himself feel better. I don't know. After a moment, she covered her face with her hands, and he touched her knee. So you have no bloodline either. It's true, I'm alone, but it's okay. You're not alone anymore. Lowering her arms, she stared across at him. You don't want me, Luke. You really don't. He had to laugh at that. The hell I don't. Rio blushed in a way that made him fall for her even harder. I don't mean like that. I'm not your brother, Rio. 
You don't have to take care of me, and you do not have to save me. This isn't about him. I think it is. I think you're trying to save all kinds of people in all kinds of ways, because you couldn't do it for him. He shook his head again. I just don't know why you didn't get out of this life altogether. I don't get the logic. If drugs killed your brother, why are you doing this? Her eyes went back to the ceiling. Like I said, it's complicated. All Lucan could do was nod. He sensed that there were things she was holding back, but considering the encyclopedia's worth of shit he was keeping to himself, he wasn't going to fault her for not filling him in on everything. I don't want to talk anymore, she said as she sat back up. I'm not judging you, Rio. Just know that. All the details don't matter to me, and neither do your choices. They're your own to make peace with, and God knows that life can put us in situations where there are nothing but rocks and hard places. She frowned and seemed to inspect her fingernails, as if she had a manicure, even though she didn't. You said that your family is making you do this, she murmured. Are you involved in the mob? I mean, given this operation's size, I'm figuring it can't be an isolated thing, you know? So many people, so many moving parts. Call it whatever you will, he hedged. If it was a truth that made sense to her as a human, she might as well believe it. God, he hated all the lies he had going on. But if she ever found out that he wasn't one of her kind, yeah, no. He wasn't interested in seeing the horror in those eyes of hers. Who is it? She prompted. Who's your family? As Rio tossed the question out there, she knew Luke wasn't going to answer it. If he were a made man, and considering how comfortable he was around the dead bodies that had been in this room, and the shooting down in Caldwell, and all the other crap, she had to believe he was. He would never tell her. She also knew she was in danger of blowing her cover. If she were actually involved in the drug trade at the level she supposedly was, she would never make that kind of inquiry. That was something a cop would do. Surprise. I'm sorry, she said quickly. That's totally inappropriate. I'm not thinking straight. It doesn't matter who I'm affiliated with. That's right. All I care about is... Between one blink and the next, she was back on the floor of that filthy apartment, trussed like a deer, about to be really seriously hurt. And then that dog had come, and then Luke had magically appeared. Sure as if I summoned you. I'm sorry? He asked. Back at that trap house. She didn't bother to hide the fact that revisiting those memories made her shudder. It was like I called your name and you came running. It was a lucky break for the both of us. All because you were there to see Mickey. As she made some kind of affirming noise in the back of her throat, she hated the fact that she was lying to him, that only she knew they were on opposite sides of things, and not in a way he would ever suspect. They weren't supplier and dealer, staring across the proverbial negotiating table. They were cop and criminal, and the end result was going to be him behind bars, along with everyone else in here who was in charge. He was certainly facing decades for the dealing itself, as well as the money laundering that was inevitably going to be part of an enterprise this size, and then there was the human trafficking that she knew in her gut was going on. Unless she'd thought all those cubicles, all those workstations, had been for something other than unpaid, coerced labor. What are you thinking about now? he asked. Nothing good. Nothing, really. As she looked over, she stared into his eyes, his incredibly beautiful yellow eyes. Can I ask you something? She said. Anything. You really wouldn't have chosen this life? It was a moment before he answered, and his expression became so grave, and his voice so deep, that she felt as though he were sharing some part of himself that he did not expect to get back. I hate it here. His voice became hoarse. I hate everything about this place. It's cruel. It's inhumane. This is not an existence anybody would ever want. The things I've seen, the things I've done. I was half dead when I was put in here, and I didn't know how much further I'd sunk 
until I saw you standing under that fire escape. I'm nothing special. You are so wrong about that. He laughed a little, and she had the sense he was trying to lighten the mood. For one thing, I've watched you get hit by a car and walk away from it. That skills right there. And now I know you're good with a gun, but we don't have to dwell on that. Her eyes shifted away to the bloodstain on the floor. His finger, stroking lightly on her chin, brought her face back to his. He more than deserved it. And not just for what he'd been about to do to you. He was a piece of evil on the earth, a sick, perverted murderer. Try not to think about it. Why did you save my life so many times? I didn't have anything better to do. He winked at her. All three times. Rio had to laugh. Stop it. I'm serious. Okay, fine. I needed the exercise. How's that? Covering her smile with her hand, she batted at his shoulder. That is not funny. I thought I could maybe fall in love with you. And I didn't want a car or a bullet or any fucking thing in the world to get in the way of that. So there. Rio blinked, her heart stopping. You don't mean that. No more joking now. He became dead serious. They're my words. I picked them because I know what they mean. You don't know me, and you don't know me. Shooting him a stare, she pointed out, Well, I didn't just tell you I'd fallen in love with you. I said I might be able to. Stop, she told herself. Stop this right now. Well, have you? She breathed, but then she put her hand up. Don't answer that. Why did you ask the question, then? Rio looked away, looked back, and then couldn't stop herself from falling into a fantasy. You could leave this life, you know. You don't have to be here. I mean, you could, you could just go out that back door and never return. People disappear all the time. My father did it. You could do the same. It's not that simple, he said in a hollow voice. Shit. Was she actively encouraging him to become a fugitive from the law? She gathered his hands in her own. Listen, you could escape all this, and just, I don't know, you could even go to the police. You could tell them all you know in exchange for immunity and a witness protection program. Why are you trying to get me out when you need me to make a deal with you? Rio blinked and realized she might have just given herself away. Because I'd rather do business with someone I can be objective around, and that's next to impossible with you. His smile was slow, sexy. Are you saying you feel the same way I do? No. Yes. Rio took a deep breath. I don't know. I think you do. When Luke leaned into her, his cologne, that damned cologne that he maintained was not cologne, got into her nose and went right to her blood. And I think you want exactly what I do right now. Chapter 43 Rio's face was so close to his that all Lucan would have to do to kiss her was tilt in a little farther. And he knew if they got started with that shit, it wasn't going to stop there. Her scent had changed, the arousal she was feeling rising to match his own. And fucking hell, he wanted her. Are we going to do this? She whispered. Yeah, we are. There was no hesitation on her side when he closed the distance between their mouths, and as he pressed his lips to hers, he had to hold back, or her clothes were going to be ripped beyond repair. As it was, he was already easing her back on the bed, moving over her, pinning her with his weight. God damn, she was gripping his bare back with her hands, digging her fingers into his skin, and he wished she had longer nails so she could scratch him properly, draw blood, make him moan from the combination of pleasure and pain. And there were other good things happening for him. As she shifted, so she was under him properly, his arousal made its own way between her thighs. Screw the nails. He wanted her hot softness more. As he penetrated her mouth with his tongue, 
He rolled to the side and swept his hand along her waist, up to her ribs, around the side of her breast. With a restless surge, she twisted her torso and put herself right in his palm. Through her shirt and her bra, he rubbed her nipple with his thumb. And as she moaned in response, she became like water beneath him, fluid and graceful. She was also demanding, though, and very, very hungry. I want to be naked, she said urgently. Well, didn't that make two of them? He wanted to get her naked, too. Lucan eased back. Give me one second. He kissed her again, kissed her a third time. Ben knew that if he was going to pull out of this, of her, for anything longer than taking his own pants off, he'd better do it now. I'll be right back. Don't be gone long, she whispered. I won't be. Trust me on that. With a leap that was worthy of a flying tackle, he launched himself at the door out into the hall. As he entered the code, he punched in the number sequence like he was jabbing the eyes of an enemy. Yanking the way open, Mayhem stepped into his face. What's wrong? Has she... I need some privacy. For a guy who tended to be pretty relaxed, even in a dogfight, Mayhem stayed stressed. For what? Really? The other guy blinked like he didn't understand. Oh, yeah, oh. Lucan looked down the hall. Anything brewing? Apex went down to check on Kane because mess is opening up downstairs. The coast is going to stay clear for a little longer, like thirty minutes or so. The guards are about to change, though. You may want to hold off on your privacy shit. Fucking hell. Just knock if you need to come in, and wait for a second. Lucan. What? Mayhem glanced away. How much do you know about her? Excuse me? As the other prisoner just continued to stare off into space, Lucan went palms up, are you stupid? I know she volunteered to help Kane. I know she dragged me back indoors when I was dying in the sunshine. What the hell else do I have to know about her? As the bonded male in him started to prowl around inside his skin, he had to cut that possessive crap quick. His wolf was a hair trigger when it came to defending territory to begin with. Throw in his sexual attraction for Rio? He might as well have been a bomb waiting to go off. Watch yourself with her, Mayhem muttered. That's all I'm saying. And I'll give you a piece of advice. Don't talk about my female to anybody, and that includes me. You're not going to like where it lands you. Mayhem shook his head and stared down the empty hallway with its closed doors and its dim lighting. Fine, you got it, was all he said. Good decision, Lucan thought, as he went back into the quarters. Good fucking decision. As Luke stepped out into the hall, Rio covered her face with her palms, even though she was alone. Was she really going to do this? Really? Dropping her arms, she rolled over onto her stomach and wondered what Luke was saying to either Mayhem or Apex. He was propping the door open with his foot, but his voice was low, so she couldn't tell the words. Beyond the conversation, though, in terms of the rest of the place getting busy, she heard nothing in particular. Which she took to mean that any uprising was either contained or yet to come. Abruptly, Luke pivoted back around, took a step forward, and shut the door. As his eyes met hers, she felt like there was a mask over his facial features, but his eyes... Oh, yes, his eyes. There was no masking what was in them. And as he stayed put, it was clear he was asking her a question. So she figured she better give him an answer. With a slow, sensual pivot on the bed, Rio eased onto her back and let her head fall off the edge of the mattress. Knowing that he was watching, she moved one of her hands to the side of her throat and slowly let it drift downward onto her collarbone lower to between her breasts, even farther so that it was on her stomach. She stopped just as he came to rest on the center of her pelvis. I want you. Now. Jesus Christ, female, he growled. As Luke stalked over to her, he stared out from under lowered lids, his gait like that of a predator, his arousal straining against the front of his pants, and with all those muscles fanning out to fill his shoulders, his pecs, his abs, 
he was too spectacular to deny. Not that no was in her vocabulary when it came to him. He stopped in front of her, and what do you know? Her upside-down view was just as spectacular as the face-on ones she'd been enjoying. His torso was magnificent from this angle. Except then he cursed. We can't do this right now, he said gruffly. No? Rio arched, and yup, his eyes went exactly where she wanted them to go, her breasts. What's going on out there? There are people coming, and not a lot of time. Really? She brought up her knees and rubbed her thighs together, back and forth, back and forth. Then we'll just have to be quick about it. The guards are changing soon. But not now. What the hell was she saying? Was she really? Not right now, correct? Luke started to breathe heavily, his abs rippling as his chest pumped up and down. Behind his fly, his erection jerked. Rio arched her spine again and reached her arms out. Linking her hands around the backs of his thighs, she put a little pressure into the hard cords of his hamstrings. If he didn't come forward, she would let it be. She wasn't going to beg for sex from anybody, not even him. But if he did, Luke closed the distance so that the crown of her head rested on the front of his legs. As he stared down at her, his jaw started to grind. Opening her mouth, she ran her tongue over her lips. Then she bit the lower one. Fuck, he breathed. Extending her tongue again, she flicked it back and forth. Then she opened her mouth wide. Luke's eyes squeezed shut and his head fell back, but his hands came forward. They were such great hands, strong, blunt-tipped, the veins that ran down the backs of them standing out in stark relief. He undid the button of his fly. Are you sure this is what you want? I'm not going to beg you. She did some handwork of her own, moving over the front of her shirt. The timing is bad anyway, right? Really fucking bad. And yet he drew the zipper down. The worst. Couldn't be worse. She drew a circle around her breast, imagining that it was his touch, his fingers. Ever. Ever. The erection that broke out of his fly was thick and long and, oh God, big. And as he wrapped his beautiful hand around it, she bit her lower lip again. Rio. As he hesitated, she shook her head and continued to caress her breast on top of her shirt. I'm not even going to say please, so don't hold your breath for that. Give me what I want or not. I'll be fine either way. You, on the other, may be uncomfortable for the rest of the night. With her other hand, she went between her legs, spreading them a little, touching herself through her pants, through her underwear, through the insanity that had so clearly taken over her judgment. In this moment, though, all she knew was that she was tired of waging a war against an intangible, disinterested enemy of shoulds and woulds and coulds. She hadn't been just a woman in a very, very long time, and staring up at Luke right now, it was impossible to do anything but feel. And yeah, sure, fine, maybe the concussions had wiped out the risk assessment portion of her brain, but she really didn't care. I don't get even a please, Luke murmured. No, that's your job, to do the begging. Me? When she nodded, he stroked his shaft with that palm of his, up and down. As in, Rio, will you please? Please what? Another stroke, all the way to the big head. What comes next? I can't remember. Sorry, you'll have to figure it out on your own. She brought her fingers to her mouth, pushing them past her lips. Then she let her eyes roll back in her head as she drew them in deep and retracted them. Drew them in deep and brought them back out again. Oh, fuck, Rio. Please suck my cock, he blurted. Chapter 44 That mouth, those lips... Those two fingers going in and out of that mouth and those lips, in and out, in and out. And then came the tongue. As Rio licked around the glistening digits, her talented little pink, Lucan fell off the cliff and 
threw out some combination of syllables. He wasn't sure what he'd said exactly, but please had been in there front and center, just like she'd wanted it to be. And hell, at the rate she was going, he would have said anything she wanted him to. State capitals, names of countries, a goddamn grocery list. Well, she murmured, since you asked so nicely. Her arms extended out again, and he felt her hands slip around the backs of his thighs once more. Gimme, she whispered, let me taste you. With a feeling of unreality, Lucan widened his stance and lowered his thumping erection right into her. Her tongue came first. She licked at his tip, flicked at it, and teased some more until his legs shook. And then, just as he was about to lose it, just as his whole arm was trembling, when the release was going to happen, Rio opened wide and took him down. The shock of exactly what he had expected and had wanted made him go momentarily numb, and that was the only reason he didn't come right away. And then there was the incomprehensible sight of his girth stretching her lips wide, the white slice of her lower teeth flashing the column of her throat so very exposed, so tempting to his fangs. As they tingled and dropped down, a cold blast of warning went through him. No, he couldn't go there. He couldn't let that fantasy of biting her, of sucking something of hers down deep, get too far. He was already on the verge of losing control, and he would not, could never, hurt her in any way, or endanger her life by bleeding her out. Mmm, she said as she swallowed him down again. I gotta touch you, he growled, or something like that. What the fuck was coming out of his mouth? Bending over her, he went for her pants, attacking the fly with sloppy, sloppy hands. Meanwhile, where she was working him, she took over where his grip had been, tight, tight palms wrapping around him and starting to pump as she sucked him off. Yanking down what covered her lower body, she helped him in the effort, kicking off her boots, towing down the fabric. Okay, fine. He broke his no-bite rule in spirit when he leaned all the way over and ripped one of his fangs through the hip string of her panties. And to keep it even, cause fair was fair, he tore the other string that went over her opposite hip with his hands. Lucan went right in with his mouth, parting her thighs wide. He led with his lips, stroking her sex as she sucked his, the pleasure going nuclear. As she cried out, he only knew it because her hot breath and cold inhale was what threw him over the edge. Or no, maybe it was the taste of her, the slick feel of her, the way she cranked over onto her side while she writhed in ecstasy and he had to force her back into position. Or it could have been the rolling of her hips against his face as she herself came at the same time he did. It was the most perfect sex of his life, and he hadn't even had her yet. God, why didn't they have more time? Did that count as a quickie? Rio wondered as she turned to the spray in the shower, opened her mouth, and remembered what had been inside of it mere moments before. Closing her eyes, she felt the throbbing between her legs and relived what it had been like to feel Luke's tongue slick into her and his lips pull against her. And his, she popped her lids open and grabbed for the bar of soap. Not the time, not the place, but damn. Even though their quick, super fast, supersonic session had been, well, quick, it was clear that the man had hidden talents and that he was willing to share them with her. He also had stamina for days, which she took as a compliment. They'd hooked up for all of about ten minutes, tops, but there had been a number of orgasms on both sides. As arousal thickened her throat and forced her to take a couple of deep breaths, she pivoted around so that the spray dampened her hair. When she leveled her head and opened her eyes again, Luke was leaning against the wall and watching her with his arms crossed and a secret smile on his face. He was fully clothed, dressed in black combats and a black turtleneck that made him look like he was part of a militia. She smiled back at him. You're beautiful, you know that, he said. Rio swept both her hands over her head, sluicing water down the back of her skull. 
As she did, her wet breasts swayed, heavy and gleaming. They were aching for his attention, and she wanted him to know it. And given where his eyes were, it was a good guess her message had been received. You want to join me? She asked. Yeah, I do. Really fucking badly. Those eyes roamed her up and down, and she decided that he deserved a good look at the back of her, so she pivoted on the ball of one foot. When she glanced over her shoulder, he was rubbing his chin as if he had more than accepted all the things she was offering, and was thinking about where to start. Except then he abruptly looked away, in the direction of the door. The frown that drew his brows together meant one and only one thing. I put your clothes right here, he said, as he turned away. On the chair. Rio canned the water, the dripping loud into the silver drain. There were no towels, because, hello, this wasn't a Hilton. So as she stepped out from the little tiled section, she sloughed off her arms, her legs, her butt with her hands. Getting her bra on took some maneuvering because the strap stuck on her wet skin. When it was in place, she pulled the shirt he'd given her on, and then did the same with her pants. The underwear were completely unusable. She wadded them up and shoved them into her back pocket. The ruined T-shirt and fleece, the ones she had had on before, she left on the floor. As she came around the partition, she saw Luke over by the bed, tucking a gun into the waistband of the combats he'd put on. You can't go out there, he said gruffly. If you're found, it's going to get bad. That was when she heard the voices, outside the door, loud and insistent. Where's your gun? he demanded. Rio went over to the table and picked the weapon up. I've got it. Luke stared at her, then came across to her. She didn't even hesitate. She threw her arms around him and held on tight for a brief moment. Please be careful, she said. God, the idea she might never smell his cologne again, and the fact that she wasn't now because he'd sprayed something on himself, something that was like the incense in the clinic. She pushed back urgently. Better than that, let's leave together. We'll just go out the back and... Rio, I can't. Yes, you can. I'm serious about getting out of the life. You could be free of this. It doesn't work like that, and you know it. But I can help you. No, you can't. And besides, how would it be for you, if I'm out and you're still in? Have you thought about that? You don't need to worry about me. So you think I'm going to come work for your Mozart? Not going to happen. He drew a hand through his hair and looked over at the blood stain on the floor, which was still bright red. I don't know. Maybe I can get out in a little while. Who knows? But it won't be to Caldwell. Your world is not mine. It could be? No, it couldn't. And you know that. His broad, warm hand stroked her shoulder gently, then he lifted something up. By the way, this dropped out of your pocket when I was getting your clothes. Dangling off his forefinger was the key fob to the Chrysler. With a locked jaw, he put the thing in her hand and closed her grip around it. Then he nodded. I want you to leave now. Go through that back door and drive away. A gunshot rang out in the hall and she jumped. Goodbye, Rio. Riding a swell of emotion, she lifted her face for his kiss, but it didn't come. He brushed her cheek. Take care of yourself, and don't look in the rear view. It's the way of survivors, remember? I don't want to just survive. Without you, she added to herself. Sometimes it's the best deal a person gets. As he turned away, she raised her voice. You said you loved me. Well, not exactly, but in her desperation, she was willing to play any card she had. Luke paused. Then he glanced over his shoulder. You can still love someone, even if you're not with them. And no matter how painful it is, I'm not in any hurry to get over you, Rio. His smile was heartbreaking, full of pain, and yet no regrets. Rio teared up as he walked away. He didn't look back when he got to the door. He just punched in the code and stepped out into chaos. Chapter 45
Lucan made sure the door to the private quarters closed behind him, and then he assessed the seven guards who had lined up in front of Apex and Mayhem. Okay, who shot who? he said to the group as he palmed his gun. I'm not seeing anybody on the floor. Misfire, Apex drawled. The one on the end was cleaning his gun. He didn't mean to try to put a bullet in me. Lucan looked down the line to the guard in question and bared his fangs. You will gotta be careful. Accidents can be deadly. The guard took a step forward. You want to explain that? It was pretty obvious what the that was. The executioner was where he'd been left, no change there. And it was clear the decomposition process was starting, the blood pooling in the feet and ankles, which were now purple, the face utterly white, the blood no longer flowing out of the piercings of the pegs, but congealing beneath him on the floor. Explain what? Lucan murmured amicably, because sometimes it was good to make people say things out loud. That, the male pointed, right there. Lucan glanced over. Why, that's a door. You use it to go in and out of when you... You're in deep shit, Lucan. I wouldn't get cocky. Down at the end of the hall, the stairwell door opened, and prisoners started to file through. The lineup of lowered heads and wrinkled, dirty clothing and desolated shuffling was a reminder of where they all were. No freedom, just servitude. The fact that none of the workers looked up at the congregation in front of the executioner's dead body was a commentary on how tired and ill they were. Lucan thought of what Rio had said about getting out. He retrained his stare on the guard. Well, if I were you, he walked right up to the guy. I'd remember who did that, and enjoyed it while it happened. You know what my kind is like. We relish the kill, and it doesn't matter the context. Sometimes it's to defend our territory. Sometimes it's to settle a score, and sometimes it's for fun. Wolf! The female voice cut through everything including the footfalls of all the prisoners filing into the workrooms. Great, Lucan muttered. Another party checks in. The head of the guards was tall as a male and just as well muscled, her dark hair pulled back in a severe twist, her affect one of total dominance. And yet, even with all that, her eyes were actually the most dangerous part about her. Lucan had learned the hard way that her peripheral vision was incredibly sharp. The only thing better? Her aim. Gossip had it that she'd made her money as an assassin in the human world. Lucan didn't question that backstory. Then again, he really didn't give a fuck. You rang? He said as he looked at her. I see you've done some redecorating. She walked forward, her body shifting lithely under the armored plates she wore on the front and back of her torso, as well as down her legs. Proud of yourself? He had to give her credit for all that gear under her weapons. A lot of males who were all about the engagement and the militia shit were too proud, too overconfident to protect themselves. What they saw as an admission of weakness, she saw as preservation. She was smart like that. Which was how she'd managed to quietly gather power, first under the command, then under the executioner. And now it didn't take a genius to figure out she was going to make her big move but he couldn't let her do that, although not because he wanted to play king himself. It was about time to change things around here, Lucan announced. A new set of rules, so I'm taking over. Are you? The smile on the female's face was about as warm as a winter squall. You're underpowered for a coup on the wall, just the three of you? He nodded over his shoulder at the body on the wall. We're doing okay so far. Just because you killed him, you think you're in charge? Raising his voice, he said, It's time to end this whole fucking thing. Centuries of people falsely imprisoned, working in deplorable conditions, suffering so a series of despots can pocket the money. Okay, we're done with your sermon, Wolf. Step aside now and I'll thank you for your service to me. And there will be no repercussion. Argue even one word and I have fourteen other guards in the wings and another twenty-five I can call in. You're not going to win this fight, Wolf. 
you're going to wake up dead. Isn't that an oxymoron? No, I'm originally from Boston. It only makes sense to people from the 617. But I digress. She smiled again, her eyes slicing into him, through him. You three have few weapons, little ammo, and no cover. As I said, if you have a death wish, I'll indulge it now and then hang you and your accomplices up next to the executioner. Or you can stand down, let me into the private quarters, and do your fucking job on the Caldwell streets. Lucan shook his head and prayed Rio had done what she needed to do to save herself. Not the way it's going to happen. The head of the guards looked at the door and smiled again, in that carnivore kind of way. Under different circumstances, he would have gotten along with her better. Is there someone in there? The female stepped in more closely. Someone you're protecting? Somebody that you have to hide because she's not supposed to be here? You've got it all wrong, but it's a nice thought. So you just love reeking of incense, then? The female slashed a hand through the air. It doesn't matter. What does is the fact that this isn't a game, Wolf. I'm not going to let you take over this whole operation with a human just because you're greedy. I don't give a shit about money. I know the dealer you've been negotiating with is here. I've scented her in the stairwells, and she's under that stench you've doused yourself in. I think you're looking to cut everyone out and make a fortune for yourself. And it's not that I can't respect the goal, but I'm not going to allow you to take control. You should write fiction. You've got a knack for it. I'm done talking. Let me into those quarters, or I'm going to pave the way in over a bleeding corpse. Rio stayed frozen where she was for, oh, maybe a second and a half. Then she frantically patted her pockets. The phone. Where was that phone? Had he taken it too? Glancing around the floor, she didn't see the thing anywhere. So she dove for the messy blankets of the bed, shoving the covers out of the way, splaying her hands wide, searching for that glossy little screen. Thank God, she muttered as she found it trapped at the foot of the mattress, in the one corner of the sheets that was still tucked in. Her hands were shaking so badly, she nearly dropped the cell, and she looked to the door. Tightening her hands around the key fob, she closed her eyes and told herself she had to go. Take care of yourself. She was a fucking cop, for God's sakes, and she was on the job. Everything that happened here at this site was about two things, lining up evidence to arrest and prosecute everybody in charge for illegal drug trade, and staying alive to deliver that evidence into the hands of the prosecutor. So the innocent could be cleared and returned to their families and loved ones, and the wrongdoers could go to jail for their crimes. That was it. And now was the perfect time to get out. With one last look at the door, Luke had disappeared through. She wheeled away and stumbled for the back exit. As she passed by the gun rack, she threw out a hand, grabbed one of the rifles, and slung its strap over her shoulder. Snagging a box of ammo off a shelf, she went to the numbers pad. She punched in Mayhem's pattern from memory, and the lock unlatched. In the end, she had to glance back one last time. No more gunshots out there, and the voices had dimmed down. But who the hell knew what was happening? The pull to change direction was so powerful. And don't look in the rear view. Shit. On that note, she broke out into the stairwell and rushed down the fresh pine stairs, entering the code a second time and shoving the lower panel wide. Outside, the night smelled of fresh earth and coming snow, and soot from the fire. There was no ambient light anywhere. All she could see were shapes within the darkness, a lineup of vehicles, the soaring flank of the building, the stick-tree forest like a sketch that had yet to be colored in. As she attempted to get her bearings, her thundering heart in her chest was loud in her ears, and her lungs didn't seem to be working. What the hell was that clicking sound? Oh, her tongue in her own mouth. Putting out the key fob, she pressed one of the buttons. Somewhere over to the left, there was a beep and a flash of orange, so she hit it again. Tracking the strobing, she found the SUV parked grill in between a truck and a box van with no side windows. 
When she tried the door handle, she realized she'd just managed to lock the thing really tight. She pushed the other buttons, raising the back end, and then... The alarm was loud as a scream, the flashing headlights and taillights like a bad concert come to life. Shoving the fob out in front of herself like it was a gun she could shoot the SUV with, she scrambled to... Silence. Looking around, she held her breath. When there were no sounds of people rushing up to her or shooting at her, she scrambled down to the rear hatch and shut it with the fob. As the panel lowered itself automatically, she got a quick view into the back, thanks to the glow of the interior lighting. The seats had all been put down, as if there had been cargo of some sort loaded in there, and the white powder residue told her everything she needed to know about what exactly had been transported. Rio raced around and yanked open the driver's side door. Getting behind the wheel, she locked everything up and started the engine. As the headlights exploded to life, that was when she got a proper look at the building. It was brick with cream mortar that was streaked with the grime of the ages. Rows and rows of windows stretched five stories up, and wings that seemed the size of airplane hangers flanked either side. What the hell was this place, she thought, as she put the engine in reverse. Backing out of the spot, she hit the brakes and stared through the windshield. Fumbling to find the right button, she lowered the window next to her and then she got out the phone and swiped up to bypass the code requirement. She took pictures of everything, including the back door she'd come out of and the burn marks on the pavement. Then she hit the gas and kept snapping the pictures as she followed the lane down the rear of the building. Emerging from the lee of the wing on the right, she came around the front and stopped again. Where have I seen you? She whispered as she took more pictures with the phone. I know you from somewhere. The open-air porches were the thing that jogged her memory. There were open-air porches across all the levels of the wings, the center core of the building, the only part that was solid. Go, she told herself. You'll have to go. Chapter 46 As Lucan stood in front of the private quarters, he shook his head at the leader of the guard squad. Fine, you're going to have to shoot me if you want to get in there. The female seemed surprised he wasn't following orders, even with the threat of death. But come on, like he hadn't had countless I'm-going-to-kill-you's in his life? She was going to have to do better than that if she wanted to impress him. I have nothing against keeping human pets, she said as she got nose-to-nose -nose with him. But you don't shit where you eat at least not on my watch. She is not welcome here. So you're going to let me in there to deal with her, and then you're going to go the fuck down to Caldwell and finish what you started with Mozart. Lucan glanced at Apex and Mayhem, trying to gauge their readiness to fight. Both of the males were rock-steady, prepared to use their guns. You know, he said, prepared to work his leverage. If you want to get the deal done, you need me. I'm the only one who knows who the contacts are down in Caldwell. Sure, you can recreate it all, but it'll cost you time and money. And as for her, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but you better do the math on her role, too. She's Mozart's right-hand woman. You bury her, we lose the deal, and Mozart is going to come after you with everything he's got. You'll end up defending yourself instead of making money. You honestly believe humans can get in here? They're weak and disorganized on their best night. Against my males, they don't stand a chance. You keep telling yourself that. I gave you an opportunity to be reasonable. The head of the guards nodded off to the side. But it is what it is. There was a shuffling, a moan of pain, and a scent of fresh blood. The flank of guards that had gathered parted, and before Lucan's eyes could properly focus on what was coming forward, Apex let out a curse and lunged forward, toward Cain, who was being dragged forward by two heavily armed males. Lucan caught the other prisoner's arm and yanked him back. Don't give her more than she already has, he hissed quietly. Cain's head lolled on his shoulder, fresh blood running from his raw wounds, his breathing a rattle in lungs that had been burned on their insides. 
Oh, the head of the guards murmured. Did you think it was your corpse I was going to step over? You're right. I need you, but I don't need him. You bitch, Apex spat. Let him go. He's no threat to you. The executioner and I had few secrets. The female talked over the prisoner's protests as Lucan stepped in front of Apex to hold him back. And what ones we did have were on my side only. So he told me about your little attachment, your loyalty, let's call it, to this aristocrat. I had questioned how deep this abiding regard went, but then I realized it is in your species' nature. You are a pack wolf without a clan, and the reflex to create that which is intrinsic to your DNA forges ties wherever they are found. You pick up people like trash at the side of the road, and it fills the wheel wells of your car. But you can't help it, and I am not going to resist using your defect to my benefit. Luca narrowed his eyes. Be careful there, female. You know what else they say about wolves? What? He looked at her exposed throat. We bite. Oh, that's original. She smiled coldly. I didn't see that coming. Now get the fuck out of my way. When he didn't move, she took her gun out. Shoot me, he said. I don't give a fuck. And he meant it. There was no future for him and the female he had bonded with. No real future, anyway. So what did he care? Will you stop trying to be my target? It makes you look desperate. She swung the muzzle around and pointed it at Kane's chest. He is who I'm going to shoot. Kill him, and you have no leverage over me. No, I'll just find your girlfriend. I followed her weeks before you did. Even if she leaves here, I know where she lives, what car she drives, where she goes at night. I will give her to you in pieces. Now get the fuck out of my way. Apex growled and tried to lunge for the female, but Lucan wheeled around and locked the other prisoner in a bar hold. As their eyes met, there was a struggle, but the other male stilled. Not now, Lucan mouthed. Thank you, the head of the guards patronized. And yes, I'll bet she's left after all these delay tactics of yours. Like I don't know what you're doing with this posturing. There were a series of beeps, and Lucan glanced over his shoulder. The female was entering the code, and as the lock released, she smiled back at him and stepped inside. Lucan nodded for Mayhem to come over and keep holding Apex in place, because, goddammit, Lucan was going into those quarters and checking to make sure Rio was gone. Except as the guy stepped up to assume the corralling job, there was a mistake in the transfer of duties. A slip of the hands was enough for Apex to break free and go raging bull toward the guards who were holding Kane up off the floor. As a fight broke out, Lucan had to let his two comrades handle themselves. He lunged forward and caught the door just before it shut, slipping into the private quarters. The head of the guards was over by the rifles, her long, blunt-tipped fingers traveling down one of them as if she were caressing the blooms of a vase full of red roses. I have coveted these guns. She glanced over at him, seemingly unsurprised he'd followed her. They can take out a dangling cherry from its stem at two hundred yards. Lucan looked around without trying to be obvious. Do me a favor. She arched a dark brow. Excuse me? Let Apex have Cain. Things are getting ugly out there, and if you're all about taking control, which appears to be true— you're going to want those guards without a lot of broken bones, right? The female came over, stared at him. I thought you wanted to be king of the mountain. No, I want to end this place. So you and I are at odds, even though you're willing to give me power. Did I say I would give you anything? You don't have a choice. With that, she walked back to the door. Entering the code, she opened the thing and recoiled. The fresh scent of blood and the gurgling sounds of death said it all. Hey, she called out. Enough! Stop it! The female palmed her gun and discharged a series of bullets into the air, with all the calmness of someone putting in a lunch order at a drive through In the aftermath, there was nothing but silence and the smell of gun smoke. 
She looked back at Lucan. You're going to Caldwell now and completing your job. And you know, if your girlfriend plays by my rules, I might let her live if it's beneficial for me. Fuck you. Her life is in your hands, Wolf. Bide your time, he told himself. The female was right. He and Mayhem and Apex were not enough to hold control. Not right now. But with the right plan, he needed time to think. Grinding his molars, he muttered, Yeah, fine. Bring Kane in here, the female ordered out into the hall. There's a bed. Okay, fine. Let him do it for fuck's sake. He wants to play Gurney. I don't give a shit. There was a pause. Then she opened the door wider and held it in place with her strong body. Apex didn't look at her as he passed by with Kane in his arms. Good thing. The light in his eyes was capable of blowing a mortal right out of their boots. And hey, at least Rio was nowhere to be found. As Apex laid Kane out gently and sat on the bed beside him, two guards with shiners like they'd been hit with a set of two-by-fours took up res against the far walls. Lucan shook his head as he tried to see whether Kane was still alive. You better hope you didn't kill him. The female shrugged as if she didn't have a care in the world. Whether he lives or dies doesn't matter to me. Adapt and overcome, that's my motto. So you're a parasite. No, I'm a predator. She paused by the command table. Well, 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 look at this. The female picked up some papers and went through them. Then she drew them to her nose and sniffed. These were your females. She smiled in that cold way of hers. I can scent her on them. Such a little artist she is. But she wasn't drawing you. Disappointed? As the pages were turned around, Lucan came forward and didn't bother hiding his intensity. The head of the guard's satisfaction was like the bloodstains on the floor, something that penetrated the space around her. Seems like she wanted to remember exactly what the layout of our facility is. Taking the papers from her, he frowned. They were, in fact, line drawings, floor by floor of the sanatorium. Every room, staircase, hallway, and connector that Rio had been through. Down to the scale. And the head of the guards was right. The paper had Rio's scent on it. She had done these. But she's not here anymore, is she? The other female said. Because you told her she'd better save herself. Too bad humans can't dematerialize, isn't it? When he remained stonily silent, because that was what you did when you discovered someone was using you, the female filled the void with conversation. Why did you bring her here to the prison camp? And do not lie. She needed to see the production. He shrugged like he didn't care. It's a big order. She said she wanted to make sure we could handle it. Why be so secretive? She's a goddamn human. The executioner wasn't going to jeopardize the funds flow. She was safe. Why hide her? I don't trust anyone inside these walls. Not even your cane? Lucan glanced over to the bed. Apex was curved over the other male, as if he were trying to breathe for the aristocrat by will alone. The fact that his own face was bruised and there was blood on his mouth didn't seem to be something he even noticed. Cain is not mine, Lucan corrected. Chapter 47 In retrospect, Jose had cursed himself. That was what he decided as he finally left the Homicide Division's bullpen and hung a louis to head down the empty corridor to the chief's suite. When he got to the outer door, he wasn't surprised to see that the window to the waiting area was dark, but he had permission to go in, so he tried the door handle. Fortunately, things had been left unlocked, and the motion-activated lights came on as soon as he put a foot inside. No doubt, Stan had told Willie to leave things open because he'd been expecting the updated report on Leon Roberts sometime after she left for the day. Jose certainly hadn't thought it'd be this late before he'd finished his typing. 
He glanced at his watch and cursed. Nine frickin' p.m. He'd had to call home twice. Once at six, when a tip on a cold case had come in, and then again at 7.30, to let his wife know he needed to stay and do write-ups. There had been a great deal to add to the report, and not just in terms of the autopsy or ballistics. A lot of people were calling with leads on Roberts's death. Jose had fielded them all afternoon long. He didn't think anything was going to materialize from any of it, but you never knew. So he and Trey had returned 33 calls, all of which he'd logged manually into the system from notes he and the kid had scribbled. Not that Trey was a kid. And now he was here, giving Willie's empty desk a wave in the darkness and going over to the glass door to Stan's crib, feeling like he was a hundred years old. The wave thing was pure habit, really. Every time he came in here, he walked by Willie's desk, waved at her, and went to open Stan's door. She never stopped him, no matter what Stan was doing, even if there was a meeting going on or the chief was on the phone. Willie always said he was the only one allowed to interrupt like that. So there was no hesitation as he passed by. Like the trained seal he was, he followed his greeting routine and went directly to Stan's inner door. It wasn't until he started to turn the knob that his tired brain woke up and pointed out that this entry was absolutely going to be inaccessible after hours. Things opened no problem. Of course you don't lock your door, Jose murmured as he entered and overhead lights came on automatically. Stan was such a product of the 80s. When battening down the hatches the second the sun went behind the horizon for the night had not been a thing. Then again, this was the police station, so everyone was getting checked in as they came into the building itself, and there were cameras everywhere. Well, out in the hall there were cameras, not in here. Whatever. Jose walked across the red and blue carpet and then stood over the piles of paperwork on the desk. Man, compliance would have a fit if they knew all this departmental shit, whatever it was, was unsecured. But that was the way Stan was too trusting. Then again, who could find anything in this? The sound was so quiet that had Jose not been standing still as he contemplated where he should put the report in the midst of the mess, he never would have heard it. And if it had not repeated, he wouldn't have bothered to do anything about it. But the soft noise was a phone, a cell phone on vibrate. Setting the report down on the corner of the desk, not that there was any rhyme or reason to that particular location. He followed the bring, bring to the door to Stan's private crapper. You forgot your phone, Stan, he said as he pushed the door wider. The sound was still muffled, even as he leaned into the sacred space. And then, before he could zero in on the where, things went silent. He glanced around the counter. Nothing there, out in the open and on the back of the toilet, only golf magazines. And he wasn't going into the guy's drawers. The sound started up again. Jose bent down, bent farther. The phone was vibrating in the lowest of the cabinet's drawers. He pulled the handle slowly, sliding things open. But for God's sakes, he'd known the guy his entire professional life. What was he going to find other than toilet rolls? There was a button-down shirt wadded up in the drawer, blue and white checked, no doubt another mustard casualty. Reaching in, he pulled the cotton folds out. Underneath them was a black nylon wallet and a cell phone, and as the caller hung up again, or things went to voicemail, the vibration stopped. With a sense of total disbelief, Jose took a pair of nitrile gloves out of his pocket, yet after so many years in his job, He'd learned to trust his gut. And his gut was telling him that what he was about to find was going to break his fucking heart. Leaving the phone alone, he picked up the wallet, tore open the Velcro, and... Officer Leon Roberts's face stared up at him from a driver's license that had been slotted into the see-through half of the two flaps. And across on the other side was the Caldwell police badge the man had earned and done proud. You know, you're quiet. Even for you, you're really frickin' quiet. 
As V stopped under the fire escape and looked up, he wondered, if he stayed silent, whether rage would move on to another topic, like food or food, or maybe food, you know, just to mix it up. Hello? Hollywood prompted. I'm focused on what we're doing here. Rage stepped in front, and given his size, it was like the earth had coughed up a big, blonde, beautiful mountain, with a pie hole that, with no pie around, was flapping in the wind. And we've walked aimlessly for how many blocks now? The brother said. What's wrong? Fine. You want to chat? Answer me this. How does getting in our 350,000 steps tonight correspond to conversation? V, what's up your ass? Rage crossed his arms over the black daggers that were holstered, handles down, to his massive chest. Then he winced. Actually, how about you just tell me what's on your mind? I think I better leave your ass and what may or may not be inside of it out of this. No offense. V leaned back against the club. As the music was really bumping, the vibrations coming through the cement walls were like a massage chair. What did you dream about, Vicious? Came the question he dreaded. He shook his head. You don't know me. The hell I don't. What did you see? When there was no reply, the brother said, Who died? Who said anybody died? You don't get visions about happy shit, V. Like never once have you told me you've had a dream about a bag of Lay's sour cream and onion or Doritos. Hell, some Snyders of Hanover pretzel nubs would do nicely. Nubs? Yeah, with peanut butter in them. They're awesome. Rage shrugged. I mean, I'm assuming you'd mention it if you'd seen any of these snack foods in my future. Like, have you? Let me get this straight. You're putting nubs in your mouth, but you're worried what's doing with my ass? Don't hate the pretzel. And let's get back to the issue at hand. Right. We're trying to find the missing female officer posing as a dealer, and this is where we saw her last. What the hell did you see over day? Okay. This was the problem with rage. The brother was a tenacious motherfucker, and he actually had spot-on instincts. Oh, and then there was the ass-slapping fact that V kinda wanted to talk about it. Hey, Rage's Shellen was a therapist, right? That was halfway to goal. Not that he was looking to get his head shrunk. The words came out of his mouth fast. I dreamt that Jose de la Cruz's head got blown off his shoulders. The brother rubbed his eyes like they stung. Butch's former partner? No, another human with that name in Caldwell. V put his hand out. Sorry, I'm being bitchy. It's okay. You must be freaking out. I mean, what do you do with information like that? And no timeline. None. It could be ten years from now, or tomorrow night. Or tonight. Holy shit. V cut in. It's that guy. Rage wheeled around and squinted through the darkness. You're right. From that thing. V stepped around Hollywood and shit-kickered his way across the street, falling into the wake of a human male who was six feet tall, but only about a hundred twenty pounds. The addict was in the same clothes as he'd been in the other night, when that undercover cop had walked him to the holy mother of salvatory stuff a couple streets over. My guy! V called out. Hey! The man glanced over his shoulder, got one look at the two pieces of trained killer on his tail, and took off at a surprisingly fast bolt. Then again, maybe he'd had training in these kinds of sprints. V just loped along in his trail, knowing damn well that that body didn't have a marathon in it. Sure enough, three blocks down toward the river, there was a sudden drop in forward motion. And as the classic respiration triangle manifested, the guy bracing his arms on his knees and making plenty of torso space for his labored breathing, vicious and rage pulled up alongside. Flash Gordon looked up from his panting. I didn't... I didn't do it. Take your time, V muttered. We'll wait. Palming his tin of hand rolls, he popped the top and put the offering in the human's face. 
and like the SIGs were the hookup to a ventilator, or at the very least an oxygen mask, the guy reached for the nicotine with quaking fingers. Here, I'll get you one. V did the job with his gloved hand. Only tobacco, but it's Turkish. The best. Th th thanks, man. The cigarette went in between thin lips, and then the man kicked his head forward for the bick that was offered. As he puffed up, the habit kicked in and calmed the hyperventilating. Three inhales later, and the guy said, I didn't do it, really. I'm not accusing you of anything. V thumbed over his shoulder. Neither is my brother. Eyes that would have been considered rheumatic in an eighty-year-old went back and forth. We're not related by blood, V explained. Oh, listen, I know you've got to be somewhere. V motioned around in a circle, indicating all of downtown, so I'm not going to waste your time. Okay. I want to know about a woman you were with the other night. She's about this high. V put his hand out flat at about five feet nine inches tall. Short dark hair, had a leather jacket on. She helped you over to that dry-out tank. Resource facility. Rage cut in with a glare. And hey, pound me for getting some help. That takes courage. Good luck with your recovery. As Hollywood put out his toaster oven-sized fist, the human put his open palm over the knuckles in confusion. And then when Rage clapped the man on the shoulder, V had to catch Flash Gordon before he eggshelled onto the sidewalk. You know the woman I'm talking about? V prompted. You need her description again? I, uh, yeah, I know her. Great. Do you know where we can find her? You got a cell phone number or an address for her? The man fell quiet and paid a whole lot of attention to the end of the hand rolled. Then he smoked some more. Meanwhile, the city kept going. A couple of cars, a sedan and a truck went by, and then some twentyish men in tight jeans and narrow-shouldered jackets slicked across the intersection. Hello, Rage said. V reached into his back pocket. Here, this hundy'll help. I get how times are tough. The human's eyes flared as he focused on the folded bill. Just answer any of my questions and it's yours. V held the Benji between his fore and middle fingers. Telephone number, address, regular place of business, anything you know would be a big help. The human cleared his throat. Then he dropped the hand roll and stamped it out with a converse all-star that had seen better days and nights. Flash Gordon shook his head. Nah, I ain't telling you nothing. Rio, she's good to me. She cares about me. She makes me take care of myself better even when I don't feel like it. I can't tell you nothing. Sorry. The human straightened from his sagging posture, and even though he was still shaking, like he expected to have a gun put to his head at any second, his lips were shut and staying that way. Okay. V nodded. I can respect that. To a point. By passing the human's nobility and free will, he entered the man's mind and took a brief stroll around. The guy was currently sober, but that was not going to last, and he was feeling bad about being determined to score, like he was letting that undercover buddy of his down. In the end, though, the man didn't know anything specific about the woman, other than her street name, Rio, and the fact that she was supposedly high up in an organization run by a guy named Mozart. Pulling out, V didn't bother patching anything up. It was better not to mess with the man much, because God knew that brain was damaged enough from the drug use. In response, the addict winced like he had a headache, and those eyes went back and forth again between V and Rage, all other shoe drop, bracing for some kind of retribution. Vicious tucked the hundy in the man's pocket. Keep the money. Go get a hot meal. It's going to be a long night. Flash Gordon stammered some thanks, and then he shambled away, looking over his shoulder a couple of times before he disappeared around a corner into an alley. You've got a good heart under those daggers, Vicious. Whatever, V muttered as he started walking again. Let's keep looking. At least we have a street first name now. But if she's undercover and she's missing, 
She's going to wake up dead. Rage caught up with him easily enough. Hey, that's what Butch says all the time. It's a funny saying. Yeah, I know. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, I know. Christ on a crutch, V thought to himself. Finding that prison camp was a real pain in his ass on so many levels. True? Chapter 48 Hello? When Rio's third call to her direct report, Leon Roberts, was finally answered, she had a split second of relief. Except then the man who'd picked up repeated the greeting, and she knew it wasn't Leon. Hello? Without conscious thought, she stomped on the brakes. The SUV's knobby tires immediately grabbed on to the pavement and brought her to a screeching halt in the middle of the narrow strip of country asphalt. As a surge of fear gripped her, her peripheral vision sharpened, the pine trees on either shoulder coming into almost painful clarity in the glow of the headlights. Roberts was never without his cell phone, and she'd called him so many times over the last three years, she'd know his number and his voice anywhere. I can hear you breathing, the man on the other end said. I know you haven't hung up. No, she hadn't, but where was Roberts? And I think, I think I know who this is, even though this number is not in Leon's contacts. Rio covered her mouth with her free hand. Oh, God, she knew this voice. She knew who this was. Tears speared into her eyes, and she blinked quick. If I'm right about who you are, the man continued, you need to listen carefully. Do not, don't come home. Wherever you are, if it's safe, stay put. It's not good here, at home. Do you understand what I'm telling you? I think I know who you are, and that means you know what I'm telling you and why I'm telling it to you like this. Drawing the cell phone away from her ear, Rio stared at the time count as the seconds moved quickly. Then she snapped the thing back in place. Lowering her voice to disguise it, she said, Detective Jose de la Cruz. There was a brief pause. Yes, and I think you can guess why I'm answering this phone. All at once, she was back downtown, racing to meet Luke for the first time, accepting a call on her own cell phone. Clear as a bell, she heard Roberts's voice in her ear, telling her her identity had been compromised, and there had been something else when she'd been busy talking over him. He'd told her he'd sent her something, hadn't he? What had he sent her? Suddenly, there was no air in the SUV, so she put down the window a little, the cold night coming in. Home, she said in that falsely low tone. Go home. Then she quickly ended the call. Maybe he'd figured out what she was trying to tell him. Maybe he wouldn't. But either way, Detective Jose de la Cruz of Homicide had just saved her life. Someone on the inside was after her, and had killed her colleague and friend because of it. Holding the cell phone to her chest, she tried to breathe, tried to think, and sometime thereafter, she realized she had come to a stop next to a green and white highway sign. Walters, 10. Upstate. She was seriously upstate. The idea that she couldn't go back to her apartment made her feel as if she were in a foreign country and did not speak the language. Then again, she had no idea where she could go, who she could talk to, what was safe, what she should do. Another set of headlights rounded a curb in the road, coming toward her. Snapping to attention, she threw the phone out of the window and into the opposite lane. Then she punched the gas and continued on. She was in a stolen SUV, owned by drug suppliers, with a phone she'd lifted off a guy she'd shot and killed, stuck in an information vacuum where the wrong move could end her up where Roberts had, wherever that grave was. Rio kept driving until she came into a little hamlet with a diner-slash-grocery store combo and a bank and a gas station. She wasn't hungry, but then she had no money. At least the tank was full. That gasoline and this vehicle she didn't own were pretty much the extent of her assets. 
caught. What was she going to do? She'd assumed that as long as she could stay out of Mozart's way until she could get to the station, she'd be fine. But now that was not an option. She had to find a safe place to collect her thoughts and figure out what she needed to do. But like she knew this area at all? As Lucan walked out of Willow Hills's front entrance, the sense that things were closing in, smothering him, suffocating him, was like a tangible stalker tight on his heels. He knew what he was supposed to do, knew where to do it, knew what he had to accomplish to be successful. But in the very short distance between the executioner's private quarters and this very large, awfully decrepit exit, he'd made up his mind. Rio wasn't going to be involved in what happened next. He was going to deal with Mozart directly. That way, he could make sure Cain stayed alive while not endangering her, and then he could lose his fucking mind quietly and calmly. Great plan. But come on. She'd known she was in danger. He'd rescued her, for fuck's sake. The conversation should have been about her getting out of the drug-dealing life, not him. But he'd been too distracted by emotion to be as smart and logical as he should have been. And wasn't that always the way? Closing his eyes with a curse, he slowed his breathing and got ready to dematerialize. Just get ghost and go. Leave in a scatter of molecules. When nothing even remotely heading out happened, he reopened his lids and looked back at the sanatorium. All those lives stuck underground, suffering in lesser degrees until they dropped dead and were slung out of the building's body chute to roast into ash by the sun. No one to mourn them, nobody missing them. Forgotten. For fuck's sake, most of the people in there couldn't remember why or how they'd ended up in custody but they were going to have to wait for another savior to come along. He was not it. He was no hero, and never had been one. Once again, with the closing of the eyes, then the breathing, deep breathing, slow, easy. When he still filled out his clothes and stayed stuck to the ground, when his body remained heavy and full in his skin, and the landscape continued to be unchanged, he lost his temper and started hoofing it. Another couple of hundred yards, he tried to dematerialize again. And then one more time, a further hundred yards along. His head was just too fucked for him to concentrate enough to ghost away. Long fucking walk to Caldwell from where the hell he was. Man, this night just kept getting better. Zipping his leather jacket up, he entered the scruffy tree line, pushing bare limbs out of his face, making his way to the chain-link fence. He was forced to claw his way up the thing and swing himself over the top. As he landed with a curse, he kept going. Guess he was just going to have to borrow a human's car off the county road. Yeah, because there were so many people wearing out the pavement up here this time of night. He'd have a better chance of getting hit by a bus. Monte Carlo. Monte fucking Carlo, he thought, as he fell into a jog. Chapter 49 Jose pulled his unmarked over to the curb in front of Officer Hernandez Guerrero's apartment building. When he got out, he made sure his jacket was open so he could get at his gun. It was that kind of night. The neighborhood was quiet, even though there were no private houses, but congregations of tenants corralled under communal roofs. Then again, this was a working folk zip code where nine o'clock was wind-down time, even on the weekends. All kinds of TV blue light strobing in the sliding glass doors that opened to shallow one-unit porches. Hitting the sidewalk, he went up to the front door of the building in question and entered, passing by the mailboxes. At the second door, he took out the keys Stan had given him from before and unlocked things. It didn't take him long to get to the missing officer's apartment, and he snapped on gloves before breaking the seal he had put on the door jamb. As he hit the inside lights, he knew the layout like the back of his hand, not that it was complicated, and he went through each room, one after the other, turning on any lamp or overhead fixture that he came to. He looked under the sofa, the bed, and in all the cupboards, 
all over again. He went through drawers wherever he found them, in the bedroom, in the bath, in the kitchen. The closet got another deep dive as he checked the pockets in coats and searched the floor under the hanging clothes with his flashlight. Going down on his hands and knees, he opened shoe boxes and went through empty duffels. Nothing. Maybe he'd gotten her message wrong. The knock out by the living area was soft. So was the, hello? Jose got back up to his feet with old man effort, his high school football injury squawking at the weight he put on that bad knee. Yep, he called out as he came around into the living area. A woman who was about six months pregnant was leaning through the main door. When she saw him, she smiled tentatively. Um, hi, I'm Elsie Orchard. I live across the hall. Hi. He got out his badge and flashed it. Detective Jose de la Cruz. That smile disappeared, all kinds of worry replacing it. Is everything okay? We're doing our best. Can I help you? Yeah, so... She brought forward something from behind her back. I was getting my mail today, and the post office guy couldn't fit this in Rio's box. He said there wasn't enough room because it hadn't been emptied in days. I don't know what it is. I promised him I would give it to her, but she's not here. As the woman held out an eight and a half by eleven envelope, her hands were shaking. Is she all right? She's really nice. She always helped me if I were bringing groceries in. And when the lights went out from that storm back in August, she knocked on my door and made sure I had a flashlight. My husband was gone. It meant a lot. Jose wanted to make the sign of the cross as he accepted the piece of mail, but nothing good would come out of further alarming any of the neighbors, especially if they were pregnant. Thank you so much. Is there anything I can do to help? Where is she? The eyes that clung to his were scared rather than hopeful, and the woman ran her hand around the gentle swell of her belly as if she were trying to soothe herself. Have you seen anything unusual in the building? he asked, just to give her something to respond to, or at this apartment. No, I haven't. I wish I had. Our place faces the street that way, and... Jose let her keep going, let her tell him everything she could think of. Sometimes you just had to invite people into the investigation because it was the right thing to do. Caring neighbors and family members who were suffering deserved airspace. Plus, you never knew when a helpful tip would be dropped. Anyway, she concluded sadly, staring down at his gloved hands, here's my card. He held one out to her. Call me if you think of anything else. The woman nodded and then went back across the hall. He held the door open and watched her until she gave him a wave and locked herself in. He hoped her husband was home tonight. She was going to need some support. Closing Officer Hernandez Guerrero's front door, he took the envelope into the kitchen. Everything was neat and clean, so there was nothing to push out of the way to get a flat, clear space on the counter, unlike on Stan's desk. As a feeling of dread swamped him, he turned the piece of mail over. The name and address were written in fine point black ink, and the penmanship was bad. Everything scrawled and tilted to the left, like someone who wasn't right handed was trying to write like they were. No return address in the upper left. Postcode over the stamps was Caldwell. Heavy and stiff. Photographs. Ordinarily, he wouldn't open potential evidence on his own, but this was not ordinary considering what the hell he'd found in the sink cabinet in Stan's crapper. Taking out his Swiss army knife, he slid the blade into the flap and cut carefully down the seam. The back had been taped in a sloppy fashion, the wide, shiny swaths pressed into a mess. Jose put the knife down and slid out black and white glossies. At first, his eyes refused to focus properly on the two figures who were facing each other. When things finally became clearer, he found that the images had been taken at a distance, but from a telephoto lens, so they were laser accurate. Stan was on the left, and on the right, a tall, elegant man in a tuxedo, Stefan Fontaine. There were easily fifteen pictures, 
and a succession of them told a story. There was an argument going on, both men leaning in, gesturing with hands, throwing up arms in frustration, and then there was one where a photograph changed hands. The first image of it didn't register, but the second caught the old-school picture at just the right angle. It was Rio. It was Officer Hernandez Guerrero. Why in the hell would Stan be providing the picture of an undercover officer whose identity was known only to Stan and one or two others on the entire force to a civilian? Under any circumstance, it was a breach in protocol and confidentiality. Under the fact pattern that one undercover officer was dead and had likely been the person taking the pictures, and Rio was missing? The photographs looked like a negotiation, where Stefan was giving Stan something, and Stan was providing the identity of Rio in return. Now, Jose freely made the sign of the cross over his heart. Then he turned the envelope back over and stared at the handwriting. He was willing to bet his almost mortgage-free house that analysis would show the writing was Leon Roberts's. If it didn't, it was because he'd tried to disguise his cursive by using his opposite hand. The man had been going to Rio directly because he didn't trust internal channels, not even internal affairs, and he'd known her life was in danger. The question almost as important as what Stan had gotten for the intel, was why Stefan Fontaine would need or want to know who Rio was. Chapter 50 Lucan would have let his wolven out to run if he hadn't needed to keep a set of clothes on himself. As it was, he got through the woods as fast as his two-legged form could take him, even though under his skin, his other side chomped at the proverbial bit to get free and forepaw the ground. Now was not the time for that, and that abandoned farmhouse was only a mile or two away. He was about two hundred yards from the property, scaling a fallen tree in a hurdle, when the scent first reached his nose. Slowing, he had to make sure he was catching it right. Gasoline, in the middle of the woods, and it was fresh, accompanied by oil and exhaust. The bouquet of it all was faint but unmistakable. Tracking the smell, he changed direction, moving laterally over the acreage to make sure he didn't catch anyone's attention. There it was, tucked into a thicket of brambles that was so dense the silver SUV might as well have been covered by a tarp of evergreen vegetation. Was it possible, he thought, as his heart quickened? Real, he whispered as he closed in on the vehicle. Circling the tinted windows, he couldn't see much inside, but it was locked. Lucan turned and looked through the interlacing branches of the tangle. That farmhouse was just in the distance, but he felt like it was across the country. Surging forward, he all but shot himself out of a cannon as he raced to the back door. But just as he grabbed the knob, he stopped and made sure his instincts weren't sensing anything. Rio, he said out loud. It's me. Don't shoot. Luca knocked a couple of times, called out her name again. The door squeaked as he opened it, and he spoke up louder as he leaned into the kitchen. Rio, don't shoot. His voice echoed around the abandoned rooms. Rio? He stepped in, closed the door. It's me. What if she were injured, he thought. Across the way, the cellar entry opened a crack, and he put his hands in the air. Just me? No one else. He didn't get a chance to finish the sentence. Rio raced out and threw herself at him. As his arms wrapped around her, he held her so tight, he had to force himself to loosen his grip for fear of crushing her. I thought you were going to Caldwell, he said. She pulled back. I can't. Why not? When she just shook her head, he felt his fangs tingle. What's going on? Rio broke away and walked around the fallen plaster pieces, the discarded trash, the broken kitchen chair that was just organized kindling as opposed to anything you could actually sit on. It's not safe for me right now. I came here because I needed a place to think for a minute. There was a temptation to get into her mind, to take all of her secrets and consume them because he was impatient and frustrated. But that would be a violation of her, 
sure as if he touched her when she didn't want to be, or spied on her when she was naked and didn't know he was there. It was wholly inappropriate. Mozart came after you, didn't he? As she looked over at him sharply, he knew he was right. You don't have to say anything you don't want to. But you can't pretend I didn't save your life back in that shitty apartment building. It had to be him. He's a powerful man. What went wrong? I thought you were his second in command. Look, the less you know, the better. She put her hands up. And I may not be who you should deal with anymore. But Mickey is dead. So who do I go to? Mozart himself, she said with a harsh laugh. Then she shook her head. No, that was a joke. Do not go try to find him. What do you know about the man? She didn't even hesitate. Nothing. He's impossible to find. A ghost. No one is that good at cover. No one. Rio came back at him, her eyes pleading. He'll kill you. That man is a soulless monster. He thought of those drawings she'd done of the building and knew the head of the guards was right. They were not mementos of her stay. They were blueprints for an infiltration. She was using him, and yet her body couldn't fake arousal. And was he any better than she was, with all he wasn't telling her? I'm not worried about Mozart. I have some tricks up my sleeve. Lucan brushed the side of her face. Then he paused as things took on a different intensity. You know something? I love when you look at me like this. Like how? Like you want me to touch you. The next thing he knew, her hands were on his shoulders, and he was leaning into her. Rio. There was no time for them. There was no future to be had. All they had was the present. Rio. Kiss me, she moaned, like she'd read his mind. Lucan dropped his head and found her lips like she was the air he needed, the food he craved, the sunlight he could no longer be in. And against his own, her mouth was as hungry as his was, the contact desperate and needy. Without any rational thought in his head, and every sexual instinct in his body roaring, he maneuvered them over to the door she'd emerged out of. Come on, he said, taking her hand. As they started down the cellar stairs, he turned back and threw the deadbolt. It wasn't copper, so it wasn't going to do shit to keep out any vampires, but at least humans would be denied access. For as long as it took for an intruder to break down the damn door. Then again, it wasn't like he and Rio weren't armed. On the lower level, he couldn't not kiss her again. She'd lit a candle in a stout, corroded holder, and the fragile light was like a distant star in the night over by the bolts of fabric he'd first settled her on when he'd had nowhere else to bring her. He helped her stretch out, holding her hand to steady her as she got down on her knees and lay on her back. Joining her, she arched her body and he kissed her some more his hands finding their way under the shirt he'd given her. The layers that covered her came off, melting away as he undid buttons, unzipped zippers, stripped off the shirt, her pants, and her bra. No panties. He'd ruined them. You're so beautiful. You always say that. She smiled up at him. I'm thinking you're biased for some reason. It's because I love you, he thought to himself. Lucan kissed her in a lingering way. Then he sat back and just watched the candlelight play over her pink-tipped breasts and her stomach and the graceful curve of her hips. As his eyes traveled down her naked body, she moved her legs together, her thighs shifting restlessly, like she was wet and hungry. Taking his time, his hands followed the path of his stare, stroking down her throat, lingering over her collarbones. Her breasts lifted as she arched, but he teased her, letting his fingertips cross over her ribs and curve up to her sternum. He made a circle around one of her nipples, and as she gasped, he pinched her gently. Then he full-on caressed her, relishing the softness, the tautness, the silk, until he couldn't help himself. He lowered his mouth to her and tasted her, one tight tip and then the other. When his hand went lower, she opened her legs. She was so undone for him, so vulnerable and powerful at the same time. She was ancient, and she was new, a mystery and an answer, a secret and a truth. The contradictions made him desperate, and that made him aggressive. 
but he relished calling on his self-control. He enjoyed the torture of keeping himself in check. Slipping his hand between her thighs, he found her slick heat, and as he stroked her, penetrated her, he watched her writhe in the candlelight. With an erotic moan, she brought her hands to her face, bit down on a couple of her fingers, and then she put her arms over her head, twisting, turning. She slapped her legs together at where he was pleasuring her as she came, holding him in place, locking her knees tight. The rhythmic releases compressed his fingers, and he imagined his cock was inside of her. Like she read his mind, she popped open her eyes. I want you in me. Now. Rio was feeling like liquid heat underneath Luke's hot stare and very talented hands, but it wasn't enough. Fortunately, as he retracted his touch and immediately started stripping, it appeared that the foreplay hadn't been sufficient for him either. In the candlelight, he was magnificent, fully naked, his very male body hard and thick with muscle, hard and thick where it counted the most. When he came back down to the bolts of fabric, she held out her arms and opened her legs wide. She was done with the anticipation part of things. She needed him. I can't wait, he growled. Good. As he settled into the cradle of her sex, his tremendous weight made her feel pinned, and she wanted that. She wanted to be under him and pressed into the softness below her. She wanted him buried deep. Rio cried out as his blunt head probed at her. Then she got what she wanted. With a decisive thrust, he entered her and stretched her wide. The sex better than the best she had ever had, and they hadn't even started moving yet. That little slow-up was promptly addressed. Luke retracted his hips, thrust again, retracted, thrust. The rhythm got faster and faster, and rougher, too, until he was pounding into her. Against the onslaught of him, it was all she could do to just hold on to his massive shoulders, her teeth clapping together, her core both numb and hypersensitive. No, wait, that was her whole body. Her nails dug into his skin, and at one point, she nearly bit him in the biceps. The orgasm tore through her, the pleasure so great it registered as pain, too. And then he was locking against her body, then locking again and again. It didn't stop. Maybe later she would marvel at the stamina. At the moment, she was too blissed out and off the planet to do anything but absorb everything he pumped into her. Until he finally went still. As he collapsed on top of her, breathing hard, she stroked his back with slow hands. Even though the full weight of him was on her, she felt as though she were floating. I better let you breathe, he said in a hoarse voice. When he went to roll aside, she pulled at him. No, not yet. I'm too heavy. How could she explain that she needed him to hold her down? She felt as though her pinnings were gone, her tethers cut, her balloon off and floating over the landscape of her life. She had no family, it was true, but her job, her mission, her obsession— had been a grounding sure as all those Thanksgivings and Christmases, birthdays and weddings that other people enjoyed. Okay, fine. Her sense of home involved crime and danger and dead bodies, and required a constant nagging self-preservation instinct, but it was still what was familiar to her. What got her out of bed in the morning? What gave her purpose? Now she didn't know who to trust and not in a the-streets kind of way, as in inside the Caldwell Police Department itself. When Luke shifted off eventually, he took her with him, the pair of them entwined together with him still inside of her. Reaching behind himself, he pulled some of the bolts of fabric over them. Please don't go after Mozart, she said as she stroked his face. His eyes held hers in the candlelight, and she felt as though he could see through her. Why? Because you are? Yes, she thought. That was what she had decided to do. It was the only way to guarantee her safety inside the department. Someone in there had compromised her to the man, and if she could apprehend him herself and turn him in, then she'd be okay. It was the only way to survive. And besides, 
Mozart didn't know for sure whether she was dead or alive, so that gave her an advantage. Rio, where'd you go in your head? Refocusing, she shrugged. There are other dealers in town. She tried to keep the sadness out of her voice and failed. I really wish you were not. I wish I could help you get away, that's all. You need to get out of this life, Rio. It's killing you from the inside, like a disease. You already lost your brother and your parents to drugs. Don't lose yourself. It's too late for that, she said grimly. Riding a sudden surge of emotion, she wanted to grab onto him and start talking a bunch of crazy shit about not just him going underground, but her as well. Except she knew better than that. Fairy tales didn't exist in the real world and certainly not between cops and drug dealers. They were silent for what felt like a lifetime. Then he spoke up. You need to leave here first, he said, so I can make sure no one is following you. This can't be the end, she whispered to herself, although technically this was their second goodbye, wasn't it? It has to be, and you know it. We are not good for each other. The man was right, of course. I'm so tired, Luke. I've been running for so long. I feel the same way. He brushed her lower lip with his thumb. And I'm sorry if I was rough with you when I mounted you. You're perfect. She stroked his chest over his heart. Besides, it has to last a lifetime, doesn't it? For a moment, as he looked into her eyes, she felt like his resolve was wavering. But then he nodded curtly and pulled the bolts of mismatched fabric off of himself. The way he was careful to tuck her in made her tear up. She hated being taken care of, looked after, except for by him. His pants had been tossed all willy-nilly aside, and as he bent over to pick them up off the concrete floor, she got a hell of an ass shot. And then he was stepping into them and pulling them up his thick thighs. Something fell out of the combat's back pocket, a bundle of papers, the square they had been forced into unfolding, now they were out of the confines they had been in. Inside the folds, she saw something she recognized. Rio reached out and pulled the wad toward her. As she flattened the pages, she gave the sketches of the facility she'd drawn a quick once-over. Not like she needed to review them in depth. I know you're a cop, Rio. When she looked up sharply, he put his palm out. It's okay. I won't tell anybody, even if they torture me. Your secret is safe. But just do us both a solid and don't try to lie to me now. You engineered staying longer than you had to under the pretext of helping Kane. You clearly took notes on the layout, and you're all but begging me to get out of the business. If you were a drug dealer, you'd be talking about the deal, and you never have, not even once. Looking down as he did up his fly, his hair fell forward and hid his expression. And then he pulled on his sweatshirt and a jacket that hadn't registered. To get his boots on, he sat on the floor next to the makeshift bed, and she watched, as if from a vast distance, as his strong hands did the laces up. Then he was still. When he stared over at her, his expression was full of sorrow. I know you used me. I'm never going to really be sure how much of what you did with me was real— and how much was about seducing me for your own purposes. And the truth is, I don't want the truth. I'd rather just leave things right here and be able to pretend that you cared about me, even if it was just a little. Rio threw out her hand, but he shifted away from her touch. I'm just going to choose to believe in my fantasy, he said. They're never real, right? But they feel great, don't they? Especially when there's nothing to compete with them, when it comes to hope and validation. And hey, for me, I have one further than most people. Mine is not just a conjecture conjured by the mind, but an actual memory, a tangible experience. She squeezed her eyes shut. Luke, it wasn't like that for me. It was, but you always were too good for me, and I've known this all along. And not just because I'm a drug dealer and you're... Sitting up to cut him off, she held a stripe of blue velvet to her chest. I never lied to you, except for about who you really are. 
He looked down at his hands. But like I said, it's okay. You have very, very good reasons for keeping that shit to yourself. I don't blame you. And I'm just lucky I got to be with you, no matter the reason or the pretext. Please, let me explain. There's no way you can without more lies, and I've made peace with the ones that are already between us. Luke turned to the stairs. I'll give you some privacy to let you get dressed. See you up there. He walked away, moving in that beautiful way he did, and as he disappeared up the rickety stairs, tears started to fall from her eyes. But if she was honest with herself, how else had she thought things would end? Oh, God, she said into the candlelight. It's really over. Chapter 51 When Rio emerged into the kitchen, she opened the door slowly. Luke was over at the chipped counters and the ruined sink, leaning back with his arms crossed over his chest and his eyes on his boots. He looked up and smiled a little. You ready to trade? I'm sorry? Keys. He held out a collection of silver slips on a metal ring. To the vehicles? It's better for you not to be in something that came from my place. He tacked on the extra explanation because clearly her brain wasn't processing anything and he knew it. Oh, right. She walked over to him, fishing around in her pockets. Here. Their hands barely touched as they exchanged what they had, and she looked out over his shoulder at the old car in the dull moonlight. I can't believe this is happening, she said, unsure what part she was referring to. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Anything within reason. Close your eyes and forgive me. For what? All of a sudden, there was a piercing headache in the front of her brain, and her thoughts got muddled. At first, she had no idea what was happening, but then she remembered the way she had felt as the guard had somehow commanded her body in that workroom. I only took as much as I absolutely had to, she heard Luke say in her mind. A wonky feeling of disassociation took its time receding, and then she rubbed the eye that stung. I've got a headache. Goodbye, Rio. She wanted to hug him, but she could feel her emotions already starting to choke her. And then there were the fuzzy thoughts in her head, nothing organizing into anything that made sense. Goodbye, Luke, she mumbled. Ladies first. With her heart in her throat, she turned away, opened the squeaky door, stepped out into the not really much colder night because the house was unheated. She looked back as she closed things up. Luke was still leaning against the counter, staring at his boots, a lone figure in an abandoned, ruined kitchen, with the weight of the world on his very strong shoulders. Her fingertips lingered on the dusty glass, and then she turned away to the car. As she got inside the Monte Carlo, she was aware of the mental spaciness persisting, but at least the pain in her head was easing, and she knew what to do with the car key, and where the pedals were, and how to put the engine in gear. She remained absolutely clear, however, on the fact that her heart was breaking. Turning the P.O.S. around, she headed off down the lane, moving the car around potholes in the dirt and a fallen trunk. Images from being with Luke flashed in front of her eyes, coming awake in the clinic and finding him beside her, kissing him, that shower in the private quarters. She remembered the other two men, his friends, and the patient as well. Plus, her executing that, well, executioner. There was also her squeezing into the dumbwaiter and hiding under the locked-up blocks of drugs in that room. And yet, something was wrong. She couldn't seem to recall where she had been. It was like a dreamscape, where nothing exactly fit together, even though all the pieces were intact. Also, the harder she concentrated, the more indistinct everything became, and the more her head hurt. Where was she going? She wondered. The animal ran out in front of the car so fast that she couldn't swerve to avoid it, and the thing was so big that when she hit the poor thing, the whole car bucked and got thrown to one side. Damn it! She punched the brakes and squeezed the steering wheel hard. 
Shoving the gear shift into park, she opened the door and leaned out, but she couldn't see anything. With a shaking hand, she released the seatbelt and put one foot on the ground. And as she stood up, she decided that everything that could go wrong was going to... It was a dog. A big dog. Maybe a wolf. At least going by the size of the rear paw that was extending out from the front wheel. No growling. No moving. No wheezing. She'd obviously killed it. Sagging in her own skin, she wanted to break down. It felt like everything was working against her. And though she knew her own life was in danger, and she'd just lost the man she loved, the idea she'd hurt an innocent animal was utterly unbearable. And then there was the reality that she had to move it out from under the car if she was going to continue driving. You got to do this, she muttered. And wasn't that the theme song of her largely dark and depressing reality at large? Pulling herself together, she palmed up her gun and stepped around the door. Rio froze. Then she slowly brought her free hand to her mouth and just barely caught the scream from breaking out of her throat. There was a human foot on the ground in front of the wheel, not a paw. So she was either losing her mind or her eyesight. Stumbling around to the front of the car, she saw something that her eyes simply refused to process. There was some kind of change happening to the dog, the wolf. It was changing. The wolf was changing, right before her. Its white and gray fur seemed to be retracting back into the skin underneath, and a series of cracking noises, like bones or joints were breaking sounded out as limbs reshaped and pushed the feet and the hands forward. And then there was the face. The muzzle sucked back to become a chin, mouth, and nose, while the head expanded, a rounded skull taking the place of the canine square top. Rio took a step back, and another. She knew she should care that she was spotlit in the headlights, but her brain was taken up by... She hit something solid. And as she gasped, she smelled that cologne Luke always wore. Jumping off of him, she wheeled around and played a horrific game of connect the dots as her eyes fluttered. Blink, she saw the dog that burst through the door into that apartment and attacked the man who was going to kill her. Blink, Luke was there, in ill-fitting clothes, freeing her from the stakes in the floor. Blink, she remembered Apex being brought to his knees in the weak sunlight of that hallway. Blink. She was back-dragging Luke to the back door's stairwell, pulling him out of the sunshine as his skin burned. Blink. Nocturnal. Blink. Mates. Not married. Blink. The fuzzy thoughts she'd suddenly had after Luke had stared deeply into her eyes before she'd left the farmhouse. Blink. I only took as much as I absolutely had to. Rio pointed the gun at Luke, horror and disbelief overcoming her. What the hell are you? She demanded. What the hell are you? Chapter 52 One great thing about unmarked cars, particularly the older ones, was that you could kill all the lights. No head or tail or running. Nothing. In the modern era, where everybody and his uncle was playing nanny to the child you hadn't been for years, it was nice to have the option to just say, Hey, I don't need to attract any goddamn attention right now, so I'm going dark. Thanks. As Jose sat behind the wheel and stared across at the parking lot behind the station house, he was watching Stan's office up on the third floor. He knew he had the right set of windows because Homicide's lineup was always lit, and the ten glowing glass panes in a row grounded him. Plus, hey, the building wasn't that big anyway. Stan was moving around in his digs, and he went into the bathroom. Jose knew this because the little slot of a window that didn't match any of the others in the facade went bright. Jose glanced across to his passenger seat. The envelope that the nice pregnant neighbor had brought over to Rio's apartment was sitting on top of Leon Roberts's wallet and cell phone. The rest of the case that Jose was constructing was in his head and his broken heart. Hell of a way to go out, he muttered. 
and didn't know whether he was talking about Stan or himself. Then again, they were in this together, just like they had started together. As his phone went off, he jumped and shoved his hand into the inside pocket of his sport coat. Extracting the thing, he had to brace himself, only to deflate. Hey, honey, he murmured. His wife's voice was worried. Where are you? I'm working a case. Oh, I thought you were coming home. So did I, he said roughly. How's your day? Long. He heard a rustling and a thump, and could picture her putting that huge bag of books and her laptop onto the kitchen table. I've got an exam next week, so I'm just going to sit myself down and start studying while I wait up for you. How late are you going to be? I don't know. Could be hours. Okay. The easy way she said the two syllables was why they were still married. The woman was patient and smart and everything that was good in his life. I'm going to take you on a vacation. His voice cracked. Your semester is ending at the same time I get out. You and I are going on a, a married moon. A week away. Anywhere you want to go. You pick. Her laugh was surprised. Jose, you hate to travel. You know this. Not this time I won't. You and me. Anywhere you like. It's my gift to you. There was a hiccup on the other end of the line. Really? You're serious. I'll even get a passport for the first time and, well, actually, it might just be the first time. Oh, Jose, I love you. I love you, too. Be careful out there tonight. It's cold and, I don't know, I got a bad feeling for some reason. So do I, honey, he thought. It'll be fine, he said, as Stan's private bathroom light turned off. Jose didn't really track what was said as they ended the call, but as he hung up, he very clearly decided that this week away was a gift for them both. Maybe it could be a yearly thing, a tradition, as she worked her way through her Ph.D. Up on the third floor, all of the chief's lights went out, including the ones in the waiting room. Before Jose put the phone away, he made sure that the ringer was on silent. Then he extended his seatbelt out and resettled it across his sternum. If Butch were here, that cop from Southie would have driven him nuts as they waited, rambling on with sports scores and twitchy, impatient shifts in the seat. The bastard had been the worst at stakeouts. He was an action man. Had been. And soon, Jose would be in the past tense, too. Well, in terms of being on the force. God, he wished his old partner were here. Butch would know how to handle this. Actually, no. Butch would just walk up to the chief, shove the guy up against the wall, and start counting down to a beating. Fuck protocol and all that. The rear door to the station house opened, and a lone silhouette stepped out. The chief had a reserved space right next to the exit, and Stan looked around before he got into the sedan. The guy always parked ass in, so as he started the engine, his headlights came on flaring across the mostly empty lot. Jose ducked down, even though he was all the way across the street in a pocket of shadow. Stan's car cut across the empty lines, and at the kiosk, which was also unmanned at this hour of night, he stopped and swiped his card. For a brief instant, security lights pierced the windshield and illuminated his face. He looked death knell grim. Hanging a louis, he started down Muhammad Ali Boulevard, and after a lead of maybe five car lengths, Jose left his spot and oiled along after the chief of police, keeping his own lights off. How had he known the man had to go back to the office tonight? Because someone who was disorganized and forgetful enough to leave all the doors unlocked in his suite after hours was still going to have enough self-protective instincts to remember the mistake he'd made and return to get the evidence that connected him to not one, but two homicides. Chapter 53 In the glare of the Monte Carlo's headlights, Lucan put his hands up, in a move that was like the universal sign for choking when someone couldn't breathe. When you had a gun in your face, 
you got those palms high and away from your body, especially if you were armed yourself and didn't want to get popped for a sudden movement. Meanwhile, the woman who was staring down the muzzle of her gun had just put two and two together and come up with what in her tradition would be called werewolf. Not exactly news that made somebody feel calm and relaxed. And to that point, Rio was shaking so badly, he had a thought that she was liable to pull the trigger by mistake, and deadly was deadly, whether you meant to or not. Rio. He meant to go on from there, but what could he say? What are you? She repeated, this time with a cold levelness to her tone. I am what I am. That's no fucking answer. I don't know what you want me to say. You know what's going on. No, I do not. I don't understand anything. What the hell is that? What the hell are you? I'm not any different than I ever was. You're not human, she cried out, and haven't been all along. She seemed to lose her voice, or maybe she was worried it was her mind. I didn't know it. She emphasized the point with the muzzle of her gun. It was a hell of a detail to leave out. And what would you have done? Seriously, think about it. I walk up to you on the streets of Caldwell and tell you, hey, I'm a half-breed wolven, pleased to meet you. How about we do fifty million dollars in drug trade over the next two months together? Great, sign here. He leaned forward. That would have gone just great, right? Smooth as fucking glass. As his temper started to get away from him, he turned from her and walked up and back on the dirt lane. If she wanted to shoot him, fucking fine. Good luck getting his bastard, no good double crossing cousin out from under the Monte Carlo. This is your cousin? While her words cut through his internal or supposedly internal monologue, he snapped into focus and realized he'd said all that out loud. Fine. Whatever. He wheeled around and marched right up to her. Okay, you want to know everything. He jabbed a finger over her shoulder. That was a fucking prison you were in back there, and there isn't a goddamn human in it. The drug trade is so we can survive and have the bare minimum for food, water, and health care. Now he poked his finger at the dead man-like form wedged under the car. And that male, along with a couple of others, were who put me in this hell back in the eighties. So there, you know all my story. As her eyes went back and forth between him and the dead body, he snapped. If you shoot me now, you're going to have to move both of us out of your way before you can hit the gas. I'd recommend you have me get him off to the side first before you do me like you did the executioner. There was a tense moment, and then she slowly lowered the weapon. I don't understand any of this, she mumbled. Your understanding is not required. Reality really doesn't give a shit about rational and reasonable. Trust me, if I've learned nothing else during the last... What's the other half? She interrupted. What's your other part? Lucan looked up at the sky. Then he leveled his head and curled his upper lip. For the first time around her, he let his fangs elongate and had to ignore a tingling hunger as he considered all the soft places on her he could sink them into. I'm sure you've heard the myth, he said in a low voice, but you humans have it all wrong, as usual. Vampire. She whispered in terror. And it was time for a little breaky poo. Rio's legs made the executive decision without any consultation from her mind or the pesky free will thing that usually controlled negotiations between the body and the brain. One second, she was standing. The next, she was in a sit, right on the shoulder of the lane. The good news, maybe it was training, was that she had the forethought to make sure she didn't pull the trigger on the way down or on impact. And now that she was on her ass, literally and figuratively, she put the nine millimeter on its side on the dirt. Then she crossed her hands in her lap like she was in church. After a moment, there were noises, shuffling, pulling, a grunt or two. 
She couldn't tell what Luke was doing exactly, but she could guess the general gist of things. Then his face was in front of hers. He even waved his hand before her eyes. I don't understand, she heard herself say, which was what was going through her mind over and over again. Luke knelt down. I can make it go away. What? I can make you forget everything. You won't remember any part of this. It will be as if it never occurred. That explains it, she thought. The guard, and then what you did in the back at the... She winced as her head hurt. You do that to people, don't you? Manipulate their memories. It'll be easier on you. No, she said weakly. I don't want that. My mind is not yours to take. When he didn't respond, she started to relive everything, just to check and see what might have been taken. My cover was blown, and Mozart sent someone to kidnap me from my apartment. I woke up in his actual house. He didn't show me his face. He drugged me. She paused and looked at the front of the Monte Carlo. What's that growling? I thought he was dead. Sorry. Luke slapped a palm over his mouth. I get a little aggressive sometimes. Rio turned herself to him and looked at him properly for the first time. You attacked that guy with the knife. That was you. It wasn't a stray dog. Well, technically it was the wolven in me. But yeah, I sent him forward to save you. You sent? It's like having two people in one skin. I'm mostly in control. But in certain circumstances, he comes out, and he does what he does. He's very dangerous. Why didn't he hurt me? Was she really talking like this? Because you told him not to? No, he knows you. He knows you. That's the only way I can explain it. You look so normal. No, I just resemble a human on the outside. He frowned. Tell me about Mozart. He was the one who hurt you. I'd never actually met him in person until he kidnapped me. The communications with him are all done through screens and VPNs. I was getting close, so fucking close. But he found me out because... She took a deep breath. I think someone in my own department tipped him off about me. Another officer, who was undercover like me, was killed. And right before he was, he tried to warn me. That was the night I met you. Jesus. Which was why I can't go back to Caldwell. I don't know who to trust, but I can't let Mozart win. I just can't. She closed her eyes. Even if it's the last thing I do, I just want... To kill him? Rio shook her head. I want to jail that bastard. He's everything I've ever worked against. He's murdered so many people, and I just... I've spent 18 months closing in on him. I want him to go to prison for the rest of his natural life. She lifted her palms. After that, I can retire. I'm finished in this racket anyway. My cover blown, my life a mess. They stayed there long enough for a shooting star to pierce the blue velvet of the night sky and travel all the way across the visible plane of the universe. You know... You're still as easy to talk to as ever. She smiled a little. I mean, this is remarkably unweird for being totally bizarre. That's because it has always been, and still is, me. Rio looked down at her hands and remembered running them over his body, and the way it had been to make love with him, and the connection she felt, and still did. You know, he said, I could help you. She lifted her head up. How? I can help you get to Mozart. But how? Luke tapped the side of his head. We have tricks, remember? If you want to find Mozart, I can help you. But why? Why would you do that? If the drug deal supports the, the prison, if that money is needed to feed and clothe and... You don't have to worry about all that. You just have to ask yourself if you want to get Mozart bad enough to work with a wolven vampire cross to get the job done. Rio shifted her eyes to him and focused on his face. 
All of the features were achingly familiar, exactly the same as they had always been. We're survivors, remember, he said in a low voice. We stay in the present because it's all we have. But survivors also settle scores in the right way. Chapter 54 Captain Stanley Carmichael's home was a Cape Cod, set way back on a lot that could have handled a much bigger structure. As Jose eased to a halt on the back left-hand corner of the property behind the house, he put his unmarked in park. Stan had pulled up to his garage, turned off his car, and gotten out. He was now walking down the long asphalt driveway to the mailbox, like he'd been so distracted as he'd driven in that he'd forgotten to grab the day's allotment of bills, flyers, and bullshit. Jose glanced around to make sure there was nobody nosy checking out where he was. That was a nope. The other houses were separated by equally large parcels of land, the neighborhood being more farm country than suburban, regardless of its proximity to the Northway. As Stan started the return trek up the drive, Jose thought back to when the guy had moved all the way out to the edge of the city limits. It had seemed like an impulse move after the divorce, and not a bright choice for a guy who had never been a cook or a cleaner and was no doubt going to settle down with someone else right afterward, or at least try to. Stan had cleared up the mystery about a year later. The place was apparently the spitting image of the house he'd grown up in, so that was the drill. Emotions and real estate were frequently linked together. As Jose watched the man walk along, he had a realization that he was waiting for his mind to change its conclusions. Surely there was another explanation to all this, one that reconciled the man he knew with the kind of monster who could murder an innocent civil servant for the purpose of one of two things. It was either extortion because Stan knew that Stefan Fontaine was a fucking drug dealer crook, or because Stan was on the take and delivering on a deal he had brokered. Either way, Stan had been the one to compromise Rio's cover, and perhaps she'd had something to do with that murder scene under that dealer Mickey's apartment. Fortunately, it appeared she was still alive, so she could give her own testimony about that, as soon as it was safe for her to do so. Stan stopped next to his car and looked at the sky, like he was searching for some grace or something, or for possibilities of where the wallet and the cell phone might have gone. Time to go to work, Jose muttered to himself as he turned the lights of the unmarked on and put the car back in gear. Hitting the gas, he went around Stan's acreage, and then he pulled into the driveway. As his lights swung around, they picked his old friend out of the darkness, spotlighting him. The guy looked old, with his graying hair, and exhausted, with his wrinkled suit, as he lifted his arm to shield his eyes from the glare. Jose put the unmarked in park and opened his door. As he got out from behind the wheel, he said, Hey, Stan. There was a pause. And then the chief of the Caldwell Police Department slowly lowered that arm of his. Jose, what are you doing here? I think you know, Stan. I think you know exactly why I'm here. Downtown Caldy was hopping, people all over the streets, going in and out of bars and clubs, eating and drinking indoors because it was too cold to be in the open air. As Rio stared out of the Monte Carlo's smudged-up window, she still wasn't sure this wasn't all a dream, and yet it seemed so real, down to Luke's cologne, or scent. Where are we going? As Luke put the question out there, she directed him over another three or four blocks. She wasn't sure exactly where... There. She sat up. There he is. That's the guy. Luke didn't vary their speed and didn't look over at the tall, well-built man who stood in the inset doorway of an office building that was shut down for the night. He just kept them right on going, smoothing his way around the block. His street name's Chins. She glanced across the interior of the crappy car. The rumor is he's Mozart's eyes on the street. Mickey was jealous of him. I tried to get close to him, but he's a totally separate operator. He just watches and does deals to make it look like he is one of the rank-and-file others. 
He's our best bet at a connection who might actually know Mozart. With a nod, Luke went around the block a second time, and then rolled up in front of the guy. Wait, Rio said. He's going to see me. Drop me off. It's not going to matter, trust me. As she ducked anyway, Luke cranked his window down. Hey, you got something for sale? Rio turned her face away, as if she were inspecting the car door. What you looking for? was the gruff response. Actually, I changed my mind. I think I'll just take what I need. When there was only silence, Rio glanced over, and then stared. There was no contact between the two, no weapons out on Luke's part, and yet Chins was standing there as docilely as a trained seal. Thanks, Luke muttered. And you're not selling to anyone under eighteen anymore. You're going to start carding them, motherfucker. Chin stepped back from the car as Luke hit the gas, and Rio twisted all the way around to look out the rear windshield. The dealer remained standing at the curb, his hands up to his head like it hurt, confusion on his face as he glanced around like he couldn't figure out what had happened. I don't know, Caldwell, Luke said, but he's been to a house, a big-ass house with white columns in front. There's a gate and a stone wall, trees in the lawn. I don't have an address, though, or a number or anything. I also don't have a real name, and there's no phone number. He never calls, is only called. You're sure it's in Caldwell? Yeah, it's somewhere in Caldwell. Luke looked over. He wasn't going there to report on business. They're fucking. He's in love with this guy, Mozart, and it seems like the man feels the same. So, wait, what is the house like again? All I can tell you is that it's got columns across the front, six fluted columns with curly cue tops and a pair of carved dogs. Well, Rio thought, at least that narrowed the neighborhoods down. There was only one in Caldwell that would have a house like that. Take a left up here, she ordered. I have an idea of where to go. Chapter 55 Come on, Jose. You think I'm a mind reader? I can barely remember what I had for breakfast. Getting in your brain is way over my pay grade, even as chief. Hey, can you kill the lights? Christ. I know you're aware of what I've found. Religion? Stan put his mail on the trunk of his car and started for the inner pockets of his jacket. Oh, wait. You already were a churchgoer. Keep your hands where I can see them. Jose upped the volume on his voice. Stan, don't make me. It happened so fast, and in any other suspect confrontation, Jose would have handled things differently. But the past and present had milkshaked on him. The presence of a suspect looking like his old friend, sounding like the guy, too, making him sloppy and slow. Just as Jose drew his service weapon, Stan unholstered his and pointed it at Jose's heart. What the fuck is wrong with you? The chief said. What the fuck is going on with you? They were squared off, nothing between them but thin air, two muzzles pointed at two mortal torsos. Why did you do it, Stan? You killed Leon Roberts, and you sacrificed Hernandez Guerrero to Mozart. Was it for the money? Was that the end game? There barely was a pause, as if Stan had been holding on to his truth for too long. Oh, easy for you to say. You got a wife and a family. You got holidays and weekends and people waiting for you to come home. You got hot meals made for you. The ones you like, the way you like, and a warm body sleeping next to you. Fuck off with the judgment, okay? I come home every night to an empty fucking house. Stan, you gotta put that gun down. And you know what I think about? The man jutted forward on his hips, his tie hanging loose. You know that pension I got? Half of it went to Ruby. The money I spent 25 years earning by showing up to work and kissing ass until I got promoted high enough to get kicked in the ass by the mayor's office is now paying the mortgage of the house she lives in with her new fucking husband. Stan, listen to me. I know you're not going to shoot me, and I don't want to shoot you. Let's just talk. We are talking, Jose. The guy snapped. 
You know what the best thing about under-the-table money is? It's mine. I don't have to report it to the fucking government, and I don't have to give it to my ex-wife. Thank fuck she couldn't have children, or I'd be up to my ass in college bills right now, just like you are. I can help you, Jose raised his voice. Listen to me. With what you know about Mozart, you can get a deal. He's the big fish, not you. You think I don't know that? Have you seen his house? I keep telling him that only the president has a bigger, fancier facade. The guy spat out a curse. And besides, I don't need much. I just want enough to get me out. My golden parachute that I'm owed. I know you didn't mean to hurt Roberts. Fuck Roberts. He's just another goddamn weight around my neck. You all are. Arguing about money, equipment, days off, time off, pensions. It's never enough. Nothing I ever fucking did was enough for any of you. And you know what? I don't have to give a shit anymore. I've taken care of myself, and I'm not sorry. And now I'm going to take care of you. There was just an instant, a split second, of dropped attention, that gun listing off to the side as Stan continued to rant. Slow motion. It always happened in slow motion, didn't it? Knowing that he was seconds from his own death, Jose pulled his trigger, and the bullet discharged, and given that he was just a few feet away from point-blank range, there was no question of that slug not hitting home in the center of Stan's chest. The impact blew the man back off his feet, the headlights' harsh illumination making him look like he was in a Marvel comic strip, a supervillain in a cheap suit and a bad tie, taking justice right through the heart. With a sickening thud, he bounced off the trunk of his own car and slumped to the pavement, his body ending the roll on its back, facing the heavens above. Jose stayed where he was, the smoke from the barrel of his gun rising up, the smell of the powder in his nose. Then he got his phone out of the pocket that he'd have put a handkerchief in if he'd been that kind of man. Before he called for help and backup, he turned off the microphone recording he'd triggered on the unit just as he'd entered the driveway. After that, he stared at Stan for a moment and then slowly lowered his weapon. The man's mouth was working, so Jose went over and knelt down. Last words and all that. Guess he was hoping for an oops, I take it all back. It was just autonomic function, however, muscles in the neck and face spasming randomly. The hit had been right in the center of the chest. Jose couldn't have done a better job if he'd been a surgeon with a scalpel. Looking down at his phone, he had to put a numeric password in because he hated the new kind with facial recognition. When it became clear that his hand was shaking too badly to hit the keys in the right sequence, he decided to just make an emergency call to the police station. Because this sure as shit was an emergency. Except his fingers were still trembling, and he had a thought. If he couldn't put in four digits for a password, why did he think he could do seven? Or maybe even ten, if the local 518 area code was needed. He was concentrating on the phone screen so intently that he didn't see Stan marshal his last strength to lift his gun right up at Jose's head. Chapter 56 Stefan Fontaine As Rio spoke up, Lucan looked away from the lineup of cutesy pie shops and well-tended restaurants he was driving them by. Who are you talking about? Stefan Fontaine, the columns. She pointed up a hill. Head there. I think I know the house. Roger that. He had no idea where they were, but Rio was in charge, telling him in no uncertain terms which turns to take, where to go. And he knew, without seeing any big houses yet, that she'd taken him to the right neighborhood. From the street lights, with their graceful arches, to the trees that had been planted alongside the sidewalks, to the complete and utter lack of litter. It went without saying that they were in rich people territory. As he piloted the piece of shit Monte Carlo up the rise, the estates started, and they were in the same exact vein as the white birthday cake he had gotten from the memory banks of that dealer. 
Who's Stefan Fontaine? he asked. He's this philanthropist who moved to town a couple of years ago. He's always in the papers and on TV for giving away money. He's got his name on a wing at St. Francis Hospital, and he endowed a chair in economics at SUNY Caldwell. He's done a bunch of other stuff, too. She glanced over. But he lives in a house with columns, six of them. There was an article in the Caldwell Courier Journal about the renovations he did on this mansion he bought, and the house is up here. So Lucan kept going, and as they went along, in the back of his mind, he was missing her already. It seemed ridiculous to be mourning Rio's loss while she was right next to him. For fuck's sake, he could reach right out and touch her. Not that he would. He'd terrified her enough. He was such a prize. Here, stop. He hit the brakes and looked across the car's beat-to-shit interior. That's it. That's the house. The mansion was set far back on a rolling lawn, behind a set of sturdy gates and a stone wall that was federal penitentiary worthy. The columns were indeed six, right across the front, tall as evergreens and more than capable of holding up the pediment and slate roof above them. It was exactly as the memories of that dealer out on the street had detailed. Service entrance, Lucan said. Let's go around back. That's how the guy would get on the property when he came to visit. It took them some time to find an alley cut through in the street, and then he trolled by the back of several estates, staring into the trees and wondering how many hidden cameras were tracking this old junker as it violated the pristine neighborhood's roadway. Is this it? Rio asked as she leaned into the windshield. This entrance here? Yeah. Yeah. Lucan pulled into a service port on the far side of the rear gate. There was a carriage house locked in by the stone wall, and through the iron bars of the fence he could see a pool area, and then the back of the mansion. How do we get in? she murmured. It's not going to be a problem. But how are— She stopped herself, as if she were remembering the way the drug dealer downtown had been handled. Okay, let's do this. After he turned off the engine, they got out and met at the front grill, and he pressed the keys into her palm. You take these. If anything goes wrong, I want you to get in and drive away. Don't worry about me. Her eyes bored into his own, and he had a feeling she had questions. So many questions. But now was not the time. Never was the time. All right, she said after a moment. I will. Lucan made a move like he was going to kiss her and stopped himself in time. Stepping back, he nodded and dematerialized away, right in front of her. When he reformed on the far side of the locked gates, she was covering her mouth with both hands. He hated the fact that he'd freaked her out again, but they needed to get inside and it was the work of a moment for him to... Two German shepherds came barreling around the side of the pool house, the dogs trained to not bark when attacking. Their scents gave them away because he was downwind, however. And then there were their pounding paws over the short grass. Lucan wheeled on them and crouched down. The growl that came out of his throat was not from him. It was his other side talking. And that pair of perfectly trained killers pulled up like they were about to go off the edge of a cliff. Moving forward, he backed them away, his snarl submitting them, his eye contact promising them what would happen if they misbehaved. He would school them like they were pups, instead of eighty to ninety pound fully grown males. After he'd driven the dogs behind the pool house, he turned around and jogged to the gate, and that was when a guard came out of the side door of the cottage. The guy was pissed off and out of uniform, or maybe he was just a paid caretaker. The man noticed the Monte Carlo and Rio right away. Meanwhile, Lucan stalked up behind the human male, and just as the man said, Can I help you? Subduing him was the work of a moment. Lucan just threw an arm around that throat and hauled the torso back against his own, which was when he discovered that the caretaker was, in fact, armed. Lucan caught the gun that came up, took control of the weapon, and calmly put the muzzle to the man's temple. You're going to let her in now. There was a little too much going on in his own brain for him to get into the guard's noggin and grab access codes or some such, so the Smith & Wesson worked just fine. 
or should have. When there was some argument, Lucan bared his fangs. No, Rio said. Don't kill him. Everyone on site is taken alive. They could all be in on the Enterprise. Everybody lives. Bummer and inconvenient. But like all bonded males, he did what his female said and put his sharp and shinies back in his upper jaw. Shit, he could really have used a nice bloody fight to take his edge off. As the gate started to open, Rio slipped in as soon as there was a space big enough to fit through. On the far side, she looked into the wide eyes of the guard and knew this was madness, but she wasn't turning back. Let's go, she said. As Luke brought the guard along, he handled the other man like he didn't weigh a goddamn thing, and when they passed by the pool house, she glanced around, wondering where the dogs were. God, she remembered the attack on that hitman back at Mickey's apartment building. The ferocity of it all had been so shocking, from the flashing teeth to the grinding jaws, the muzzle running red with blood, the victim's midsection ripped open, his throat a raw wound. Abruptly, she recalled coming to, just as it was all over. The wolf had wheeled around on her. Tears had run from her eyes, both for what she had seen and for what was going to be done to her. The wolf had approached her, its massive body moving in a coordinated prowl, but instead of attacking her, it had whimpered, nuzzled at her legs, as if it wanted to get her loose if it could, and then it had lain down beside her, like it was protecting her, its regal head up, its eyes shifting to the door, its nose sniffing like it was testing the air for the sense of enemies. She clearly had passed out again at that point, because the next thing she remembered was Luke releasing her from all the ties. You took the clothes of the attacker, she said. Back when you saved me, you needed something to wear, and that's why everything was too small on you. Luke looked over, and so did the guard, who, she realized abruptly, was in flannel pajama bottoms and a Sunni Caldwell T-shirt. Yeah, Luke said with a nod, and I didn't want you to know what I was. On that note, they arrived at the mansion's rear flank. There was a terrace that ran all the way down the back of the house, but there was no outdoor furniture on it. Obviously, things had been put away for the winter. And inside, everything had been shut down for the night. All the rooms were dark. No lights on in the lower level. Up on the second floor, however, there was a bank of fixtures still glowing. Where are we going? Luke said to the guard. How are we getting in? I can't tell you. Yeah, you can. The guard threw out his proverbial anchor. You're going to have to kill me now, because if I let you into his house, he's going to do so much worse to me. Just fucking shoot me. Well, Rio thought, at least they knew they were in the right place. Chapter 57 In a split second that lasted an eternity, Jose saw the gun of his old friend coming up in his peripheral vision, but it was too late to catch the weapon. And yes, it turned out that the old wives' stories were true. Your life did flash before your eyes right before you died. In a quick series of heart-wrenching images, he saw himself and his wife on their wedding day and at the births of their children. He visualized holidays and weekends and Christmases and Fourths of July. It was as if everything that Stan didn't have and had decided he'd been cheated of, as if some robber had come into his life and taken at gunpoint all of the stuff he'd been due solely by reason of him being alive, character and responsibility and commitment having nothing to do with any of that end result. God, Jose didn't want it all to be over, and not like this. Knowing he was fucked, Jose winced and got ready for pain or maybe it would happen so quick he would feel nothing. He'd been so close to getting out of the CPD alive. The discharge was so loud because it was right by his ear, and he felt heat, a flash of heat, right by his cheek. Ping! The metallic ring was a surprise, until he realized it was the lead slug passing through his brain and going into the car's steel panel. And now came the collapse. 
He'd seen enough gunshot victims in the immediate aftermath of impact to know that he was going to do what Stan had just done, slump to the side, probably knock into the car, too. Then maybe he'd land on Stan's legs. After that, lack of consciousness, followed by death. And finally, the pearly gates, hopefully, thanks to all those novenas and Hail Marys. Jose's eyes flipped wide, and he fell backward onto his ass, but not because he was dead. A tremendous man dressed in black leather, with black hair, icy white eyes, and a goatee, was standing next to Stan and holding Stan's gun. Somehow, the harsh-looking savior had come out of nowhere and taken control of Stan's gun just in the nick of time, diverting the discharge into the car, instead of into Jose's head. Jose lifted his hands and felt around himself for injury, opened his jacket wide, pushed at his neck, his cheeks, ran fingers through his hair, down to his scalp. Then he focused on the strange man, a cold wash of awareness going through him. I know you, Jose breathed. Yeah, you do, but only in your dreams. Stan made a clicking sound and a groan, and the man with the goatee transferred his attention to the guy who was actually dying. There was a split second of pause, and then that menace in black leather crouched down, bared his enormous teeth, Jesus, were those fangs, and hissed at Stan, who promptly seized up in terror and started grabbing for his chest like he was having a heart attack. A mortal struggle went on for a moment or two, and then Stan Carmichael breathed his last breath. The man in leather chuckled a little and relaxed his mouth, his upper lip lowering to cover those tremendous teeth. You know, he said conversationally, I've been accused of scaring people to death before. Now I've actually done it. I'm so adding this to my resume. Those icy eyes swung back around, and Jose noticed that there were tattoos at one of his temples, also noted that there were weapons around his waist, and undoubtedly inside the jacket given all the bulges. Yet Jose felt no fear, and not just because he was in shock. In my dreams, he said, as a headache flared under his skull, I've seen you in my dreams. Butch says hi. He does? God, he felt so confused, and yet also totally clear. Really? He's still okay? Yeah, the man glanced at Stan. He would have been here in person, but he couldn't keep up with your car on foot, so I'm his stand-in. You saved my life. I did, true. Thank you. The man stared at him for a long time, then tilted his head. You know, you're welcome, and there was no way I was going to let you die. It'd break my roommate's heart, and I can't let that happen. Butch is your roommate? When the man nodded, Jose smiled a little. So you'd really know if he was okay. Good. Yeah. Well, I gotta go. You got any message for Butch? Tell him to go to church. He does. Midnight mass. Wednesdays and Saturdays without fail. We moved the work schedule around to make sure he could go. Church is important. Jose rubbed over his eyebrow. You're going to take my memories now, aren't you? It's for the best. How did you know this was going to happen? There was a pause. It's my curse. To know the how, but rarely the where and never when. So in most cases, I just have to follow my gut. I'm sorry. Thanks, my guy. Wait. Jose put his palm up. Keep taking care of Butch, will you? I tried to. I failed. But I think... I think you're doing a much better job than I ever did, aren't you? The man got really serious for a second, but then he smiled a little and nodded. You're a good man, Jose de la Cruz. And let's just keep this between ourselves, shall we? I've heard that true good Samaritans don't need their deeds to be known. And although I've never been much for that whole saviorship before, and probably never will be, I got a soft spot for the Boston cop we both respect so much. Besides, he'd get all emotional when he thanked me, and really, who needs that? 
The stranger, who was not really a stranger, stood up, and Jose found himself bracing for a familiar sting. One week, the man in leather said. No, you take that pretty wife of yours away for two weeks. You guys go and enjoy yourselves. Happy retirement. Chapter 58 We have to make some noise. Sorry. Before Rio could ask what Luke was talking about, a gunshot rang out, and then the guard dropped to the terrace and didn't move. I thought I told you not to shoot him. I didn't, he hissed. Meanwhile, an alarm started to go off inside, shrill and very loud, and the countdown to police arrival got rolling. I just knocked him out, Luke said, before I shot the lock. Okay, that explained why one of the French doors was lolling open. You ready to do this? he asked. Without another word, Rio entered first, but it wasn't like she knew the layout any better than Luke did. Still, it didn't take a genius to know that whoever was upstairs was going to do one of two things. They were either going to come down with a weapon, or they were going to call for reinforcements, which might or might not be Caldwell police. Probably not on that one. Assuming they were in the right place, Stefan Fontaine had plenty of street resources, in spite of all his legitimate business contacts and philanthropy. Taking off at a run, she suddenly knew what she was looking for, and yet she didn't understand why it mattered so much, given the alarm, given everything. But she had to find the fountain. It would confirm that which was still only speculation at the moment. If she could find where she had been held, though— she could make the final connection, plug the background in with the foreground. She raced through a blur of rooms, dining, sitting, a library, a study, and there it was. The fountain was around the last turn, in that room she remembered, with the chair she had been tied to. As she skidded to a halt on the black and white marble floor, it was all as it had been. The falling water, the golden clock on the mantel, the drapes. Turning around to Luke, who had been following her, she saw past his shoulder a man coming down the formal staircase in a silken robe, and for a moment she froze solid, especially as Stephen Fontaine looked right at them. They were in the shadows, though, because he had failed to reopen the heavy curtains from when he'd brought her here. Why, she thought, why had he taken the risk? And as soon as she wondered that, she knew the answer, because he believed he could because he had been safe in this house and hidden from his Mozart games for so long that he believed he was invincible. With all his money, legally or illegally gotten, the world was his for the taking. And people like her, people like her brother and her parents, didn't matter. He had his fortune and his power and his fake status, and all the lives that he ruined along the way didn't matter. Rio started running before she knew she was going to go at him, flashes of the past spurring her on, images of Leon Roberts' face, of the white hair and skin of that hired killer at the apartment, of Mickey dead on that sofa, of Spaz shambling around the alleys of downtown, caught in a trap that he would never get out of, giving her the strength of a linebacker. Just as Stefan turned to her as he heard her footfalls, she launched herself into the air. She took him down hard, the gun in his hand flying free, the breath exploding out of him, and she didn't stop there. Rage blinded her until she saw nothing but her vengeance as she pounded at him with her fists, hitting him, kicking him, scratching him. At some point, she grabbed him around the throat and started strangling him. All around, the alarm continued to sound, but it wasn't nearly as loud as the roar in her heart, in her soul. Luis, she yelled her brother's name, Luis. And then it was over. As fast as it had begun, it was over. She was pulled off her prey, just ripped away, and she fought whoever it was. Rio, Rio. Her name, spoken in that voice, that deep voice that made it through her fury when nothing and no one else could have. Luke shoved his face into hers. Do you want to kill him or not? What? Do you want to kill him? When she didn't respond, Luke put a gun in her hand. You can shoot him if you need to. It's your choice. 
but you told me you wanted him to go to jail, not a grave. I just have to make sure you know what you're doing. And we're also out of time. I hear the sirens. How will they know what he did? She mumbled. How will he? Luke glanced up and cursed, then refocused on her. What do you want to do? You don't have a lot of time unless you want to be here when your colleagues arrive. You said you didn't know who to trust. This place is about to be filled with cops. Rio broke out of his hold and leaned over Stefan Fontaine. His face was bloody to the point of being unrecognizable, but he was breathing, though otherwise motionless. The silk robe he was wearing was ruined, all stained and torn. Luke had been right to peel her off. Even a minute more, and she would have killed him. And justice had to be served. There's only one person I trust, she said gruffly. Let's go. Chapter 59 Hello? Hello? CPD dispatch. Can you identify yourself? Jose blinked and looked at his phone like it could have been a toaster oven. And why would that be the case here outside of Stan's house, next to Stan's dead body? It was a moment before everything came back to him. Hello? The woman said over the connection. Uh... This is Detective Jose de la Cruz. He had to clear his throat. My badge number is 05 or 94. I need immediate assistance at 79 or 2 Eastwood Lane. We have... Jose focused on the face of his old friend, who he no longer felt he knew, who he no longer saw as the chief of the force. We have a gunshot death. The dispatcher asked some questions that ran together so he cut through things. I shot him in self-defense. There were many questions then, and he answered them as well as he could. There was a gun in Stan's hand. Wait, that wasn't right, he thought. Or was it? As a headache threatened, he gave up on everything, and a little later he was off the phone and just leaning back against Stan's car. All of a sudden, the details of the night became very clear, from the cold temperature to the smell of someone's fire in their fireplace, to the whiff of gas like the vehicle needed a tuning up. It was so quiet out here. But Stan had missed the very peace he had sought, on all levels. Jose looked down at the phone in his hand. Then he made a call. His wife picked up on the second ring. Hey, you. Are you on your way? I'm okay. His voice got so rough, it all but dried up. I'm okay. It's all okay. Jose? What happened? Oh, God, I'm all right. He closed his eyes and covered his face, even though there was no one around to see him get emotional. I love you. Where are you? I'm at Stan's house. Oh, good. You'll be safe there. Jose took a deep breath. Listen, we're going for two weeks. Our vacation is going to be two weeks. Okay? Yes she said gently, like she knew he was cracked wide open and would find out the details later. Hey, have you called Trayvon? No, not yet. Why? I'm just going to call Trayvon. I'm going to put you on hold. Backup's coming. I just needed to hear your voice. Because you're my wife, and when the world makes no sense to me, you're the one I want to call. I love you so much, she sniffled, and he pictured her snapping a tissue out of a box. You come home when you can. I will. They hung up, and he let his hand fall into his lap. Then he just breathed, in and out, in and out, in and out. The phone rang again, and he answered without looking. I swear, I'm okay. When his wife's voice didn't come back to him, he frowned. Hello? There was a pause. And then a woman said, Detective de la Cruz? He straightened. Yes? I think you know who this is. Rio? He shouldn't use her name, but her threat was gone now. Or at least half of it was. Where are you? The shit's hitting the fan. I'm safe. I just need you to know that... Mozart is Stefan Fontaine. 
Jose closed his eyes. I know. I know. I have proof. You were right to tell me to go to your house. Leon Roberts sent you pictures of Stefan Fontaine meeting with a source inside the department. That source gave up your name to him and made you a target. Leon had been following leads as part of an internal affairs investigation that was top secret, and he was killed for his courage. Thank God you believe me. The woman exhaled long and slow. But there's another piece. There was just a break-in at Fontaine's house. His caretaker was overpowered, and Stefan was gravely injured in an attack pursuant to the home invasion. He is alive, however. I just want to make sure that he's taken into custody and that all my reports are used to charge him. He needs to be behind bars for the rest of his life. Jose lowered his voice. Are you injured? No. Be honest. Nothing a bandage around my knuckles won't handle. He chuckled. Good for you. I'm not coming back. To the CPD? Or at all? There was a long pause. I need a fresh start. It's been too long, too much. Jose closed his eyes again. Yes, it has been. Thank you for warning me. Thank you for your service. And I just want to say, off in the distance, he heard the familiar sound of sirens closing in and wondered how long it was going to take before he didn't feel like they were something he had to get involved in. Take care of yourself, officer, and happy retirement. Listen, don't tell anyone you spoke to me. I think it's best that I just remain an unsolved case. Okay, I can do that. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. He ended the call just as the first of the squad cars came screaming down the countryish road, heading for him. And for Stan who had retired in a fashion as well. Chapter 60 Rio ended the call and looked over the lip of the quarry. It was a hell of a spot, this set of cliffs and the huge pool below, especially with the twinkling of downtown off on the horizon. After a moment, she hauled back and slung the phone into the water, that was so far down the drop. Then she turned and faced the man, male, wolf, vampire, who had gotten her off that mansion's property and safely out here, away from prying eyes. Luke was leaning back against the Monte Carlo, his arms crossed, his eyes on her. He was so still and magnificent. And as she started to walk over to him, he straightened, but he didn't smile. You reach him okay? Luke asked. Detective Dela Cruz has everything they need. It's all going to come out. Everything that Mozart was and did is going to land on his head. A man lost his life to get that information to me and to try to save my life. The department will honor him by prosecuting that asshole. That's good. Yeah, it's everything I wanted, so I can say goodbye. You know, say goodbye and be at peace with it all. Luke nodded and rubbed his hands together. All right, then. I guess this is it. I, uh, I'd say see you later, but I meant goodbye to Caldwell and my life there. Oh, so you're going to disappear, go underground. Do you have enough money? I mean, not that you need my help. Well, See, I thought you might need mine. He blinked. I'm sorry. Rio walked around in a little circle. I thought a lot about things while we were driving down from Walters, and also as we came out here just now. I figured you were silent because you were scared of me. Scared of you? She stopped in front of him. How could I be scared of you? You've saved my life three times, and you're... A monster, right? Rio reached up and put her hand to his face. A mystery, never a monster. Luke closed his eyes, as if her touch was both the most painful thing he'd ever felt and the most soothing. Rio. Yes, 
I thought maybe, since you helped me, I could help you. With what? His lids opened slowly, liberating the prison. As his brows shot up, she nodded. That's what you're thinking, right? You are going to kill Mozart because you don't want the deal to go through. So you can undermine the power structure, free the falsely imprisoned, save Cain, and make sure Apex and Mayhem are okay. Right? When he didn't respond, she prompted, Right? Well, yes. How'd you know? I know you better than the few hours we've been together suggest I should. I truly feel like I know you down to your core. She laughed a little. Well, except for the whole werewolf thing. Wolven, he corrected. Wolven, then. And then the vampire is just vampire. Ah, good. I've got that down then already. Luke shook his head. What are you talking about here, Rio? I'm talking about helping you free those people, no matter what their species. She stepped off from him. I'm dead, technically. I have no existence in Caldwell. A ghost? That's right, I'm a ghost. She smiled and pointed to him. You're a wolven and a vampire, and I'm a ghost. It's true love. He recoiled like she'd shocked the hell out of him. Yes, she whispered. I'm still in love with you. So you were in... Yes, I was. And I am. She shrugged. The thing is, survivors also need to believe in the future. And I'd like you to be my future. I know so much of this seems impossible, but let's do it together. Let's figure out the plan. I have training. I'm a great shot. I know that already. And after what you did to that Fontaine guy in his front foyer, you're also really good in a bar fight. You've got fists of steel. You say the sweetest things. She moved back in against him, tilting into his body and putting her arms around his neck. Let's face it, you need me. No shit. He lowered his mouth to hers. I totally need you, Rio. And I love you. I don't understand how you feel this way, too. And honestly, you don't know what you're getting into. When do we ever? She stroked his hair back. Life is a series of unexpected surprises, some good, some bad, some life-changing, whether we know it at the time or not. And that night I met you under the fire escape, my life was destined to change. And now, if you're not in it, it's empty. Give me a future, Luke. It's what this survivor needs. Well, how can I argue with that? They kissed deeply tenderly, and when they finally pulled apart, she knew, without a doubt, that she had found the man of her dreams. Wolf, wolven, and vampire. Whatever, like those details mattered. Are you sure about this? he asked. Yes. Then let's go back to Walter's and fuck some shit up. Rio laughed out loud as he led her over to the Monte Carlo, where, like a gentleman, he held her door open for her and helped her into her seat. When he came around and got behind the wheel, they linked their hands and held on. Back to Walters, she ordered. With that command, they were off into the night, on a quest of justice and liberation and true love. The Wolf Book number two of Black Dagger Brotherhood, Prison Camp, was written by J.R. Ward and read by Jim Frangione. Editing and post-production by Common Mode, Paul Fowley, Technical Director. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio.
The Wolf, book number two of Black Dagger Brotherhood, Prison Camp, is available in print from Gallery Books. Also available from Simon & Schuster Audio, The Jackal, book number one of Black Dagger Brotherhood, Prison Camp, by J.R. Ward, read by Jim Frangione. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.